Hi everyone. Welcome to Cisco Enterprise Automation course. Now what happened if you see last five years, the time has been changed. Now people are looking more towards the application perspective rather than the network perspective means if you see so for example 15 years back people are thinking okay we have the network and then applications are running on top of network but now the company corporate organizations they are thinking about application and the supported network so we are in the application centric world and in that world, we have to learn that how we can integrate with program. And that's why we have this course. We are going to learn, understand the programming capability of the networking devices. Correct. So how we can go and do the programming for different type of new Cisco innovative SDN solution. And here you can see the list. So we have the list here. How we can do the programming for Cisco DNA and that is big at this point of time in the market. Everyone is talking about the DNA, Stevan, Cisco Meraki's old product, but yeah, we have the programming capability with Cisco Meraki. So first few topics that you are seeing here on top, you'll find that these topics will build the foundation. So once we have solid foundation on top of that we can go and build the knowledge level. So once we know that what is API once we know that what are the integrations inside programming obviously different type of programming languages are there. But as a network engineer what we should learn and how much we should learn there should be some uh, line because we are not software or the application developer rather than we are network engineers or network programmers we, uh, who is going to create automated scripts to reduce the errors to increase the uh, performance etc correct and obviously the feel and uh, feel will be different that okay uh, people will think the network engineers they are doing these things with the programming but behind the scene there are some other stories as well now when we are talking about networking programming so at that time what is happening that not only that we are doing the programming of the network that's one thing but behind the scene what is happening that the programming that we are doing or say for example the api that we are doing this is machine to machine interaction so rather than when we are doing the CLI to machine interaction, rather than the API to API interaction, there is a difference. There is a technical difference. Machine to machine interaction will be always faster than the human to machine interaction. And that's the key here. Obviously in the upcoming uh, videos and recording, you are going to learn more and more and more about all these capabilities, correct? So let's start this course and let this make happen that we should go and learn the new capabilities, models, etc., related to programming in this particular course. So from where I can go and get the topic link? Here you can see that you can go to this link, learning um, network.cisco.com, enterprise auto exam topic. And you can check the topics in detail that uh, I'm going to cover in this particular course. So let me go there. All right, so I am here in this link and let me scroll down. So here you can see that we have network programmability foundation and weightage also you can see that 10% weightage just to know the stuff. So the stuffs related to Git, API, the Python, and then obviously the iOS XE, uh, how the Ansible puppet, they are helping to build the programs related to iOS XE. Although it's a 10%, but if you go and learn Python, if you go and learn Ansible puppet, 
it will take time. What I am going to do here is that uh, whatever required for us related to this particular course, I'll go and cover in detail. So for example, Python. I'm going to cover most of the things that network engineers should know. And again, I'll go beyond that network engineer and we can uh, discuss about the construct of Python language as well. So in future, if you want to learn more and more about the programmability aspect of Python, you can check that. Let's focus more on the networking aspect of Python. So what are the basic things like what is Python, how you can install to do the lab, what are the libraries, the structure, the functions, etc., etc., and obviously how we are going to use inside our programmability, like for the and programming and other programmings. The next 10% marks just to know the data models. So what is the data model? What is the encoding, uh, messaging protocol, the transport? We'll see the complete protocol stack is there for the data modeling. Uh, we are going to discuss one by one about that. Then third section is very important. So once we have the uh, foundation related to programming APIs, then we can go a little bit deep inside the programming and actually we can create the programs and we can do automation and scripting as per the topic. So scripting related to iOS XE, uh, not only iOS XE, but you can do, you can check this for example, NetMiko and you can check the supported list of de devices. So many non Cisco devices are also supported. Uh, if you want, you can try for non Cisco devices as well, but I will stick with what curriculum, what course we have, and I'll follow the topic as along the agenda that Cisco has given. Then DNS Center, what is the API related to DNS Center? One nice API that Cisco has introduced is the intent based API. So we can go and discuss about that. Here you can see the intent APIs. You have the runner API, you have the site API, etc. So different different terms are there. Assume that you should have the basic fundamental knowledge of DNA. You should have basic fundamental knowledge of SD-WAN as well. Now, good thing about this, suppose if you don't have basic fundamental and you want to learn the automation and programming related to Cisco Enterprise Automation. You can do it because anyways, I'm going to start with the beginning, but uh, it will be good, good and advisable uh, ad that you go and check the CCNP Enterprise Core. Uh, you already uploaded that, so you can refer that as well. Even for Stevan also, I have so many ABC of Stevan series uh, courses. You can refer that because here I will not explain you that what is the data plane, control plane, how it is working rather than we'll go and do the programming. We'll go and use the automation related to Python and APIs. And finally, Meraki. For Meraki also, I have baseline course, uh, Meraki basics and the troubleshooting that also you can refer. So. What you can do that uh, parallelly, even you can work around with two and three courses. So you are studying Meraki and then you are doing the APIs related to that. Parallelly, you can study st and DNA and then here also you can come and go, come and go. Again, it depends upon the interest. Once your interest will get created, passion will get created related to programming and automation, then what you will do, that what I am doing at the moment, I try to do everything uh, via program. Sometimes it will take much more time than what you are doing or what we used to do with the CLI. But after some point of time, it depends upon your passion and previous knowledge, your background. Say for example, my background is computer engineer from uh, computer science. So my background itself is IT and I have done lots of programming in my engineering curriculum. So I have my passion interest in C, C++, Java, etc. I have done these codings long back. So those knowledge are recalled here because I know that for loop, while loop, etc. Even 
logically anyone can understand the data structure and the conditions so it's not a big thing but still if someone hasn't done any programming and he want to do the programming it's a big deal for him it's a big mental block that we have to remove it and work all right so this is the topic let's just stop here next section we'll start these topics one by one and we'll go slowly and try to build the fundamental of foundation related to automation and programming all right so let's start 1.0 network programmability foundation what are the topics we have to learn here first of all we should go and understand zit and this is huge because for network engineer who want to learn the programming skills most of the code you will get from this place you can go there to the zit i'll uh, show you that how you can do it uh, first of all for our practice uh, what we can do that we can go and install gns3 inside gns3 you have the automation tool already they have put that automation tool will do most of the things so inside that how we can go and put python and any type of language programming language you can put because that is that tool itself i will log in and show you that what version of uh, uh, ubuntu it is so ubuntu is already in built in gns and we can learn practice in uh, for our practice purpose it is good and enough then in future if you want to import if you want to use that knowledge and utilize that knowledge in the in your infra in your production environment where you may get red hat because that is the industry standard most of the companies have the red hat servers or any uh, flavor of linux server commands will be almost very much same correct so that 1.1 that we should understand is it then uh, at least we should know the basics of api what is api and what is the commonality in between different type of api because you may heard heard that rest api restful api intent based api and there's so many correct so we should understand first of all the basic principle fundamental behind the rest api how it look like why it is whatever it is once we know the basic fundamental then we can utilize that anywhere for any type of api correct so we we'll learn understand about the api styles and how we can understand that then we have the challenges for api synchronous and asynchronous we'll see those theoretical things how we can integrate the api inside the python so before that we should learn python and that's why i have series of videos related to python again those are important to the network engineers not for the uh, engineers or not for the application programmers who is doing some machine learning or a very high level of coding that will help us to uh, write the scripts for networking automation then python virtual environment what are the benefit how you can create it uh, each and everything's actually all these points are connected so if you go and do one lab related to api and that is using python and again you are copying some code from zit everything you'll find 1.1.1 to 1.6 is connected now we have a special section here related to iosxe and to learn the automation of iosxe is huge at this point of time because if you go and check most of the cisco devices most of the cisco next generation devices they are running iosxe code so either it's a catalyst switch or it's a new generation wlc say 9800 or it's isr devices where you are running the st wan code uh, even the CSR devices as well, they are running the IOSXE. So you'll find most of the places you have the IOSXE. Now, if you understand the IOSXE code one place, you can utilize the same code at different different places. So to understand the IOSXE, because that's the new standard for Cisco, it's a very very important and key for automation success. All right, so let's stop here and uh, let's learn about Zit in 
upcoming section. In 1.1, we have to learn and understand about Git. Now the Git and GitHub, we are going to learn and we are going to actually copy the code more and more. We are going to search the different type of codes, whatever public, published by different programmer coders or network engineers, and then we can utilize those codes inside our lab environment, or you can again utilize inside the production environment. Now how it is going to work, and here you can see the graphic, we have the cartoon that, oh, is it, is it how it is working? Now, actually no idea, we have no idea about that, how it is working, <laughs> and even we are not worried about how it is working. Only thing we are going to do that uh, we follow some steps. And once you follow the step, we'll see that we have some steps to follow to create the code, to upload the code, to merge the um, libraries and all, correct? So we'll go and follow that uh, again. Uh, if you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project and download your fresh copy. <laughs> That's the a way that the network engineers are working when they have the programming related uh, projects. Okay, so what are the things we can do it? And here we have the list. So made a change to code, realize it was a mistake and wanted to revert back. These are actually the problem with the application engineers or the programmers that you have done something, you have some wrong, um, syntax or code or some logic, you want to change it. Last code uh, or had a backup with the uh, with that old code, so you have the backup. Do you have multiple versions of the code? Uh, you have the difference in the code or maybe some was working with some of the program and the new code having new program, you want to merge it, you want to take the difference, you have multiple copies, you have the backup. All these points are listed here and the answer is that your zit will do that. So it's a public repository, not only the public, but, but here you can see that you may have two type of copies, so developer private and developer public. So one code that you publish uh, for public use and you want that different users or uh, different programmers, they can copy those codes and they, they can utilize it to just check the authenticity or just check the uh, scalability and the nature of the program and um, they can improve it as well, correct? So it's just shared code and you can see that private is also. So one copy with you and some portion or maybe some other code you want to share, you can do it, correct? So again, the final conclusion for all these steps that we are going to study is this slide. You can go and have a, a reference to this particular slide and you can check the link as well from where you can get all this information. All right, so let's focus more on this it. Under the hood, how it is working, you may have multiple copies, you may have multiple versions, you can go and upgrade or degrade. We'll see that more and more in the upcoming session. Uh, how we can do the configuration, obviously, uh, in our lab, I have one GNS, I have my network automation tool, I will show that how we can do it. We can go and do the ZIT config, global username and the email address, then my uh, ZIT is prepared. I can go and initialize the project. Initially, it will be hidden under the uh, ZIT directory. Now here you can see the flow, you have working directly, you can do the staging and you, then you have the repository. We can go and follow these commands, uh, zit add dot. That means you can add the zit. Then you want to commit it. You can do the commit. So commit minus m initial commit. We'll do the commit. Again, there are chances that uh, for a certain program, multiple programmers are working at multiple locations. You can think this as a branch as well. So you have multiple branch. Uh, all the branches are independent and uh, in future you want to merge them. So first of all, there is a concept of branch, correct? So zit branch name, 
Let's say for example branch is testing you can commit with a new and then you have the uh, checkout as a masters the master is uh, very straightforward now in future if you want to merge different type of branches you can go and merge it so you have your independent first of all you can go and create the repository so you have you can add your username and password you can upload your project you can do the commit then multiple projects working as different location or branches that you can go and merge again if you want to uh, share your changes so you can go and do the push uh, origin master and even the branches as well these are the operations we are going to do obviously we'll understand more and more now this particular slide is important because this also we are going to use it or utilize it so in future uh, some public code is there running up and running in the uh, zit we can go and we can copy to the local directory even you can go and create publish someone can copy or you can also copy the others code then once it is in your automation tool in your gns then you can do certain edits you can do certain changes and you can run your own program in your lab environment or once it is up running you have validated in lab environment you can go and run in the production environment as well okay so these are the basic theories related to it obviously more we work more we are going to learn so let's log into the zit and uh, do all the steps follow all the steps that we have seen in this session before we'll start the lab i just wanted to show you my setup here now we can go and install the gns you can go to this link download the gns everything is free you can create your free account and you can use it now gns is running over the server over the vm so you need hypervisor uh, most of the hypervisors are free if you are doing the home lab so for example i am using a vmware workstation pro on that i am installing gns3 vm although what i have done that i have created complete video that how you can go and install gns3 uh, over the system so you can refer that video but uh, anyways most of the engineers know that how you can uh, use utilize gns3 now gns3 is also becoming very popular and it's uh, very enhanced at this point of time so if you go and check gns version 2.2.10.11 now we have so let me show you that what version i have but uh, this is 2 to 10 11 is also present at this point of recording and in future you'll see that more and more innovations inside gns anyways once you go and install the gns uh, your gns3 your laptop you can see means i have done some adjustment although you will get in the right hand side of the pane where you can uh, check all this information so we are very much interested looking for the informations related to our devices our networking devices now when you go and do this thing means when you go and add the devices so for example i have added sd wan s device i have added network automation i have added csr asa etc and as and when required we can go and add more and more devices so for that what you need to do create click template so here you can see the plus sign click next and then you can go and search automation once your automation will come just click install and it is it will ask you next 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 and it will be finished because i am already having this so it is showing an error but i can have actually multiples as well so i can go and create say 02 and done so now you can see that i have automation 1 and 2 that i can use it simply click drag and drop once you click drag and drop you can see here you have your automation engine behind the scene this is ubuntu machine and then i want to build my small network so i can go and use gns switch 
recommended that you can use this GNS, GNS switch because this is very lightweight. Okay. Then I can go and use this NAT because I want to give the IP address, NATed IP address to my automation tool. And that's very much done. Now, suppose if you want to interact with your laptop, then you can go and use this uh, cloud and then done. Now, once we have this very basic lab setup running, we can use these connectors, we can connect. So let me go and use this connection, say here. And then again, we can go and use the connection like this and like this. Now in future lab, you will see that we can go and change the um, design layout, those things as well. Design layout, that means simply, you can change the symbol as well. And in future, you will see that I have changed as well in the upcoming videos. At the moment, it's okay. Now, once you have the network automation tool and you want to provide the IP via the DHCP, so you can go and click edit config and um, you want this automated IP so you can remove those extra symbols. And now, if you go and start, it will become green. Double click, you have your automation engine. Now the font size is very small at this point of time. So you can go click settings. Once you're inside the setting, you have the general tab where you have the party. Launch the party, go to the appearance, make this font size that uh, you can work with. So for example, uh, I made this 16 or maybe 18. Once it is there, then you should go to the logging and uh, not logging, but you can go to the sessions and you can uh, click default session and save it. Right? I can click uh, save it and then I can click close. And now if I go ahead, let me restart this session, but you can see that it got one IP address. If you go and double click here, you can see the font size will get increased, correct? Now this is the initial basic setup that it is working behind the scene, but what we can do that I have certain codes that we should run once we have the first install. So apt get install, once my automation engine will come, Actually, it is trying to getting connect, uh, connected with these links and trying to getting some of the patches or some of the updates. Because this is GNS 2 to 10, in the older version, you have to do it manually. Even uh, when it is doing connecting with the uh, remote servers and updating the downloads or updating the patch, you should go and use these uh, steps as well. So here you can see in the back that uh, apt-get update, Python 3, Python 3 pip, netmiko, napalm, simple JSON. And then below you can see that we have this uh, apt-get install git, and then the virtual environment. So even you can copy paste, or if you want to type it, you can do update. It will take some time to do the update. Meanwhile, let me show you what is behind the scene. This is actually a very important page that we have. So here you can see that in bottom, line number 38, a zit clone HTTP. So I'm cloning the configuration or cloning the uh, program from the zit. And then I'm going to this particular folder and then I'm going to the virtual environment that I will cover in upcoming session. And I can run my code. Correct. So that's actually very important to run the code. Now here you can see that it has some problem getting the uh, connection with the internet. So once you install, once you uh, run your system, you do ping to the public IP. And here you can see this is unreachable. It should reach. Now sometimes it happens that some of the laptop, you need to restart your VMware and GNS3 after the installation. So what I will do, 
that after this session i will uh, reboot my laptop and i'll come back in the next upcoming session where we have to follow the uh, zip test step correct so i'll update i will reboot my laptop i'll come back i will copy paste all these configurations simply you can do like this access copy and paste and you can put here so i can go here and put and it will run all the lines of configuration one by one so my python will be ready netmiko and applm these things you will come to know in the upcoming python session then the zit will be up and running and at this point of time i don't want to enable or create my uh, virtual environment that first of all we'll learn about the theory and then we'll do that obviously in upcoming session we have so many codes to understand and learn so slowly we'll learn all these skills all right so let's stop here let me go and reboot my laptop i'll come back with the same setting and we'll proceed further with zit related steps now we have to perform lab related to it and for that uh, better that uh, we can see the lab first of all i have created the lab over gns that we have already discussed and then i have certain packages to install even that packages you can also install so i have packages related to python related to pip related to napalm let me go most of the things uh, i'll cover in upcoming sessions and then we should go and do this app kit install kit now once we have this kit in uh, installed obviously we can go and run the uh, commands related to kit so here you can see that it is already installed then whatever we have a study earlier i can go and do the configuration like that so for example global and then say user name i can go and give my name and then again i can go and give the email as well so user email is networkers.com and then rest of the command if i have any uh, say directory say p1 is my directory name for example and then i can go and create certain files say nano p1 text any name i can go and save this i can copy this p1 text to my p1 we can move to p1 i can go and check okay i have p1 text now i want to do the initialization so once i am in the p1 i can go and use uh, git init and then i want to add again these are the commands which are fixed and while doing the practice will come to know that what is the use of that again we can create some sort of notes a notepad and then we can reuse uh, those codes finally let's do the commit and then i can do the initial commit correct so initial commit and here you can see initial commit has been done now if i go and check here you can see that we have dot git uh, p1 this is the way that we can go and do the commit now next we have a study about the branch as well so i can go and create a branch name is p2 and then branch is a p2 text like likewise we can go and continue correct and now we have the commit for the new working tree is clean no branch master because we don't have the uh, master but here we can go and 
continue our configurations like that so we are already in master and then if you want to create the branches so we can go and create the branches so for example the branch now here you can see that uh, parent is not known so that's why this is throwing an error but yeah this is the way that we can go and uh, do the commit we can add it we can create the branches even in future if you want to merge uh, we can use the merge command as well as we have uh, discussed earlier in the slides all right so let's just stop here and next session uh, we'll go and check 1.2 where we have to learn understand about the apis at this point of time we should understand the git architecture and the github now git or zit that you're seeing here in the slide here we have four major component we have working directory local local repo and the remote now this remote repo can be github and we'll see that what's the official definition of github but it is something like your a web browsing repository you can go and create your account over a zit hub as long as you are public you you can use the resources but if you want your private repository you have to pay something companies they may have their private they may have their uh, public repository correct now this portion here that is the working directory staging area local repo that we have done the lab as well so you you can go and use the keyword uh, git add commit once you do the commit it will go and write to the repo so here you can see that we have the staging area we have the local repository and then if you want to communicate with the remote repo so that option is also there so from local repo you can go and uh, do the zip push if you want to get some update you can go and use zit fetch again we have the checkout and the merge option correct let's understand more about this now here you can see the summary of uh, the slides that we have or summary of the steps that we have already followed so we have a step you are in the initialize step update change and diff now again you can see that workspace local local repo and remote repo and how and what are the commands to do the communication with so this direction is that you are getting the information from the repo and this direction is that you are sending the information from local to the remote repository all right so now let me go and explain you that what is the remote repository although there are few few popular but uh, we are using uh, mostly the github and you can go and create your account over a uh, github this is the web based type of repository that you can go and use so here you can see that we have the github this is the distribution version control system based on zit that is web based it's free as long as you have the public repository but if you want to go and use the uh, private one you have to pay some fees for that how we can go and uh, log into this let me show you that that how we can go and log in uh, let me clear the slide one all right so here you can see that we can go and utilize uh, the command here git clone uh, although i have one example here you can see that git clone https github ai devnet from where i want to uh, copy uh, certain codes and want to utilize in my program so if i go to my automation tool where we have installed the git and all the related packages that we can go and communicate with is it i can go and create the clone and best we can do the copy paste but let me 
type here and then the AI definite and then say getting started with Cisco ST van and obviously this is actually a good place where you can check the Python REST API integration okay so now here you can see that uh, it's unable to resolve let me see if I can ping okay so my network is down at the moment but yeah you can go and utilize this command in future we have so many labs and where I'll show you that how you can go and use this command and you can create your local repo it means you can copy from the remote end to your local system you can do the changes and then you can run execute the programs all right so let's stop here in 1.2 we have to learn understand about api api style several example rest and rpc so let's understand that now before understanding the rest and the other api methods that we have the question here is that what is api now the answer for that will be long so let me start from here that we know that as a network engineer we have started as a cli means we are doing the coding with cli now when we are talking about cli the simple funda is that cli is a uh, human so we are the humans we are interacting with the machine correct so this was something like human to machine interaction now again we have the GUI just to make things simple we can go and do the point click so we have the GUI most of the appliances now they have the GUI as well even the complex CLI it's very difficult to uh, memorize it's uh, error prone etc so we have the GUI where those CLI commands are preloaded in other terms we can think like that also and then again behind the scene it is calling cli and then it is going and running over the screen or running over the machine correct but api is the game changer why because api is machine to machine language so this is something like machine can understand to one machine to other machine now think like this when we are talking about CLI, CLI can't be user for other machine. Means CLI is giving the why the CLI we are giving the instruction. But one API can be user to other API or one API can feed the other API, etc. Okay, so that's a big difference we have, and that's the fascinating thing happening in the industry at the moment that everyone is looking towards API. So here you can see that API is a way that a machine can talk to machine and it's really fast. We are the only users with respect to CLI, but now in terms of API, machines are communicating to each other and there are n number of example. One of the example is suppose if you are looking for the best hotels or list of the hotels nearby your area. So your hotel programming can go and query Google and then Google will go and uh, give the result and behind the scene everything is working in terms of API so as a as a user I triggered one API in my mobile um, one API means again you will think that the HTTP web browsing in loose term you can think that is also a type of API because in HTTP we have several method like get method so whenever you're seeing anything whenever doing any query that will go via get method so http get give me these results that's the get um, equivalent to cli is the show commands that is also get method even snmp is also using snmp get methods so get method is something that you are doing the query you want some result so now here you can see that one api can trigger other api and it is endless and seamless so n number of api can trigger n number of api and then uh, some correlation program is running behind the scene and then it will give the result 
correct and that's again the in in high term that is the machine learning and other stuffs so apis are the engine of innovation and that's true now is it difficult to learn api is it scary the answer is no it's not difficult to learn api because if you know how to do the web browsing you can play around with the apis the four popular method uh, for rest and rest is a one type of api uh, that full form is representational state transfer which is using get post put delete uh, now this thing i am going to cover more and more in the next recording so separate 9 to 10 minutes for rest where we will learn understand a little bit deep inside how the rest is working but in a nutshell it is something like we are doing the web browsing and uh, if you want to see something we can use the get method again you think everything is an object if you want to update the object you can go and do the put method if you want to create a new object you have to use post if you want to delete an object you have to use delete correct so these are the methods we have inside the rest because it's very simple uh, so that's why rest is quite a popular now again there is common a mistake or there is confusion around that okay then what is the use of xml what is the use of json those things you will understand in upcoming session so you have data model you have encoding you have transport you have protocol these are again a, a suit of protocol these are again the stack that we should understand at which level what is there so network layer so for example if you correlate with the uh, tcp ip layer so network la layer functionality is different with respect to data link layer or uh, transport layer or session layer etc so all the layers they have their own function correct likewise the xml and json they are working as encoding methods then there is transport so for example ssh can be transport maybe ssl tls those can be transport so there is other transport method there is again data model like yang so that is again in a different label etc so we should understand in the protocol stack where they are residing and then how they are working correct all right now again uh, when we are talking about the rest method and this particular example is very important and that's why i have taken this so here you can see that you have the different portions so first portion here is the server or host name then what resource you are looking for so you are looking for api for zero code the encoding is json means the output will come in json format and then the parameter so you have one the second and the third request and this is one of the api example again what i am going to do that next two videos will find related to rest and grpc so we will understand more about these apis because in future we have to do the python programming for these apis as well let us learn rest rest is a representational state transfer what it is doing and there is some misconception that this is very difficult to learn and understand but behind the scene what it is doing is that simply that how we are accessing or surfing the web browsers the same way the same method the rest is doing so in the diagram you can see that when we are retrieving any website we are sending the get request and then we are getting the page html page now same way we can use the protocol rest we can send the request as a get means we want to retrieve it. We'll see that what methods or what verbs we have. So we want to read or retrieve the information and then we'll get the information either in JSON or XML format. That's how easy is this, correct? Now more uh, hands-on lab will do, more and more will understand about that. So I am planning to show you the lab in the next session that how you can do the lab from scratch all right so rest is the method that is going to use various type of verb or methods 
what methods that it is going to do i'll show in the next session but it's very much similar that how we are accessing the web browsers again remember that we have the encoding in form of json and xml what methods we have uh, we have this crud method crud is nothing but create retrieve or read update and delete so actually the methods that we have is the get method that you want to retrieve or get some information is put method that you want to uh, update an object you have post that you want to create new object and finally you have delete that means you want to delete the object correct so these are the methods that we have um, being used and these are the top methods means the widely used methods that we are going to use inside the crud so crud is nothing but the methods or verbs inside the rest this is a stateless client server model that's true again we'll see in the upcoming slides developed by w3c proposed by row building in 2000 and nowadays it is widely used even if you want to do the automation in terms of uh, configuring monitoring uh, other stuffs like certificate management uh, creation of object deletion of object in all those things are possible with the rest uh, api obviously you need to encode or you need to embed this method with some other methods so for example i'm using python to take these rest api uh, objects or data and then i'm converting with python language in my table format so i'll show you this lab in the upcoming session uh, same way you can also use and how you can use it i'll show you so we have the crud method we have the create retrieve or read update and delete and here you can see that's an uh, interesting diagram and it's a very important diagram so when you are creating you are sending the payload let me go back and that's very important because you want to send some data you want to create new object when you are retrieving or reading uh, the success code is 200 this 200 is nothing but your code method so you are retrieving the information you are uh, sending query and then you are getting some payload uh, payload information correct finally if you want to update you are updating with the payload finally if you want to delete you can go and give the reference and you can delete it so delete is the easiest operation then you have the uh, get operation then you have the put and finally the post in post obviously uh, we should be very careful while creating an object there are chances that you can create the same type of object so that you can use certain other keywords uh, that the objects will not uh, collide or suppose if same object is there if you are not using the force command uh, that means it will not get created because already you have the existing object so those things should be taken care this crud method we have and we can do all sort of thing related to get post put delete and we have the patch as well uh, but mostly you will see that we are using get post uh, put and delete these four methods will serve all the purpose that we have okay so get that means you're retrieving the data post means you are creating new object put means you are updating the object and again here you can see patch means update and modify so slight difference in between put and patch put will update and replace a resource patch again the name such as patch will update and modify the resource now what methods we have and what type of output will come into the picture again we'll see in the next slide when we have the lab section so once you go and do the rest api call you will get these information so first of all you have the http verb means what you want you want to get the information so you can use the get method then you should go and use the full url i will show you that how it look like then there is some optional thing that body if you are making certain changes this is optional in what format you 
uh, want the output again uh, if it is a post method so we have the method plus the payload and if it is a get method we are doing the request and we are getting the output plus payload correct so you will find that you have the header you have the key values that will be there but we will look for the data field and these data fields that we can go and convert uh, with python language in some readable format correct so again you have the content type you have the uh, acceptance uh, you can go and run the api i will show you again what are the tools available we have so here you can see that we have the curl method which is a very popular tool uh, we can go and use the web based method that the postman but the thing that i want to use is the python language python language uh, so because python can interact with a number of devices because now we have so many plugins we have so many inbuilt programs as well and we have so many uh, resource code in the github as well that we can go and utilize obviously, obviously we can go to the postman and we can do the query i will show you uh, in the next slide all this information i'm going to share in the next slide so before ending this recording i just wanted to uh, tell you that if uh, still if you are in the windows machine and if you have your power cell so you can go to the shell once you are in the cell here you can see the font size is very small if i can go and increase the font size font and make this 24 all right so now once you are here and you want to check this curl method it's very easy you can go and use the curl and there are so many uh, options we have with curl that you can go and explore so i'm doing curl google.com and then you can see that we are getting the uh, result 200 is okay that means success you are getting the content related to google page here you can see that the get request related to google we are getting with the curl method okay so let's stop here and in the next section i'm going to show you the python integration with the api next protocol we have grpc google rpc this is the functional subset of netconf run over https it has high performance it provides simple client development and here you can see the protocol stack now already we have discussed this that uh, we have the data model we have the transport we have the encoding and then the protocol correct so here you can see the encoding is json cli the transport is HTTP, data model is young. And now next, if we go and check that what type of methods that it has. So here you can see that the method that we have is, obviously we know that we have get, put, post and delete. Likewise, here you can see that we have different type of methods. We have the get conf, merge conf, delete, replace, get operation. So retrieve the operational data cli config merge the configuration uh, data in cli format and finally so cmd text output okay so likewise other protocols that we have this is also will uh, will be used and this is high performance uh, again the functional subset of netconf and uh, the protocol format also we have seen all right so let's uh, stop here now we reach to 1.3 and let us understand that the challenges encounters with asynchronous and synchronous api what does it mean what can it it do for us and what are the use cases related to synchronous and the asynchronous apis so let's understand and which one obviously we are using synchronous now in this type of api call what is happening that it will wait until the api will get executed that means that these apis are working one to one 
Now you can think this that this is working in a manner of queue. So uh, one call is coming and it will wait until it get completed. So then the next call will get started. Correct. Rather than asynchronous can have multiple calls. So at a time multiple calls can happen. Now there may be pros and cons for both uh, asymmetric and asynchronous and synchronous that uh, suppose if you have any error in the call API uh, if you have heavy load on a system network bandwidth related issues etc and you can't run multiple APIs at a time so you can think in both ways there is plus and there is minus for both the calls now few of the programs like Java C C sharp they are using synchronous method on other hand Java is script they are using uh, asynchronous method and actually the asynchronous method is the common de facto now it is uh, in our API calls we are using asynchronous uh, API calls now what is happening in this case is that suppose if we have multiple runs and if we have error correct so you should know how you are going to handle that error so we can go and try and we can catch the error and then we can publish the result correct now this particular slide that you're seeing here at this point of time I'm taken from Cisco Cisco what Cisco is telling is that synchronous API calls are blocking calls that do not return until either the change has been completed or there has been error that's the key here I'm telling that if we have the error and suppose if you are doing the call that is asynchronous it's not synchronous because anyway synchronous has to wait till the execution will happen so suppose if I have 10 uh, API calls that is going on and if I don't have error handling mechanism all 10 there are chances all 10 can uh, throw an error and that is not good Correct. So we should handle the error inside the asynchronous call. Now, for asynchronous call, the response to the API call is returned immediately within a, a polling URL. You can just think like asynchronous calls are just we are surfing the websites. You are entering some URLs, you are getting the result. Correct. Now, again, in heavier load condition, it can be more efficient to submit multiple calls, async calls, and periodically check the result. Okay, so the key here is that okay, we understand the synchronous and asynchronous calls, correct? Key here is that how we are going to handle the error if it is there. Now here you can see that the program and I have given you the link as well, reference from where I have taken this. So asynchronous think here you can see in the diagram it's uh, quite clear. So you have uh, API calls one two three and four and here you can see that you have the recovery as well you have recovery as well so what exactly this is this is something like uh, try and catch you're trying something you are catching the exceptions and then the result is coming so simply suppose if you don't have exception rules in Java it's quite popular that we have the exceptions rule or we have the exception handling Suppose if you don't have the exception rule handling rules, then simply the program will exit from that block. So that block will run and it will come out. Even it will know, even it will not go down and check the other options. So, but if you know that what type of errors or what type of exceptions you have, so block code execution. Say for example, block one will happen, two will happen, three will happen, four will happen, and whatever try methods you have it will go and try for those many blocks and then it will exit out if they are not able to find the error if suppose if block number uh, three up to this so this is error this is error but block three is ready to go the code will execute from here and then again further onwards correct so that's the power we have with error handling when we are doing such type of async calls we should have the proper error handling mechanism configured
Great, we have reached to 1.4 where we have to learn about the Python script containing the data structure, the class, function, conditions, loop, etc. So what I have done that this particular section that is 1.4, I have divided into two separate videos. So this particular section has follow up two sessions, two videos, where you will learn, understand about, first of all, basic structure of Python, and then the data types as well. So please go and complete two videos after this session, and then the section 1.4 will get completed, will meet in section 1.5 then. Let us understand Python. We know that the importance of Python language and nowadays it is used everywhere. So either, either it's a networking or machine learning or artificial intelligence, you will find that uh, the use of Python is huge. Why it is this much popular? First of all, this is the interpreter level language. The codes are easy to learn. Again, uh, if you compare with the traditional programming, so for example, C, C++, Java, and then if you go and compare the Python, you'll find the result inside Python is very fast because it's almost like interpreter. It means you are doing the inline type of uh, uh, coding. You are giving input and you are getting the output. So not only that we can do the inline type of programming, but we can go and create a well-documented program and then we can run this as a script as well. So options are there in Python and it's very lightweight, it's fast to execute and it's widely used uh, inside different type of operating system. So for example, in our case, you'll find that uh, most of the Linux operating system by default, they have this Python running inside the box or even it's very easy to install the Python language. You'll see that I will go and install the Python. There is three, four commands that you want to do that for the installation. Uh, in Nexus OS, Python is there. You can go to Nexus OS, you can write uh, Python and you, you will move to the Python cell or Python interpreter. All right, so here you can see that you can go to the Linux and you can type Python and you are inside the Python. So what does it mean that once you are inside the Python, so here you can see that uh, I have uh, my network automation tool, but uh, before going there, I want to show you that you should use these commands. I think the first two, app get uh, update and apt get install to do the installation for the Python language. So I can go here and do the installation because already we have Python up and running. So it will not run much. Even if some minor uh, updates are there, it will go and do the update. Otherwise, uh, we are running Python. That's the latest version. Correct. So you can see that you can go and copy paste all these commands and you'll see that your Python and then the uh, integrated modules are up and running. So once Python is getting installed in the Linux machine, you can go and type uh, Python. Here you can see that we are in the Python cell. Once we are there uh, at this point of time, we can assign the uh, values and then say y equal to x plus four and then say print y. You can see that how easy it is to operate but in upcoming session you will see that we have uh, big big scripts related to networking a device ssh and configuration and open and close a file and run these scripts in different type of uh, for or while conditions okay so those things we will see in the upcoming session now let's come back to the python so it's very easy to use and it's something like common to most of the networking devices. So that's why one Python can do the automation for uh, most of the networking devices and not only the networking devices, but there are other use cases as well in other technologies as well. So what are the benefits we have? It's a free and open source developed, portable, easy to use, learn, object oriented and functional, 
named after Monty Python. Cons is that uh, it's not a program that is written in hex or binaries. That means it is not written in low level uh, code. So that's why it's compared to low level program. It is taking much time to do the execution. Now again, if you go and compare with Tickle, Perl, PHP, C, C++, C hash, all those things you'll find the pattern is uh, a winner because it's uh, easy to learn and execute as well. Now to run this program, Python program, we have n number of options. One option that we are seeing here that will be the best one that I can go to the Python and then I can write the script. This is the inline way, but I can go here. Say for example, let me go out from here and then I can create a file. Say test.py. That's the Python extension. And then you can go and write your script here, whatever script you have. And then it will get executed. So at the moment, I don't have any. Let me show you if I have any other script up and running. So I have say nano and uh, let me show you this. If I have any old script that I just wanted to show you. So here you can see that I have few of the scripts that is already up and already there that I can show you the format and syntax but at this point of time I just wanted to show you that the extension is dot py and it's very easy to uh, build and again it's very easy to execute as well so I can go here to Python 3 because we are focusing on Python 3 and then I can run say wlc1.py if I press enter, then this program will get executed and then we'll get the result. Although how I write this program, you will see that uh, its complexity is there that you will learn in upcoming session. Okay. So it's easy to use and uh, easy to execute and there are several uh, IDs and all. So here you can see that you have ID, you have Komodo, Python Win, PyCharm, etc. There are so many. Uh, what is ID? What is integrated development environment? That uh, you have one notepad type of uh, uh, say editor where you can edit the program and then you can run it. So I have one ID here and by the end of this session, this video, I'll tell you that from where you can go and get it. So first of all, here you can see that I have my cell it is looking like this again if i go and put x equal to 10 and print x so here you can see that how it will it is working and then again if you have any script you can go and open not like this you can go and say create new file and once you have this new file, this is your ID. Both, both are the ID. And then again, you can go and assign say equal to 55 and print say X. And then you should save this. So if I go and save this as a say 55.py, once I save it, then I have option to run this. So I can go here on top run say run the module and then we'll get the output here okay so various ways to write the program the best option we have that we should use the uh, linux and then in gns obviously we have the automation option that we can use uh, we can use that and again we can connect with various networking devices now here is some low level term about python so how the a task is executed so first of all we'll go and save the program as dot py extension then it is going to convert it into a byte code that is the pyc that's the internal conversion and then we have the runtime pvm so it's something like from high level to low level how the program is getting executed behind the scene 
and here you can see this runtime is nothing but the Python virtual machine PVM and again uh, with compared to C and other uh, languages you'll find it's easy to use and it's using some sort of bytecode method to execute and run the program the installation is very easy either you can go and use the Linux that we are using in the GNS3 or you can go to the link here that is the python.org you can download the version related to Windows or Mac OS etc although in Mac OS you'll find this Python is already there even in most of the Linux system nowadays Python will be there Windows you can go download the software install and I have shown you the IDE as well but once you install that then you can check that as well say we can go and run the uh, Python program in Windows so this is showing this is I'm showing in my laptop that it is looking like this say for example y equal to 99 again I should assign from here say 99 and then print y then it will give you result so various ways to execute the program and it's very easy to install it's very easy to uh, learn also and easy to implement also so that's why python is widely used everywhere at this present time now next topic we have a python conceptual hierarchy we know at this point of time that we can go and write the program and then we can save as .py extension now what is happening that whenever we are writing the program we have modules obviously you have the blocks and that block is nothing but the module inside that module we have the statement of expression and those statement that contains expression they are nothing but objects so everything in uh, python is an object we have so many built-in object as well we can write code uh, to define the objects as well and there is actually no concept of that uh, you have uh, no concept of that you uh, you are using some old expression or something like that because if you see here the notes you'll find that python is considered as a dynamic language one way to understand is it to see that python does not required variable that's the thing that's the uh, game changer you can say that that it does does not require variable but it's a dynamic dynamically we can go and assign the variable correct so suppose x equal to 5 we are assigning dynamically uh, means at that particular instance you are going and creating one variable and you are assigning it you will find that because it is supported or natively supported inside linux so most of the linux operating systems it's very easy to install and use as well so here is one example and it's not required in python 3 that you should go and write like this but what we can do that uh, we can start with uh, this uh, shebang this is termed as shebang but it's not required let me quickly show you this the same program in python 3 because python, python 2 is now it is announced officially that is that will be out of support out of live you can think us ul etc so there is no longer support for python 2 in upcoming uh, time so what we should do that we should go and focus more on python 3 and the syntax correct so let me show you here that how this program that we have look like let me write one program let me go and write here so what is this that simply you can go here and you can give say course equals cisco networking programming that's the course because this is the string so you should close inside the quotes either you can use single or double quote but you should not mix a single with double double with single etc and then you can go and print now in 
other versions of python you have some issues like this but uh, when you are using the python 3 you should use the syntax like this so print the course and here you can see that cisco networking programming now here you can see the example is with the old version if i go here and use a print course it will not work okay because it is telling that print is a function you should go and use in this format now next we have three very important uh, terms here or you can see the uh, help utility function that help dir and type and this is actually very uh, important to understand all these three so help means uh, let me quickly read out this help means that we have the python in inbuilt document about the object dir means that what methods related to that object and type obviously means that what type of a string or what type of a, uh, function or expression you are using or what type of object you are using to be more precise so here if i go and say for example if i type x equal to one and then if i go and type x so here you can see that type is integer okay likewise if i go and do dir for x so what methods related to x you will find that these are the methods like avs add add bool seal class del attribute tir etc so these are the supported method with the integer suppose x equal to a that's the string then I can go and use say type uh, X and now here you can see that initially X was one now X is a so we are dynamically assigning the variables and then here you can see the type is now a string and if I go and type say dir is uh, say X so you can see the methods related to a string methods related to integers and then methods related to a string then finally we can go and use the help utility say help uh, int so it will go and tell you the int related object this is the class int object and the methods inside this class all these options inside this class it is telling that you can do all these things likewise I can press up arrow and I can go and check say str string and then inside the string add contains equal format length etc all these methods it is telling that we can go and use inside this particular object okay so that was the important information the same explanation here also just for your uh, reference you can go and read it then finally uh, we have to go and study about Python data type. So in upcoming session, we are going to learn about the string number list Dictionaries boolean and file Although you'll find that all these um, Important information that we have here as a basic Understanding of Python are easy and all these concepts that we are going to learn here We are going to use in the advanced section where we'll go and configure the network devices uh, there are so many operations that we are going to do so we'll tell let configure we'll ssh configure i will use various methodology related to ssh and configuration as well okay so these basic understanding and knowledge of all these uh, data types or the objects is important in the upcoming future videos let us understand Python virtual environment. Now this is useful and you can, you can correlate this with router VRF type of thing. Like you have virtual routing forwarding instance. That means one router don't have only one routing table, but it can have multiple routing table. Correct? Like that in same Python application or Python interpreter that we have in our system, I can run multiple versions program with multiple API. So rather than installing different different Python flavor in different system, we can test uh, we, in our virtual environment, we can test different versions of uh, 
programming code of a different set of APIs. Correct? You can go and check this link as well. Here you can see the explanation. Let's suppose if you have uh, epic 1.1j and you are running uh, epic 1.02m as well and you are checking the API codes related to both the uh, epic or ACI controller. You don't need to install the different different Python package to check this rather than you can work in a virtualized environment and then you can run these programs. All right, so how we can use the uh, vir uh, virtual environment here you can see I can go and log into my automation tool. I can go and check the Git installation and uh, before doing this, we should do the app get update. Once you do the update, after that you can uh, check the uh, zit installation. Then uh, after that, you can see that we have command app get install Python 3 uh, v virtual environment. We'll go and do the cloning for one of the sites that we are going to use in upcoming sessions so we can uh, reuse the code or we can change the IPs or certain places in that code and we can utilize in our program as well. So let's this get completed although we have done these steps in the earlier sessions as well. It can be very faster so we can wait for next 15 seconds here. All right, so it's almost done. Then I can go and do the git installation here. You can see now we are getting the option. Once this is done, let's wait here. Then what I can do that I can go and do apt git install python 3 when and this will also take some time done you can see it's quite fast now i'll go and do the cloning for the git and this will be the big url so github.com ai devnet say getting started so let me type the entire code here this is long string even you can go to this url and verify the coding and all it's very easy to use uh, with the web browser so i can go and type the complete string started and cisco st van REST APIs kit. You can see it is doing the cloning and it is asking the username and the password because we have said that I have the username and password and it is not found. Great. Let me try once. So you can see that cloning has been done. Maybe some place I have some spelling mistake or typo. All right, now I can go to this folder and you can see that we have so many programs that is there for our reference now say for example i want to run any of these program even you can go and check so this is for api related python program and i can go and check the others as well so for example login what login is required do i have to set some environment variable or I have to go and manually put the login and the username. So at the moment you can see that I can go and run this Python program. This is actually the Python program. So I can go and run the stvan.py and 
few of the things will be missing. So don't worry. You will see in the upcoming section that how you can actually go and install the, uh, these modules. While doing the installation, you will see that there is a requirement file as well. Correct? So first of all, what you need to do here is that you should go and check this requirement file. Now, here you can see that uh, at the moment we are running this program in a Python library. It's not in the virtual library. Now, if you want to utilize the virtual one, what you can do, uh, step number 42 we have done, but here you can see these are the requirements. So Python 3.6, virtual environment, activate it, and then whatever uh, requirements are there, we should go and run this. So before running this code, I just wanted to show you that what requirements are there that you want to install. So these are the packages, these are the libraries you want to install that will help this particular program to execute properly. So here we are putting the virtual environment and then it is going and installing all the requirement file. Correct. So let it be completed. Now some of the places you can see that we have error. Now for those code, what you can do, you can go and search it and you will get the proper uh, direction to install these particular packages, correct? Now again, if I go and run my Python code, that is the Python 3 stvan.py. If it is not there, then we can go and run. So now you can see clearly that we are in the virtual environment and we can go and run the program. Okay, so few places we have the error. We'll correct these errors in the upcoming section. The target for this particular session was just to tell you that you can run the run execute your program in the virtual environments. Okay, and I, still if you want to check any of these small programs, so I can show you say, for example, nano hello.py and then you can go and print Hello, correct, and you can run the Python 3 hello.py and here you can see the output, okay? So let's just stop here. We'll continue the labs in the upcoming section where we have to go deep inside this and then we have to execute the um, labs. Again, if you go and check the slavers, you'll find that we have 20% weightage for SD-WAN programming. So better when we start the SD-WAN module, SD-WAN section, we'll perform these labs. And now we reach to 1.6 where we need to understand the benefits of Ansible and Puppet to do the automation related to iOS XE or even any type of operating system that Cisco has. Not only the Cisco operating system, but non-Cisco operating systems like Juniper and other vendors also is well supported uh, via Ansible. So let's understand, first of all, that what is the importance, what is the use cases we have, and why exactly we are looking for Ansible or maybe Puppet to do the automation for the, our management related task inside the enterprise infrastructure. So we have uh, different type of tools. So for example, Puppet, Ansible, Chef, Salt Stack and others. These are the topmost or the popular one. So we have Puppet and Chef. They are agent based tool and Ansible is agentless. Now what does it mean by agent based and agentless is that you have to install the agent or you have to install a small piece of software to all the devices to whom you want to monitor via these tools. That is not the case with Ansible. Ansible can run 
in the control system in the controller in the automation tool that we have and then it can uh, push the configuration or it can uh, send the configuration either it's uh, related to configure the devices or to get the information about the devices to various networking devices now the next question is that why we are using this why we are doing this the answer is that say think about the operational case suppose if you have to create the vlans or ip addresses or any type of failover testing maybe you have n number of branches and you want to do the failover testing now in that case if you are doing it manually and this failover test you have to do say for example every every month twice now if you do it uh, manually and from long long time we are doing it manually it is okay we can do it but it's time consuming it is repetitive and it may be error prone if you do some sort of typing mistake rather than these type of things can be done with help of program within few minutes even within few seconds as well depending upon what task you have and how much time it is taking for the programs to load and compile and then execute that only time that much time only it will take so we have different type of tools that we are going to use to manage the infrastructure uh, again here we have to discuss about puppet and uh, ansible but yeah there are so many tools that can be uh, help to manage the tools now you can see this python on and on and on because python even for the ansible also that's a prerequisite so you should have the python module inside the uh, inside your system to run the ansible correct all right so now we are becoming the net devops engineer so we are doing the networking we are uh, we uh, should learn the devops skills as well to manage operate our infrastructure again the same repetitive things i have added here just for our revision that if you are doing automation we can avoid a repeated task any type of errors faster deployment identical configuration it's easy to reuse the code what are the tools we have we have sif we have solid stack we have puppet again there are some others as well what is ansible it's open source but now uh, linux has acquired that i think long back and um, the modules are open anyone can install this and you can use it it's no not a big deal even in my automation system in my lab also i have the ansible and i can run execute the program it need python so simple isn't less it is a push model how it is using here you can see the comparison when we have the puppet master we have the ssl connection and then puppet agent in between that we are running the puppet but when we have the ansible since this is agentless over the sss transport we can do the management of the devices all the codes everything will be loaded and executed at the controller node and then it will go and push the uh, configuration to the managed nodes what are terms we should understand you should understand yaml jinja playbook task role host facts gather facts etc these are the terms when you do the program you'll find this yaml program will start with three dashes and then here you can see that how easily we can read this program and what this program will do so this program the host is ios routers uh, we are gathering the facts no connection is local now what is the task to save the configuration and how we are saving the configuration with write mem so this command will go uh, log into all the devices that is listed inside the ansible host and then it will write the memory means it will save the configuration again uh, we should have the list of host where we are pushing the configuration or getting the configuration so we should have the inventory and once you run execute this program with respect to inventory it will give you the desired result let me quickly show you that i have one of the program in my automation tool and how my topology is here you can see that it is connected here let me scroll down so i have one csr device that is connected with my automation tool in this network 
and I should ping to my CSR device before doing any configuration. Now I just wanted to show you that what configuration I have. I have ios.yml is just the program name uh, the working one is the site.yml you can see what this program will do it will go and check the show version from this particular device correct and let me check if i have other program as well say uh, cat ios.yml this will go and do show run again. Uh, you can see the format here. You can see the host list. So it's very easy to read and it's very actually easy to execute as well. Okay. All right. So let's just stop. All right. So we have successfully completed section 1.0. Now we are in section 2.0 where we have to learn about automate APIs and protocol. So here you can see that this section is divided into five part. We have to learn about JSON in Young model, XML in Young model, a Young module. So what is Young and how it work? What is the data model, etc. Different type of uh, functionality that we have in the Young related to Young. So not only the Young is the module, but you have other modules as well. So open config IETF native young model, etc. So we can do the comparison as well, but better uh, we'll understand the young more and more so that will help us to understand the data model. And then finally in this section we have 2.5 where we have to learn understand about the net conf and rest conf. Okay, so let's start section 2.0. I have break this section into several videos and those videos are easy to follow but all those videos are going to have good amount of content and knowledge base solution of the uh, networking managing uh, the devices and the programmability we know that uh, the way that we are managing the device that is still the case that we are managing the device here you can see in the diagram that the operators they perform manual verification we are doing the telnet ssh or snmp methods to log into devices we can pull uh, different type of uh, information from the devices uh, when we are doing the troubleshooting we are using the cli still cli is used for troubleshooting purpose then we have multiple other tools so for example uh, we can use multiple tools from solar wind or there are uh, many vendors they have tools related to trace route or maybe to uh, understand or to do some sort of visibility uh, with respect to netflow and other inbuilt mechanism we have inside the devices one of the key uh, role that we have with the SNMP in the existing network is to manage the network devices. One of the uh, good example for this is that SolarWind tool that with the Orion SolarWind tool, uh, we have the polars everywhere. We are doing the SNMP configuration and with the inbuilt MIB, and that's again the database. And that's again one type of uh, you can think one type of object uh, which has code related to MIB. That's the uh, manage information base. And uh, from that, uh, we are using some sort of get method. And then uh, re retrieval of data is happening. Now, there are a lot of disadvantages of SNMP, although this is running from more than 25 years, this SNMP. Uh, simple network management protocol to manage the entire IT infrastructure. This is good as well, but the capability of SNMP is not that huge. It's okay that we can have the inventory. We can uh, check what interface is going up and down, protocol is going up and down, etc. But there are n number of limitations we have with SNMP. So I'll list all the uh, limitations that we have in SNMP one by one. Again, when we are talking about CLI, this is for human, this is not for machine. While the APIs are 
built to machine that's is something like machine to machine language but on other hand it's very easy to read as well so not only the machine can understand but the humans can also understand uh, different type of api and the format of api now starting with this snmp that uh, evolved or developed in late 1980 and it was doing its job we know that we have SNMP version 1, version 2, and now we have version 3. That's uh, quite secure. But version 1 and version 2, they are uh, community-based SNMP. Means community, you can think at this point of time, some sort of password-based uh, system who is taking the information or who is pulling the information from the uh, networking devices. Or even we can push the configuration as well. We can push the script as well from the SNMP server to the networking devices. But still, the method that we are using is quite fixed and just legacy. So let me quickly list you all the uh, disadvantages that we have with the SNMP. Here we can see that uh, SNMP is using, so let me quickly highlight this, uh, uses a get request to retrieve MIV variable. That's kit is nothing but type of show like we are typing show run show is equivalent to get you can think in the API world Now here you can see the limitation of SNMP is that version 1 and version 2 are Loosely secure. They are not 100% secure It is not built for real-time communication. That's true. So it has the polling interval and Sometime it will take 15 to 20 minutes time to just get the information that what happened in the network infra. It has a lack of writable MIB. So all the MIBs are fixed. Again, the vendor, they will create the MIB. And again, with the OS patch or code, the MIB will get updated. So it's not that you can write the MIB and you can upload. Okay, so that's the problem we have. This is the vendor lock uh, writable MIB we have. Uh, difficult to replay or roll back the configuration. You don't have library. So for me These are the biggest dis disadvantages writable MIB uh, Lacks of library like so for example Python you can have the libraries you can use multiple libraries for different type of devices and then you can Use inside the code that is not the case for the MIB and the scale factor is missing the security factor is mixing uh, the real-time monitoring is missing. So those those are the disadvantages we have in the existing networking model and if you see at present the enterprise level so many companies now they are doing the API based or the uh, netcon for restcon based based uh, monitoring or the management system Okay, so it's not that uh, uh, these things are not in use. They are already in use and Along with SNMP, maybe some places you'll find SNMP is used some places you'll find mix of SNMP and the other uh, rest based APIs or other uh, tools programmable tools uh, Are used some places you'll find that hundred percent programmable tools are in use. So for example uh, 2015 Google has announced uh, intent to disable SNMP for uh, monitoring by 2017 So big companies like Google or say for example Microsoft or those type of networking giants uh, They are very prone to the real-time informations So 15 minute delay or 10 minute delay is a big lag and they don't want to do that. So that's why in Google and in such type of big companies We have a real-time monitoring based system and that is again a system based on the programming uh, programmable uh, modules or different type of APIs REST API XML APIs, etc All right, so these are the problems we have with the SNMP uh, we have a restriction, we have locked, we can't scale, security, etc. So just to overcome from that, uh, we are moving from this existing uh, network. You can see that most of companies still using this type of uh, networking solution to manage their networking devices to next-gen configuration management uh, system.
now when we are talking about next generation management system so at that time uh, the goal or the agenda is that handle machine to machine communication correct and what are the high points we have at this point of time is provide easier to use management interface support client side validation and error checking that's again the big thing so we are uh, validating the client side uh, validation and the error checking we have separate configuration and operational data we have built in backup restore capability uh, be both human and machine friendly now the moral of a story is this that when we are using the programming interfaces that's again the next generation management uh, tools so in at that point of time what is happening that there are so many things that we already know those are the problems with the existing snmp based management system so new programming interfaces or the management tools they know all the existing problem and then they have created this system having those problem in mind so that's why we have the uh, support client side validation error check checking management interface uh, say backup and restore capability etc these are just five or six points that you are seeing here but apart from that the biggest advantage we have is in terms of programming that you can create or you can use the existing libraries or some point of time if some company so for example uh, palo alto when that company will write the libraries and the python scripts etc we can uh, reuse that code inside our infrastructure again the other example is cisco ice Cisco IS is using ERS means you have to enable the ERS external restful services to uh, check that rest APIs but if you go and check uh, Cisco IS programming infrastructure you'll find that they are already given n number of Python script or other scripts as well to monitor the device from the scripts to monitor this uh, devices from the programmable interfaces likewise you'll find that in sd wan we have n number of apis in cisco aci we have n number of apis so all these companies now whenever they are launching their product they are giving the rest api integration even pan os now they are supporting rest apis as well uh, they are supporting xml based apis as well and rest apis as well so having this thing in mind that if suppose n number of devices that i have in the networking and they are supporting same type of rest based api that means the same type of programming structure or same type of structure can be used to n number of devices and that's the consistency we have to manage the devices uh, from the programming interfaces all right so what is the solution we have seen in the previous section that we have the evolution of network where we are using the traditional method like SNMP and others to manage the network devices. On other hand, when we are using the programming interfaces, when we are using the uh, programmable glue to manage the uh, networking devices, at that time we are landed upon model driven network programmability now so the question here is that is the model driven network programmability or programming is the solution or is the modern way to manage the entire IT infrastructure and the answer is yes why because because this is independent of network devices so either we have the Cisco Juniper Avaya or any vendor device all these devices nowadays they have the programmable chip they can understand the program they can understand the application most of the devices most of the networking devices nowadays they can understand the applications as well and they are built in a way that they can integrate with the cloud and the uh, virtual world as well so now the answer is yes that with the programmable interfaces we can manage the entire infra now the next very important question here is that how and what will be the format of the programmable interface that we are going to discuss now 
So now you can see that instead of uh, CLI and Telnet SSH, we have the open APIs. Then we have the open transport protocol. We have the open data format, and then we have the uh, various type of standardizations. Again, uh, we have discussed this earlier that now we have n number of libraries that can be supported inside the programmable interfaces. That is, hence it's not possible in the SNMP based MIB because it's very fixed and uh, very difficult to scale. So now uh, the next very important question is that what will be the format? Say when you are managing the device either with SNMP or CLI or SSH, you are logging in into the device, you are doing some configuration change, and then you are getting certain output. But what in case of programmable interface or uh, programmable management world? The answer is this particular slide. So now here you can see that. Uh, uh, you have your application on top so let me try to highlight here so we have the application here in the top say app 1 app 2 app 3 and then we have the bindings so we have model driven apis development kit and the below four are very important so what protocol it is supporting it is supporting network configuration netconf restconf grpc now here you can see that netconf can understand the encoding of XML. So here the important because um, most often we are uh, seeing netconf, restconf, gRPC, XML and JSON and then we are not able to fix it that exactly where it is going to be used. So from this diagram you can understand that the protocols are netconf, restconf and gRPC their encoding format so netconf can understand xml rather than restconf understand both xml encoding and json encoding in upcoming section we'll learn more about xml and json and i will do the lab as well likewise the grpc they can understand json now what is the transport the transport is ssh tls https http2 what is the model model is the data model now you can think this and you can correlate this with the TCP layer where we have the physical layer data link layer network layer etc correct that's the internet layer and then the upper layers so here if you go bottom to up that is the model then transport then encoding protocol binding and app so model is data model transport is SSH, TLS, HTTPS, encoding is XML, JSON, and then the protocol netconf, restconf, and gRPC. Correct. So now we have the answer related to this question that okay, since you are going to use the network programming uh, programming interface, how we are going to log in into the device? So suppose if we have to configure a device, uh, so for example, let's do that. So sd -WAN, v manage controller, they will go and use netconf to push the configuration. Obviously, behind the scene, uh, the devices, they have the data model. So whenever we are doing the configuration at the level of GUI, that can be converted to some machine language and then that can be pushed to the end devices. Correct? So this is the way that netconf behind the scene can use uh, SSH and then it will go and configure the uh, devices. Netconf will go and use XML and then the transport protocol and then the data model. All right, so what we are going to do in upcoming sections is that we'll go and learn more about uh, JSON, about XML one by one, okay? So again, I have given this diagram one more time because I found this is very important to learn, understand. So let's stop here. And next section, we'll understand, learn about JSON and we'll have to do the lab related to that as well. Let us learn, understand about JavaScript object notation. In short, that's JSON. Now we know that we have the encoding format 
uh, XML and JSON. So let's learn about JSON. Now this JSON is, uh, if we know Python dictionary, it's very much similar to that. There is also one difference between Python dictionary and JSON is that JSON is supporting name value pair, but the Python they are having uh, Python dictionary they have uh, having the key value uh, pairs. So that's the thing we have name value versus key value. But once we understand uh, either of one, either Python dictionary or JSON uh, name value pairs, then it's very easy to understand uh, one to other. So one, if you understand, you can understand the other as well. Now in this example, you can see that we have the programming started here, say ins underscore API, and then you have the name and value. So type CLI show version 1.2 SID, EOC, etc. So in this way that can be formatted means the JSON program can be formatted. Now we have several example here as well. I will show you in a while. Uh, JSON is again we know that this is nothing but the uh, data encoding format. So we have XML and JSON. Uh, it's a uh, easy to understand format because if you go and check the program and I'm going to show you a few of the examples you'll find it's very easy to understand because it is associated with the name and the value and uh, because this is easy to understand and because this can be natively called inside Python so the usability and the use case of JSON is huge so what I'm going to uh, do here, uh, first of all, let me go and run uh, one of the program here. You can see that we have one program called facts and then we have the host name, uh, Nexus, OS, etc. So let me quickly go and run this program in my automation tool. Let me exit from here. So we are inside the automation tool. I can go and create this or run this as a script as well. So if I want to do that, I can create say nano and say py. I want to import the JSON and then we can go and give the, uh, we can create the program, correct? So let's do this. What is that? And I don't need to give in multiple line rather than you can go and give like this. So only three I have. And then I can close my parenthesis. Let's go and put the value. Now here you can see that uh, when we are writing this format for JSON, you can see here that uh, start with this and then you should give the colon and then sh you should end like this and then the comma, correct? So now let me uh, put the value, say host name is say NSX, NXOSV and then comma. So this is the format for the JSON, the uh, name and the value we are giving. OS, we can check the OS, say for example, I can go and give the OS a dot and I should use it like this, so a dot a zero. And then finally, we have the final value, that's the location. So location, I can give and give that as a San Jose and that's it. Now we should close this parenthesis and as programming things that we should start and end in the symmetric fashion. Now what I want here if I go and print and I should use the bracket here. So print the this program. So let me save it and 
let's run this. So Python 3 sc.py and here you can see uh, we are getting the output like this but what I am interested to show you this uh, is and before coming here I should copy this program. So let me exit from here and I can show you this program. So this is the program that we have and I can go to the Python and here you can see that the program that we have, let me give line by line. So now here you can see that it is printing this program and then we have the name and the value. Now if I go and check the type for the facts, here you can see this is the dictionary. Now what I want that I want to uh, convert this inside the native uh, Python programming. So for that, uh, here you can see that it's uh, in the dictionary format. What I can do that uh, I can go and facts one equal to say I can give JSON dump so we have the keyword like dumps and load uh, I'm using this dumps here and what I am doing I'll show you just let me execute this program and then I'll explain a same type of format although we have used earlier uh, in the networking automation programs as well now here you can see the difference and now if I go and check the type and type for the facts one. So clearly you can see that uh, we have converted the JSON dictionary and actually it is the native form inside Python dictionary to the string str. Dictionary can be converted to the str with help of the dumps command and that's why we are using the dumps and then we have the given the indentation of four here so the output will look like good okay so that's the key thing that we have discussed about the json and uh, we'll discuss more and more about that as well so here you can see it's very easy to use and cisco devices so for example Cisco Nexus devices they are uh, using the JSON format inside the Nexus OS itself so next what I will do I'll log into the Nexus device and I will show you that how it will be used inside the Cisco Nexus device all right so again and the same thing that I have shown you the example you have now what I can do here I can go to the Nexus device and then I can show you the host name and uh, this host name I want to show you in the JSON format correct so again you will see that Cisco natively using JSON format as well so we can use pipe and then JSON and you can see the name and the value output now what's the use of this the use of this that once I have the JSON format, then I can use the same JSON format to create my Python program. Correct. So here you can see, for example, uh, when we are checking show VLAN brief and then the JSON, it is telling that what is the name and the value. Likewise, the same concept. So for example, key and the value we can use inside our own Python program. Correct, and that's the interesting um, use case we have, one versus the other. So here you can see that we have the uh, VLAN output, and I'm going to run in the Nexus device that is there in the GNS. So let me quickly go and open that device. All right. So what I'll do here, I'll exit from here first of all. Let me quickly do the SSH to the Nexus device. Yeah, I have this Nexus over 
my GNS and I can use say for example show host name and then the JSON format and here you can see the name and value like that I can go and use show VLAN brief and then the JSON and here you can see I have created some other uh, two VLAN VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 and let me increase the space here so you can see it properly all right so here you can see the format that we have the uh, default VLAN say VLAN 1 and clearly we have the key and the value key and the value so VLAN show uh, brief VLAN ID this and then we have the uh, VLAN actual VLAN that is there in the system then the name is default we haven't given even any name then the state is active no shutdown so all the VLANs they are in the state of no shutdown likewise you have the VLAN 10 name VLAN 20 name and this is the system generated number so when we are going to use this inside the program inside the Python program we should use in the same type of format that we have okay so this is the example related to Python so we can go and use ID name and the state ID name and state and we can create our dictionary that can be used inside the Python programming all right so let's stop here and in the next session we'll learn a few of the examples about JSON the next topic we have extensible markup language or XML now there is difference between XML and HTML although you'll find that HTML and XML looks very much similar but there is one basic difference and the difference is this that the XML is designed to describe the data and that's the key I want to highlight here let me quickly go and highlight so here you can see that XML is to describe the data uh, on the other hand HTML is to display the data and that's one of the reason we are using HTML code to build the websites although the XML code we are going to use inside the uh, Python integration or inside the API integration, etc. Okay, so here you can see the main difference that one is to describe and one is to display the data, although the look and feel is almost the same. So the code will start like this. So again, let me go and highlight here. You can see that it will start with these brackets and while you are going to end it so when you are ending it it will go and end with bracket and slash so any of the code that you are seeing here say for example INS API it is going and ending here at INS API inside that we can have a small a small code as well so those codes also if you start it will go and end like this so for example say so for example outputs you'll find that outputs will also go and close here then you can see the body so this is the closing of the body this is the starting of the body now in between that we can put various uh, information and then those information can be called inside any program say for example python program so for that i am going to show you the example as well so we have done the comparison uh, with uh, html html is to display xml is to describe the data on other hand if you go and do the uh, analysis or do the comparison with json we'll find that with json json is much more human readable correct and xml is not as much human readable like json but still the use case is big uh, again if you are studying uh, palo alto firewalls you can go and check palo alto firewalls they are supporting xml based apis 
So those APIs uh, which is encoded are do are supporting the XML format. Again, uh, it is highlighted here that XML on other hand is used to describe the data. Uh, so how we are going to go and build the program and how we are going to uh, integrate inside the Python language that I want to show you next. So let me go and open my automation tool. All right, so I'm inside my automation tool and here I can show you, say I have one example related to XML. The better way I can show you here is like this. So here you can see that a note will start and then note will go and end like this. Then in between, if you want, you can have the headers and footers. Those are the terms that we are generally using in the HTML code. But in XML also too, and inside that you have the information. From inside that you have the information, reminder, and then the body. Okay, so this is one of the general format that we have related to XML. I have one other example as well. Say so for example, movies.xml. Now this is again the data that I'm going to call inside the Python language. So here you can see that uh, collection self, say so for example, new arrivals. And if I go and if I show you, so here you can see this collection is closing. So the starting for this program is collection and then movie and then again you can see this movie and they are getting close so you can think like this that you have main program inside that you have a small a small program so if i start type type has local scope here so type is ending here again the format the year rating a star so likewise we have created the movie title uh, say behind enemy behind and this is the description and the detail about that movie. So it is ending here. Like that, I can go and create that information for the other movie, then other movie, then other movie. So we have four movies here. And you can think that the database of four movies we have here that I want to go and call inside my Python program. So if I can go to the Python program here you can see again this program is a little bit bigger but you can understand that first of all I have to go and create the handler and again we have the integration of XML with SAX 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 is again uh, one dynamic form that can be integrated with XML so first of all in this program what we're doing is that we have the class and the definition Inside that we are not calling anything at this point of time. So we have the uh, class here movie handler. Then again you can see that we have the definition start element and then the end element like that we have defined and by the end of this program you can see that we are calling that XML that is the movies dot XML. So what this program will do that it will go and use the Python program, but the input is the movies.xml and then it will print that all those movies that we have in the list. Now I have taken this example from the URL here. If you want to know more about this, you can go and check this particular URL on the top. All right, so let's go back and run the Python program. So I can go here and I can run the movies.py and here you have the result. So the movie behind enemy line and all those movies you can see that now it is very much the human readable format rather than if you go and check the movies file, the original movies file that we have, it is like this. So here you can see that this is the XML format and then we ran our program and we and then we have the human readable format. We have called this XML file inside the Python program and then the result is like this.
so please go to that particular link that I am showing here and then you can check the reference related to SACS and then uh, different type of handles that we have plus the class functions the rest of the things we already discussed that we have discussed about the loop condition if and else so those loop conditions are very much the same uh, whenever you run any type of Python complex program you have to give the conditions and loop so multiple things or repetition will happen inside the loop data models sometimes it is referred as a next generation API so now we have different type of APIs so for example XML API rest API but still we are looking towards the data model now before understanding the data model you can see here the structure of the data model so in bottom we have the data model on top for transport we have SSH TLS HTTP HTTPS encoding is done via the XML JSON protocols that is going to be used is netconf and we know that netconf is used inside st in and in other cisco solutions as well we have the restconf we have grpc and then the development kit and the app now this is the stack for the data model and again in upcoming session we are going to learn more about the data model so the main question here is that why we need data model although the CLI is doing good uh, we have used CLI from long long years so the answer for this is that because CLI don't have any data model or don't have any structure in CLI what we are doing we are uh, doing some request we are running some show run command or show IP and brief etc but we are not a specific that the output that we will get will follow some sort of pattern and since we don't know the pattern after that we can't uh, take those input uh, whatever output we have those output we can take as an input and then we can play around with those outputs that's now not the case when we are dealing with the data models so what will happen in this case that uh, say for example VLAN ID so now let's discuss about this data model and few of the things related to data models say for example when we are checking the VLAN so what are the attributes we have with the VLAN so here you can see that what is the range of the valid VLAN so we have certain questions related to VLAN so what will be the range of the VLAN can a VLAN name have a spaces in it should the values be enumerated and only support up and down should the value be string or integer so now we have different questions query related to VLAN and now we can think that okay how we can utilize VLAN inside the data model okay so now in future suppose if you go and configure the VLAN via Ansible playbook or maybe via Python programming you will see that we have to put a certain structure certain input for VLAN or any type of configuration that we are doing via data models okay now we have one common uh, misconception that the netconf or the restconf they are sending the encoded messages or values so here you can see it's very important to understand is that netconf restconf grpc they are working as a protocol is still for encoding still for data encoding uh, we are using json format we are using xml format and that's very important so maybe you can embed this json or xml inside your python program or many or maybe uh, other program and then uh, you can write certain code that you will get the result okay and we have seen these type of examples as well all right so now what's our focus our focus is to check what is next generation api and next generation api we are talking about the robust model that is a young 
so let's stop here and in next section we'll go and learn about the young data model object or we can say the program as well next we have a young language that is yet another next generation and this is the fundamental behind the model driven programming young that was introduced in 2010 so now it become quite mature and we'll see that various flavors are there so young model and then we can think as non young model so young is not only the model which is model driven but we have other models as well so here you can see if you want to learn more you can go and check rfc 6220 initially it was built over netconf protocol but now it is supported rest conf as well it is a model driven so here you can see that you have multiple objects they are connected and obviously that once you are calling one object they will go and pull other object and uh, the hierarchy is like that that's the one reason that will be used inside the programming as well so young here you can see that definition is that is a formal contract language uh, with rich syntax and semantics obviously it has quite a long uh, number of semantics and it is supporting in number of functions or modules again in the lab section actually i have done the lab with respect to ios xe and in the lab section you will see that we have so many features that is supported when we are going and checking the young model even i have my csr device as well so let me quickly log into the csr device i'll go and enable the netconf and then you can see the capabilities that we have so let me quickly log into the lab so I have my lab here you can see over GNS and here you can see the CSI device in the external network I have my iOS X devices that is connected and here I have my network automation tool so I can go here let me exit I am connected with the controller so let me go and exit now I'm inside the network automation tool what I have done in this CSI device that I should go and enable the SSH first so for that you should go and enable the crypto key so let me show you that crypto key generate RSA modulus 102 for that I have done first uh, once you have this then you should go and enable the netconf SSH and netconf young that is with respect to ios xe so once we'll go and enable say netconf ssh netconf young then what i can do that let me quickly show see the ip address and i will go and log in via the young so we can go and check the capabilities so now I can go to my automation tool and I can do the SSH. The username and the password is Cisco Cisco in this device I have configured. This is the IP and then the port we know that is 830 for netconf SSH. And then I can go and use netconf. Password is also Cisco. Now you can see the capabilities. So here, you can see the full list of young capabilities that we have with iOS XE. So it is supporting IP local pool, multicast, IPsec policies, even the SNMP MIPS. So many things that is supporting. Okay. So let's quickly go back to the slides. All right, so now we have seen that yes, we have the young netconf support in the iOS XE and later you'll see in the XR as well. Because this is the industrial standard, so IETF, ITU, and OpenConfig, these are the open standard body. That means that most of the network vendors they will support this. There are some common ground in between the Cisco, means Cisco devices can support their own young netconf model 
or maybe they will follow the uh, industry standard as well or Cisco has their own custom made uh, model driven programming as well that we'll discuss in the upcoming session upcoming recording so here you can see that we have this industry and standard IETF define open config group then we have Cisco common and nice example is that that OTV feature is common in iOS XE and Nexus operating system and then finally we have the uh, standalone as well or the platform specific as well and that is nothing but uh, any type of feature that is supported only in Cisco again remember two things first thing is that the Young is not only one model driven, driven program. There may be other model driven programs supported uh, other locations. And second thing is that we always have the customization. So maybe one vendor will have their own model or maybe he has the common in between them. So customization is there and other model driven programs are also available. this section onward we are going to learn and understand model driven programming now model driven programming and what protocols we have that we'll see in the upcoming slide but concept here is that everything will start with a main program so this model driven programming and the concept of programming will be uh, same when we are talking about the hierarchy so here you can see that you have the parent or the main program so maybe main function that we have in the language like C C++ etc in between that you have the routines so I have the chassis I have the chassis ID and then again you can see that you have the card numbers and finally inside the card you have the ports correct so likewise you can think uh, model driven programming where you have the skeleton in a way that you have the main or the parent node and then everything will start falling down in the bottom as a sub program now again we have discussed this point earlier that the young is not only the model driven program rather than we have the other model driven programs as well one best example is aci which is not using a young type of model driven programming but still it's quite robust and useful correct so the point here is that that we don't have only young model driven programming but there are others as well now at the beginning young was using netconf and the encoding was actually xml now young can use a protocol as a netconf restconf and encoding can be used as a json and xml correct so uh, model driven programming is the truth and there may be different model driven programs but the main concept here is that when we are talking about the models so at that time we may have encoding methods like XML or JSON and the protocols here you can see that we have netconf, restconf, rest and gRPC so protocol may be different different and in upcoming session we are going to learn these protocols all right so here you can see that we have protocol restconf netconf grpc and let's stop here uh, next session onwards let's learn these protocols one by one now the next important topic we have is the netconf so let's understand netconf and netconf for network configuration protocol one of the uh, use case for this at least we have at this present time is that if you check the Cisco SD-WAN fabric you'll find that the vManage inside the management plane is using netconf protocol to configure all the devices inside the data plane or maybe to push the configuration to the control plane uh, other controllers as well like vsmart so that is the one of the use case the other use case that i will show you here is that i'll go and log in to the csr router there you will see that we have so many capabilities related to network configuration or netconf 
Now, why NetConf is important? Because this is something called transaction based protocol. That means that if they do not do all the transaction, they will abort all the uh, data. So until unless the 100% uh, things, stuffs can be transferred, uh, until unless they will not uh, say in between if you have any interruption, they will not send rest of the data. The second important thing here, you can see that the uh, NetCon protocol having candidate running and a startup configuration. So not only that we have the running and the startup configuration, but we have something called candidate configuration as well. And suppose if you want to uh, put this configuration, this candidate configuration. So there is one command called commit. You can go and do the commit, although we have commit uh, verification or validate check, etc. So you can do and do commit check. Those things are also there. Means you are checking the commands that you want to put. So somewhere in between you have some transactional data is still not confirmed to push to the device that will be working as a candidate running. We know that it is saved in the RAM and a startup is in the NVRAM. Correct. So that's the thing we have now. Uh, earlier we have discussed that uh, NetConf is a protocol. This is not your transport method. So the underlying transport underlying secure transfer we have the SSH. Why we need NetConf? That's the most important thing we have. Now NetConf is a new uh, model for network management and this is the transaction based network management protocol that has much more capability that what we can do with SNMP and SNMP itself has problem and vulnerability and restrictions that you cannot write the library uh, libraries SNMP MIPS are preloaded inside the operating system. There are so many things the most important thing we have with the SNMP in terms of the problem or the restriction is that it's very tight and it's uh, very much vendor specific. On the other hand, NetConf is widely used because uh, under the data model, so it can be changed, it can be altered, and it is going to give you in number of capabilities that is not possible with SNMP. Correct. So now this uh, SNMP, even um, if we check the feature by feature, uh, uh, feature by feature listing between SNMP and NetConf, you'll find that NetConf has a huge benefit advantage uh, with respect to SNMP. Now it can be integrated, uh, the NetConf can be integrated with API and this lab we have seen that we are using the RestConf, REST-based uh, API integration with Python and you have seen that how fast it is to take the input from the centralized management plane. Correct? So NetConf is the protocol that most of the companies they are looking at and a uh, few of the companies they are actively using as well. Now, what are the other features we have in the NetConf? They are the transactional based. They are using the client server model. And what does it mean? I will uh, show you in the diagram. We have follow up diagram to understand this client based communication or client server based communication. Now, again, I told you earlier that NetConf is a protocol. So the encoding method may be XML, may be JSON, correct? The transport, uh, the communication method may be SSH. So here you can see that SSH is the transport protocol for the client server model. So these things will be there. The good thing we have with NetConf is the flexibility and feature and wide usability, correct? So here you can see the protocol stack with the NetConf and clearly we can see that the protocol, the message, the RPC and RPC reply, the layers and the example. Now already we have discussed that we have get, we have four method. So in general say get, put, post and delete. So these methods we have and apart from that, there are other methods as well, but these are the widely used methods inside the REST API or REST 
full protocol now here one by one you can see that we have explanation about the protocol so what protocol it is using the list of the protocol is SSH version 2, SOAP, TLS, what messages we have, although we have list of messages, few of the messages are listed here like RPC, RPC reply, the operations, what operations and how they are going to do the operation, we'll see that. So this client and server communication is going to happen over the SSH. Let me quickly show you that. Let me quickly log into the device and show you that how it look like so here you can see that I logged into my lab and uh, this is my automation tool and this is the CSR device in the CSR device what I have done that actually I generated the crypto key and we know how we can generate that uh, you need to give the host name and the domain name and then I have given SSH version 2 here and then I have enabled two feature say netconf and netconfyang that's it after that you will get the syslog message that your netconf is ready to run you can go and connect like this now again i have set the username and password as a cisco cisco but you can give any strong password now i try to communicate to the csr device with SSH, obviously the underlying protocol is SSH. And now if I click enter, you can see the capabilities that we have, uh, all the capabilities related to uh, the netconf embedded inside CSR. We have the long list of the features. So we have the uh, data collection, we have the uh, DART3 OAM, EIGRP, enhanced mempool, entity, uh, you can see a long list of features that is there inside the netconf correct so this way you can go and communicate again we'll discuss more and more about this communication in upcoming slides how it, uh, exactly it is communicating now what methods we have uh, in the operation so get get config edit delete copy lock unlock close session kill session Okay, as name suggests that kill means kill the session, close means close the session, lock, unlock. Uh, it's a widely used thing that you can go and lock uh, the operation or you can lock the configuration for some period of time, etc. Then delete, edit, copy, and these are the normal operations that we are doing. Now again, you can see the transaction method we have running a startup and candidate. Candidate means until unless you can go and do the commit confirm, it will not push to the device. It will be there stored as a intermediate configuration. Correct? Now how the communication is happening here, you can see that the client server model, client will try. So my network automation is my client. He try to send a port number 830 with SSH uh, a transport protocol to do the communication with the server. Now what is happening behind the scenes? So here you can see the steps that I want to do the communication for that. I just wanted to connect to the server. I will send my request and then server will send the response. Here you can see the SSH, how we are, I have done the SSH to the device. Now once I send my request, I'll get the response with the capabilities, correct? And we have long list of capabilities. Uh, once you log in, you, you can see these, these are the capabilities. Some of them are listed here, but we have seen we have long list of capabilities. Now the client respond for the supported capabilities. That means I want to run uh, some capabilities, maybe EIGRP, maybe OSPF. So now you can see the transaction is happening between the client and server model. So client is sending the query and server is responding so first of all server is responding that yeah these are my capabilities what you are looking for then client is sending okay i'm looking for eigrp or ospf and for that i can send my operational code uh, whatever code i have like get put post delete etc but in netconf we have different like get edit lock unlock etc and then finally you can go and 
do the configuration suppose if you want to do the configuration for any of the interface shut no shut or any ip operations uh, ip related commands you can go and do so now you're sending the request for the configuration for the operation to the server and then the server finally sending the response to the client okay and this will be the uh, summary slide we have so you can think this as a step one two three four and five and how the client server model underlying protocol is ssh is doing the capability exchange actually the server they have to do the configuration as per your operational request you means the client and then it will do the response okay all right so this way we can go and do the configuration for the netcon let's stop here next protocol we have rest conf now suppose if we understand netconf and if we know https then rest conf is mix of both now again just to revise the things if we go and check what is the protocol so protocol is netconf what's the data model we are going to use as yang now what's the transport so transport we may have different in this case we have https but we may have tls ssh http2 https etc what's the encoding method we have xml json now if we go and draw the stack so here in the bottom you have say data model and then you have transport now this transport may be ssh may be https may be tls then you have the encoding method so encoding is nothing but your xml your json and then we have the protocol now the protocol we are talking at this point of time is rest conf and it is mixture of https and netconf so here you can see in the diagram netconf yang plus HTTPS become rest conf. Now, whatever we have a study that is true at this point of time. Now, if we go and compare the rest conf and net conf, then we'll see that same thing that we are doing with the net conf, same thing we are doing with the rest conf. Uh, name is different, some syntax will be different, obviously. What methods we have? So here you can see the list of method. We have methods. That means that will be very much that we are doing with the web browsing so we have get post put patch delete now get means like running show command in cisco devices post means we are creating new object put means you are updating the object patch means you are merging delete means obviously deleting the object everything with respect to object oriented programming and then we are doing various operations now let me quickly show you the difference so i have the difference in between the operations of netconf and the restconf clearly you can see that get is get config post is edit the operation is create then operation is create replace merge and delete very much similar and line to line we can understand that both are in parallel now it depends upon which particular platform is using what type of protocol so for example if i go and take the example of sd van i can go and log into the v manage that is my management plane and then i can uh, open my api talk here you can see in the example that get methods related to csr rest conf api configuration native so what this api will do like that i'll show you the quick example related to the v management api how we manage api how you can retrieve the data how you can read that data how you can run it and you can get the output correct so what method that we can go and build with our rest conf the tools so we have python tool we have postman we have firefox rest client these are the tools we have but you will see that most of the management plane they have the inbuilt integration with some of the api uh, tools and from there also you can go and run with help of your web browser 
so let me quickly go to my we manage uh, via the web browser and I'll show you that how you can execute certain APIs all right so here you can see I have my vManage and I can go back I can go and do API docs so I can reach to the API inside this API doc I am very much interested to build and run one of the API related to monitoring related to interface monitoring so I can go here and search say real-time monitoring and enter face start now here you can see that you have the monitoring and if I can get check any other real-time monitoring interface get the device and if I scroll down you can see the model schema and um, we should put the device name or device ID and then here you, the, you have the method so 200 means success 400 bad request 403 forbidden 500 they are the few quotes now here I have the query API so I can use this query data service API and I can paste here in the web browser although here you can see the response is 200 here that is successful and then you can see the headers and you can see the data value let me quickly run here in the web browser and once I run here you can see uh, the output the nice thing about this I can go to the header and then I am looking for certain interface and the status of that so I can go and filter with if here you can see clearly that the interfaces gig 0 slash 1 with respect to this device is up 0 1 is up 0 2 is up like that you can go and filter if you go and check the name so you have various things like this is DC 1 and this is the interface this is the device IP but apart from that you have so many good information if you're looking for uh, RX and TX packet you can go and check the TX you can go and check the RX and likewise okay so you can see how easy it is to run and get the output and because we are doing the API call so this is very much machine to machine interaction we are executing the API and then we are getting the result now we reach to section 3 where we have to learn understand about network device programmability and this section is actually big one where we have to go and do the automation we have series of labs where we can understand the use of netmico uh, we are going to use the nc client and then we are going to do the configuration of ios xa devices then i'll show you the nice example in section 3.3 .3, where with help of uh, python uh, we will do and call the restful api rest conf api and we can see the few of the get uh, labs related to st -WAN. then use the ansible to do the configuration of ios xe check the subscription model the publication and then some of the plug and play options okay so this section is going to be uh, good informative and little bit bigger but we are going to get good amount of information and knowledge in this particular section that is section three after this recording we have nine videos just to understand the lab related to netmico now what is netmico netmico is nothing but a type of library or it's a program you can think it's a program to do the sss to the devices to the multi vendor devices and then we can send the instruction or send the commands as well now in the lab section you will understand more and more about the netmico here you can see the list of supported devices not only cisco but other vendors are also supported with netmico again uh, before netmico you may have n number of vendors and the devices and once you apply netmico in proper manner then you can arrange and regularize your uh, infrastructure. 
it's very easy to install we can go and use the pip in our case we have pip3 that you will see in the lab section pip3 install netmiko and netmiko will be up and running to get the instruction now i have given here the good amount of reference and links from where you can go and learn more get more knowledge about netmiko and the python and the automation tool here you can see if you go to the github you can go and check this particular link where you will get good amount of uh, configurations as well again uh, if you want to host your devices and you want to do the labs uh, over cloud so that option is also there you can go and check the labs means you can deploy the devices over the lab and you can do the uh, practice the best way that i am using is you use the gns and if you have the proper images you can play around with the images like ios xc stevan devices or any other type of devices to whom you want to do the automation for we are very much uh, uh, restricted or we are very much working with cisco specific devices but if you are in a multi vendor environment you can go and check the libraries for these operating system as well now few of the operating systems so for example palo alto aruba juniper these are actually very popular and most of the companies they have their they are using these devices as well so while you are doing the automation you can uh, write the code the script for these devices as well as i already told you that we have nine follow up videos after this video so watch all those videos and you will get uh, you will gain good amount of knowledge working knowledge uh, related to netmiko all right so let's stop here we'll learn that how we can go and build the lab over gns so here you can see that what are the steps we have first of all we should have all the required gns software up and running so for that uh, step is to go to this link here you can see gns.com software download you can create the account you can download the software to software gns3 and then vm for gns3 these two software you can install uh, you can download and then obviously you'll install now once we have this software then we can go and we should have hypervisor so choice of hypervisor is virtualbox vmware workstation vmware player esxi etc now this virtualbox and uh, vmware player these are the free software uh, although uh, vmware is recommending that you use vmware workstation uh, if you want to use workstation then you have to go to vmware site and you have to purchase the license otherwise you can go and use virtualbox in our lab we are using virtualbox so i'm going to use virtualbox so now we have three software we have software related to gns gns vm and virtualbox once we have all these software then we can go and install the virtualbox then you can go and install the gns3 as well then you can go and import the vm for gns3 inside the virtual box and then you can create your own lab and topology correct so these are the steps although these are easy and straightforward so for example i have this virtual box installed so what i'll do i will go and install gns here you can see that i'm using version 225 and later you will see that i will go and use 227 as well uh, at this time of recording we have 228 as well available but i found that this 225 is much more stable than the other versions so i am going with 225 okay so here you can see that uh, it is asking that you have this microsoft library or not if you don't have then it will go and do that uh, installation once it will do it will go and it will go and install this wincap we know that wincap is there to do the packet captures and all so it will do that what basically we need to do 
that uh, we should just follow next 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 step and suppose if uh, any of the software that my internet is not downloading so for example Wireshark so it's okay I can leave it uh, I can go without uh, Wireshark and I can complete my installation so now you can see that it is going on and next now would you like to get your solar wind tool set this is free yes and now it is redirecting towards the solar wind page uh, where you can go and check the other features as well all right so now here you can see that gns is installed and uh, again gns3 is redirecting us to this particular page uh, where if you want you can go to the downloads and you can check all the softwares here you can see 228 is the latest one so you have the software and then you have the download vm for gns3 all these things you can download all right so once we have this installation then what we can do that we can go here you can see that it is asking me to uh, follow the steps one by one at the moment i should go back so let me go back here and i should start this as well so i have this option of open with virtual box manager is there but this installation of virtual box manager is also very easy you can go and do a step by a step you can follow all the steps all right so ram requirement 2 uh, gb and rest of the a virtual uh, say virtual ram and virtual storage virtual cpu etc everything is virtual here at this point of time so we can go and import this while importing this you'll find that it may throw you error for two or maybe three times so just ignore the error if it is coming and then you can see that this is here now you can click here and then you can click a start so that means my uh, GNS v, GNS3 VM will getting a started now again you can see that here it is telling that uh, you have you don't have any uh, V box that is the virtual box network adapter one so if you want you can go and change the setting or if you close this also it's okay so let me see if i can close this so it is not letting me close no problem we'll go to change network settings what is the recommendation actually that you should have two adapter one adapter for host only adapter and here you can see that virtual box host only ethernet adapter and the second adapter should be nat that's the minimum requirement we have so we can click ok now here you can see that uh, it is a starting this server is starting once this server will get started you will find that it will take one ip address as well and that ip address actually we are going to use inside our gns server machine as well so give him some time to start meanwhile we'll go to gns3 do not show me this again here you can see uh, run application in a virtual machine then run application on my local computer and the server in our case that is virtual machine that is running behind here you can see in the back so do not show this again and okay so here you can see that you have the virtual box if you go and click ok if you want to see the ip you can scroll down you can go to the shell and then you can go and use if config and you can see that you have certain interfaces and the ip addresses are assigned via the dhcp so at this moment it's okay we'll go back to our gns3 and inside dns3 let me minimize this first
all right so i am minimizing it and we can see that it is stuck in here so all right so now you can see the setup that we have i can go and click next and the gns3 server has been successfully added now there is some issue there is no problem on that because it's still our server behind the scene is working and uh, at this page i should go and check box this virtual box inside that i have gns3 vm uh, one virtual cpu and ram I can go next and then this is the setting now it is try to contact the uh, virtual box server that we have in the back so we can wait and initially in first time installation uh, it will take some time but uh, we should follow the steps and if we follow the steps this will get installed so now it is communicating with the server the uh, genus 3 vm server we can wait so here you can observe that is still uh, this is trying to communicate with the server uh, the good practice at this point of time is that once you install this software that's gns3 you should go and reboot your laptop and then you should start the task to do the communication from the virtual box to your gns3 okay so what i'm going to do here that i'm going to reboot it and then again uh, i will go and show you uh, next of the next things that you should go and check if you go and check all those things then it will be very easy to work on and uh, then uh, we'll go and create our test lab uh, where we are going to learn about the linux and python and the network automation scripts so those things i'll cover let's continue where we left off so here you can see that we have the gns3 installed we can go and click next and then it will go and try to contact with the local virtual box that we have uh, this installation although i'm doing over one of the uh, virtual machine that is hosted locally so now you can see that uh, we are getting some of the successful message and some of the error message no problem i can go here and check this as a uh, virtual box that we should do we can wait and here you can see that uh, the windows 7 cpu and ram you can see uh, but in gns3 it's not a started it's still it has some issue so what you can do in this at this point let me show you this so what you can do here is that you can go to edit and then you can go to preferences in preferences you can go and check the setting so here you can see the settings uh, let me show you all these things uh, general setting should be looking like this then binary image then console etc the main important one is the server you should have enable local server checked and then your host binding should be local host now this remote server will come automatically we'll see that how if not then we can go and add the entry manually then we can go here and check the uh, gns3 vm is the virtual box and vm is this that's also 100 percent correct we can go and click ok see still you can see that the server is not started it should be a starting and then you can go here to various templates we'll see that how we can go and use the template but if you have the templates you can go to these templates and then first of all you should go to the file and create one project so i'll give this a name as a test and then it you will get your 
uh, workspace where you can go simply and drag drop few of these switches you will see that that is there by default with gns that is the gns switches and then you have to go and create the templates or you have to import other of the networking devices as such now for all those devices your gns3 should be up and running okay and that's not the case we have at this point of time so we should make this up and ready okay so let me open the virtual box and let me start this gns3 vm and let's see that is it getting the ip because that ip should be here inside the gns3 when we are going to edit and preferences and it should go and contact the server and this gns3 vm okay and inside server you should have a remote server with an ip so here you can see that it is a starting and we'll give this virtual box a little bit of time the username and password for this is gns3 and gns3 fail to connect with the change logs ubuntu so there is some problem and here you can see that uh, it is not getting any ip address so what i'm going to show do here that i'll show you the same setting and setup in my local system so let me open the gns3 in my local system here and in this i'm going to do the lab so whatever steps that we have done so far the same steps are applicable then i should go and create new project so you can see it is contacting the local server and it is prompting for any of the project name say for example test 10 okay at the moment i have done test 10 and at the moment i clicked you can see in the bottom that the virtual box get started now once virtual box will get started and if you see it will get one ip address then next i'll show you that what type of network setting we have at this point of time so meanwhile it is coming up i can go here see it is popping up so let's see that what ip it will get and then i will go and show you the setting rest of the setting so 192.168.56.105 now if you go to edit and preferences see same setting as it is then you can go to the server a remote server it's okay it's blank so it's no problem with that because anyways we are running our services with the local server but still if i want i can go and add 105 here and then gns3 okay i can apply and i can click okay let's see the remaining uh, setup so again you can see the virtual box the gns3 vm and this all the things are okay now i want to create the project so for that project i need to create the template here you can see that i have this network automation already ubuntu docker already but how you can do it you can create new template and once you create that you can go scroll down you can go next you'll get list of firewalls so here you can see this many firewalls then you can go and get the list of guests like triple a centos etc then you can go get the list of routers and the switches so so many devices are supported inside gns3 now inside guest even you can go over and on the top in the filter and you can search so this is the network automation i want to install because i already installed so what you have to do simply select that go next and click finish because i already have so i'm not clicking finish here but once you finish then you will get this likewise you can go to the ubuntu docker and you can put it correct uh, 
say for example what about routers and switches say here you can see that i have one viral cisco viral virtual internet router lab this cisco viral actually i purchased i paid 199 dollar for one year of license for router switches and there are so many other devices as well uh, let me show you this so here you can see that uh, I, uh, I have CSR, then I have this L2 switch image, even if I go to RL image, these images I have because I purchased the license. And if you want to import this, so what will be the process? I already imported one of the router, but if I want to import a switch, I can go and click to the switch, new template, and then we should go next, next. So I can go to the next and then I want to install one of the switch. So I want to install say uh, Cisco iOS. You can see iOS VL2 that is Kimu. And even you have the Nexus, Nexus 9K as well and rest of the switches. So I want to install this. Then it will go and tell that install this over GNS3 VM because that's my local server. I can go click next. Uh, I can go click next. Now the license part will come into the picture. So it is telling that you should import this. This is the missing thing. So now if you go and click import, so download means it will redirect you towards that link. Import means that uh, it will tell you that you can go there and you can take that link so I have that viral folder let me quickly go to the viral folder and let me open that so I have my viral folder let me open the viral folder and share with you so where is my viral folder So here, here it is, so this is URL image and I want to L2 this. Click there and it is importing. You can see now it is green. Simply click select and next. Yes, finish this task. Okay, now it is created. So means if I go to the switch, here you can see that I have this Cisco iOS L2 15.2.1 that I can use it in our lab. So let's build the lab. How we can build the lab is, uh, for the lab, obviously you need multiple devices, router and switches. So what I can do, that I can use the GNS switch and then this. So this is the switch I have then i can go let me decrease the font size a little bit and then I'll, i can increase so then i need the public ip over the automation server so i can go and use this nat cloud for that then i should have the automation engine that i want to use in the upcoming python lab and we are going to do a lot many scripting with help of the automation engine now once you put automation engine it will take some time uh, for first time so you don't think uh, you do not think that anything is wrong but yeah it will take some time and it depends upon what a router or sorry what uh, laptop configuration you have so for example in my case i have only 8 gb ram in this and a laptop so it will take some time depending upon your cpu and ram now i have these three things what i want to do here is that i want to add one of the switch as well so i can go and add one switch then i want to connect with the corporate network that is outside connected with my laptop so i can go and use it this can be my external network so maybe cloud network or maybe external corporate network so for example external network all right 
So once you have this baseline set up and if you want to add the router as well, router after the switch, so you can go and use. So I am using one router, one switch from the viral and rest of the things from the GNS3. So now we should go and do, do the connection. This is my automation engine or automation tool from where I want to play around various things. One link I can connect to the switch and then it can go and connect to the router and then for the external network I can go and connect with the external network Ethernet interface. Now there are so many nice things we have in the GNS3. Suppose if you want to change the display or change the symbol you can go and always you have this option change symbol what you want you want classic you want uh, blue gray etc all sort of different type of uh, you can see uh, options are there grid and skull so many things are there correct multi-layer switch vm wi-fi uh, if you want to change gray then blue red even custom symbols are also there so let me go and quickly use any of the symbol here for my so for example cloud apply okay okay so it will look like that but you can go and change whatever symbols you want to change so now once i have all the devices i want to start them so I have this green button on top. I can go and click and you can see that all these devices are becoming green. Now I can go one by one and start the automation. Now for this particular network automation tool, you should go to edit config and we want to change the IP. We want that it should get the IP from the DHCP. So you can go and do this setting change. Once you do this setting change, you should save this. And I can start the console now. Once I start the console, you can see here that at the moment don't have the IP because uh, initially the DHCP was not enabled. So here you can see that you can do, go and do the right click to the devices and you can see it will become red means it will get a stop again you can go and start it now once you start it and once you do the console next time you will see that it will get the ip address and we need that ip address so we'll wait here because this will be the ip from the dhcp for the external network uh, basically for the net for the internet this is the netting interface we have let me quickly go and change the setting let me quickly increase the font size bit so we can see that so now it is telling that it is available and can we use it all right so now you can see that discovery has started and it got this ip correct now if you go and ping from here to the outside dns you can see you are reachable and now suppose from here if i want to log in to any of the device although i haven't configured any of the switch or the router such uh, i should go and configure uh, the switch in the same network let me quickly show you my internal gns network and then my uh, outside network as well so i can go here click console and my switch has been started i will go and change the setting as well for this also let me go and change this for all the devices uh, i will change the font size and then all right so this is the font size and uh, what is the interface we have interface is 
So let us complete the lab task. What we are going to do here, that we are building our GNS lab, where I want to show you the Telnet SSH and install. What happened in the last session that when I was starting my lab, at that time I took my switches, routers, and since I'm running only 8 GB of uh, uh, memory or RAM I have in my laptop, my system got crashed. Same may be the case with you also. So uh, if possible, use at least 16 GB RAM laptop or uh, if you have very good budget, you can go for 24 or 32 as well. All right, so uh, let's continue and let me quickly show you that how we can build the lab and whatever we are going to study uh, say up to Python at least we are going to use 8 GB RAM laptop only and Then if my personal laptop having issue, I will reduce the number of devices here, but I'll go and continue at the cloud devices because cloud is the third party That I'm connecting with so what I can do that over the cloud I can build my big topology and then I can go and telnet SSH from my automation tool and then I can play around. Correct. So I can build my viral topology over the cloud. If I have cloud resources, I have a cloud account I can create. You can also create in your cloud environment or maybe if you have any physical lab or home lab, the GNS you can go and connect with your home lab as well. And then you can easily use your 8 GB RAM laptop resource to connect to the devices and play around Rather than hosting all the devices in the GNS itself. We can go and do like that as well Correct, so let me start the engine and then Let me go and log into the two of the devices We know that one of the device is the automation tool and other device is the switch so while starting this automation tool I should go and do the config related to DHCP because I want that this device should go outside and then even it can be connected with the corporate or the cloud network as well so if you do this please go here and stop this and then when it comes red, go and start it. Now these are the process intensive process that uh, we are doing here. Once it got started, I can right click and then click console and then this will come. Now let me quickly go and change the setting and increase the font size to at least uh, 16 apply Now it is ready you will see that it will do the DHCP process and it will get one of the IP Once it will go and get the IP then I will go and configure the switch as well And in the switch also I will go and assign the interface and the IP address in the same IP range Correct so meanwhile here you can see that my switch is booting up and here you can see that the automation tool is also trying to get the IP so we can wait meanwhile I can go and configure my switch so here you can see that it got IP with this particular range I'll go and configure my switch we know that in our switch the interface is gigi 0 slash 0 so let's do it still it is coming up all right so here it is switch came back online say host name is switch and then I can go and do the line VTY configuration. Say login local. 
and then transport input all at the moment then I can go and do the enable password I should do create the username so let me go and do this user name Cisco privilege is 15 password is Cisco all right I should go and give the IP as well so let me go do that IP address is 192.168.122. Say for example, 10. 255.255.0. And it should be no switch port while giving the IP address because by default the interface may be layer 2. So now it took that to no shut. And we can do the ping to the 248 address that's the automation tool we have you can see the ping is successful from here also I can go and do the ping to 10 and yeah now next what I can do that I can do the toilet so let me try to do the toilet to this IP username cisco and password is cisco so let me type here and we are inside the switch we can go and check the users so user is cisco correct so that's the one thing second thing uh, how we can go and do the connection with the cloud so for the cloud the ip i have is so let me do the ssh with the username Cisco with the cloud hosted IP where I have at this point of time one of the uh, CentOS, CentOS uh, system so let me go there and yes let me type the password and I'm inside the CentOS I can go and check the OS release so here you can see the OS release of this server that is hosted outside let me make some space here so you cannot see two of the window otherwise it may be a little bit overlapping all right so here you can see that you have this product and then let me do exit here also you can go and check the OS release for the automation so one place you have Ubuntu 18.4 and we have one other Linux based server sent OS as well. All right, so this is the way that we can go and create the lab at least to get started. Here you can see I can go to internet, I can go to my local switch. Local switch I can connect routers and then I can create the topology. I can go to the external network as well. So before we go and start our Linux and Python labs and obviously the theory plus lab Let's go and complete the installation for the Python So already we know that how our lab look like So we have the automation engine and the outside where we have the sent OS Now what I want to do here in the automation engine. I want to go and do the installation for the Python so for that I can go here and check apt get update and before that you can go and check by default with this you can see that Python is already there and here you can see that 381 that's the default with this particular version but we can go and install few of the plugins related to Python so we can go and do the app get update and once it will get updated then I will go and do the installation for Python and then we'll do the installation for the plugins related to Python that is nothing but PIP or PIP then finally we'll go and put 
that uh, netmigo that is one of the best tool related to ssh and then you can send the commands from there in upcoming video you will learn more and more about netmigo and we have uh, various lab tasks related to netmigo in the python section so let me go and do the install for python as well and here you can see so because we have already 3.8.1 3.8.1 so it is telling that it is newly installed and no need to install again then i'll go and install python pip that is very important and once we'll do this installation then i'll go and install the netmigo so that means here also you can see it is updated so that means we are very much done with the lab setup and from next video onwards we are good to go so the strategy is that first of all we'll go and uh, do the study related to linux basic networking command although linux is a big topic but we are mainly focused that linux inside the uh, networking or for network engineers uh, what are the important information we should know related to linux okay so let's stop here and next section we'll start with the basics of linux so far in our example we went and we use telnet and then we have done various tasks but we know that telnet is not the recommended way to log into the devices in corporate network we need some more secure way to access the devices and execute the script for that reason ssh is the way and it's the standard de facto that we should use ssh to log into the devices and then uh, we can execute the commands now when we are talking about ssh we have a netmiko library we are using the netmiko library to do that before netmiko we have other option as well that was paramiko but uh, this was not that scalable and it's not that uh, great you can say so that's we that's the reason we have now netmiko so whatever shortcomings are there with paramiko that has been improved inside netmiko and here you can see that what are the important enhancement we have now the purpose of netmiko is to successfully establish the hs uh, ssh connection with the devices we can go and run the commands we'll see that we have few examples upcoming and simplify the execution of configurations now the important thing here is that that not only you can ssh to the cisco devices but you have a long list of supported platform so here you can see that we can ssh to these devices these has already tested and then we have limited testing for these devices listed here so the bottom line is this that we have access to the uh, devices and not only cisco but it's supported by multiple vendors now in the same link you will see that uh, you have one example as well even we are going to run one example as well and we'll see that how this program and the execution work but the thing is that you have to ssh to the device and that we have seen in the telnet sessions same way you can go and uh, send the command so something like you have socket open and then internally you are sending the commands and then you are getting the output like this okay so let's do the lab in the upcoming section and let's try to understand more about netmiko let us build our ssh configuration with help of netmiko and uh, let me go and log in here to the switch first so we have the switch here uh, let me go and start this switch number one and switch number two
so what will happen that first of all we should log in to the switch uh, via the SSH because if we do not log in then uh, obviously we can't send the uh, script now when we are talking about logging to the switch via SSH so in that case uh, we need to go and do SSH related configuration so first of all you should go to line with UI 024 and we know that we have the login local here and transport input your SSH should be there but anyways we are giving all that means we are covering SSH telnet means all type of remote login so that's first step then we should go and define the domain name say IP domain name for example I'll give cisco.com for the time being and we should create the crypto key so crypto key generate RSA modulus 1024 because in case of SSH uh, this crypto key that we are generating this public key should be um, authenticated or should be accepted from where we are going to do the SSH okay so what we have done that we have given the IP domain name we have given the crypto key now if I go here and do the same so let me in the meanwhile let me go and create the template for the SSH so when we are doing the SSH we should have IP domain name for example here I am taking cisco.com and then crypto key generate RSA and here you can see I can even copy this command and I can paste here and then we should have a line VTY configuration that is already there so here you can see the line VTY configuration and then we should have a username configured as well so let's wait when it will come back then I'll copy and paste now once we have all these configuration then what next I want to do is that I'll try that this device is uh, reachable from the automation tool or not and we know the IP is 192.168.122.2 so let's go to the automation engine and let me copy as well let's go here and try to SSH we know that the username is Cisco this is the password we are expect, uh, accepting the key and then password is Cisco and now you can see we are in the switch okay so same thing I will go and enable I think we need only these two lines because the rest of the configuration is there in switch number two so I'll go here to switch number two and we can go to the conf T we can generate that key and then I can go back here and from here this time we'll go and do the SSH 2.3 accept these keys and the Cisco and we are inside switch number two so first thing is done that our SSH is enabled to these two switches now next thing that we have to go and create the script so for that uh, let's take the help from the online document that we have and again you can see that uh, before even creating the script we should have net Miko installed in our system in our automation tool so let's do that I can go here and I can do say apt get install this is up to date once you do uh, you start with update seems update 
Okay, it's updating. And then we'll do the install for Python 3 because anyways, we are using Python 3. I'll give this some moment. It will update. And then I'll go and do the install for Python 3. And then finally, we'll go and do the install for netmigo so pip3 install netmigo so what we have done first of all that we have enabled the ssh to the switch we have verified that yes we are able to log into the switch from the automation tool then in the automation tool uh, we have done the updates and then we are installing the let me go because the next thing that we have to do is to create the configuration obviously so let's go to the place where we have the configuration so here you can see that uh, this is the configuration that we can take help from and we should edit as well so let's try to edit this template let me open one more file here. Yep, so we have this blank file. What we want here is to use this. So from let Miko import, and then we have the dictionary here inside that here you can see that uh, let me clean these stuffs so we have the device type then we have the host we have the username and the password now inside this host what i will do that i will use the ip so in our case, we have the IP address and we should use this properly. All right. So here you can see that we have the device type and then we have the IP. So I can go here and instead of host, I can give the IP because we are going to SSH with respect to IP address. The IP address is 192.168. Let me type here 122.2. This is the IP of the switch. Then the username and password, Cisco and Cisco. Now what we can do that we can put these username and password in the protected file, in the encrypted file, and then we can call it at this moment because we are building this script so we can go like this all right so let me go import connection handle and then we have the dictionary like this then let's go back and build more so these are the step one and two we should do then we have the net connect we are going to do the connection and then we are calling the Cisco that's the dictionary so we'll go to the editor and next line should be this now we are uh, connecting the device once we do the connection to the device then what we can do now it's net connect to and uh, a net connect find from these are not required but yeah what we want after the connection that we want to run one of the command to verify so for example show IP interface brief and then we want to do the print as well so we can go here and put this line and then we want to print that was below that output so here you can see that we have the output here output is what show IP interface brief and then we are pr uh, printing this output now this program should run and it should give the result 
so what we'll do first of all we'll go and run this execute this program we'll go to our automation tool and say ssh fast py obviously we are, the method is let me go let me paste here so here you can see that the dictionary name is cisco calling this dictionary and then we are running show ip interface brief inside that so let's save this and uh, let me let's run this so python 3 and then ssh py line number nine has some issue with net connect okay um we should not have any issue here until unless we have done some mistake so let's see let's check the script one more time and here i can see that uh, if we go up okay because we are closing the dictionary here and if we go here we should not use this particular comma that we have here all right so we have the device type the ip the username and the password and then what we are doing that uh, we are using the net connect that should be also correct so we have this net connect and then we are doing the print all right so let's do one more time and let me save this and let us run this so print the output and let's do it all right it seems it is working and let's wait for the output and now here you can see that our ssh program is successful how we have built uh what corrections we have done although if i put one extra comma there so let's go back to the script it should not uh, raise any concern so let's go back here and put one extra comma here and we can go and run this program one more time just for our verification purpose so it is working execution is happening and if i can go here and if i do show users and if i can do show or debug ssh we don't have any uh, option related to, to debug ssh anyways so here you can see that there is no problem with that uh, comma but i should not give the space and then it is running properly so let's stop here and in next section we can add more configuration items in this now we have built our first ssh lab with help of netmiko let's go and add more commands on that so here we have the program and we are going to add some more commands here up to this point it's okay let's add few more line so what i want i want to add a one loop back and give ip address what we can do uh, we can go now because our session is there so we can go to config and commands once we are here then we can go and uh create uh, we, actually we can put the command say interface loop back uh say for example one and then 
we can go and give the IP address, say IP address 10.1.1.1. And then again, we can go and give the subnet mask. 255.255.255.255, it's okay. So what basically we are doing here that we are going to the interface loopback one and we are giving one IP address. Now this particular config command we should store in output and that output is under net connect. Send this config set and then config command and then obviously uh, we want to print it so we can go here and then we can do the print the output okay so here you can see it's a very straightforward lines that we are adding that config the command very much that we are doing in the cisco routers interface and then the ip address then the output so here uh, we are storing the output with help of net connect and then we are printing the output now next what we can do here that we can go and add a few more uh, vlan for that we have already the logic so for example for n or maybe you can give like like this so for vlan in range say 40 to 50 we haven't created vlan range from 40 to 50 or we can give comma say 40 to 50 so then we'll go and define this vlan so what we want that we want to print what we want to do here create vlan from 40 till 50 and then you can go and give the string now again the same thing we are going to do here uh, config commands and that's how this configuration look like so for that we have the vlan we know that vlan and then we are giving a space is the string starting from 40 and this n should be replaced with vlan correct we should not use n because this is the vlan we want to create it will go and refer this particular place all right and then we can continue this so we have the vlan vlan number and then we can go and give the name so for example should use name my vlan and then we should go and give the number number in in terms of vlan so this is the program that we have done with that and then we should just store the output and print the output so for that we can use output equal to net connect and then dot the same thing send config set and then we have the config commands that's it finally we can go and do the print output all right so you can see here that we have one basic lab where we want to do the connection we want to check the show and output then we want to create one of the loop back and then we can go and uh, uh, here you can see that we can create the vlan and the vlan name as well so let's copy this entire configuration and uh, we'll paste it again here you can see that uh, because i haven't 
close this here and then we have the spaces so it will go and throw the error related to a space so we should run this program like this and you can see that the editor it is clearly helping us and that's why you have the lines here okay so seems we are done with the program let's copy this and let's execute this copy first of all I'll go here and start this go back to the automation engine and this time i want to use nano say for example sss2 py we'll go and put here and we'll verify as well so we have the connection handler so okay the labels are correct maybe some places we have given some space that but that's okay we'll come back and if any mistakes are there we'll go and uh, improve it okay so for example here what comments we are giving uh, say print and inside print create the vlan uh, from 40 to 50 another output so let's save this first and then let's run this Python 3 and then SSH2 PY. All right, so program is executing. Let's see if we have any syntax error or something. And we don't have. Great. So now here you can see that loopback is created. And here we have some issue related to print is not defined so you can see that 80% uh, of the program is successful the first portion was correct the second portion was also correct it is throwing error when we have defined the print and why we know this thing so let's let me quickly show you this that the print statement that we have created here it is throwing error because we should use uh, the print statement here and here you have actually what happened that i haven't used the small keyword so that's the reason it was throwing an error but anyways it's okay let's quickly save this and run this one more time let's see so now you can see that uh, we are adding some more lines but still we are not using loop and some more conditions inside this that we should use so here you can see that vlan 40 uh, 41 42 so loop is going well let's see that when it get terminate uh, at that time it should not have any error okay it's going slowly no problem we can wait for next 30 seconds So here you can see now this is 47 and now we are in 48, 49 and the last one. Done. So our script is successful. Let us learn that how we can do the SSH to multiple switches and run the command so for that what we can do that we have already one running a script let's reuse that that's the power of scripting as well that we can go and reuse the code as well so what i will do here that 
we can go here and then we'll improve this particular script so here i'll go and add say for example switch one and likewise i'll go and add one more switch information here that is say for example switch number two whose ip is dot three so now i have two switch in the inventory or in the dictionary likewise we can go and add the list of n number of devices in our example we have two but uh, we are not restricted to two only now these two devices should be uh, coming under say for example all switches so let me go and use this say all switches and then uh, let me list out these switches so we have two switch and let me decrease the font size as well so what we want that we want to put switch one and switch two here in the store so i can give comma and i can put these two switches here now we have the configuration here you can see that uh, all switches switch one switch two should be switch number two the next what we can do that we can go and check the condition so what condition we have for the login because we have multiple devices now so we should go and give the loop condition and so for example i don't want these commands at this point of time so we'll go here and give the loop condition say for example for uh, devices or maybe switches so i'll go and you say for switches in all switches what we want to do that we want to do the net connect so i should go and use the net connect for the connection handle and i should use uh, asterisk, asterisk and then the switches okay so now this is the program format we have that we have the dictionary we are storing here inside all switches and then all switches we are referring with the switches for the connection now what we can do here that this vlan condition is correct this is already valid program we have so now we want to create a vlan from 90 to 80 to 90 uh, with all these switches and i can go and give 80 to 90 here rest all the conditions are okay so we don't have any problem now we can save this and before saving this let's confirm that the correction of the spellings are okay so this is the script what it will do first of all it will write the uh, vlan or it will create the vlan 80 to 90 to switch number one and then it will go and create to switch number two so let's copy this configuration this is script and then we'll go to the automation engine it should be ready to go we can go here and let me come out from here so i can come out from here and then this time say nano multiple switch ssh dot py i can go here and put that script now we can check as well so these conditions are okay this is okay this is all okay and then we have four and then in all switches net connect now the for loop here it should also come below the net and then we have the printer statement let's see this and rest all the things are okay so let's quickly save this and run this python 3 multiple ssh all switches is throwing four switches 
all switches so we'll go and check that where is that issue all switches is showing um problem here why because when we have the for condition uh, we should end this for condition with this and let's try to run one more time now we have issue here in the section of vlan so like that we can go one by one and we can improve it no problem so now when we are printing the config let's see that what issue we have so we have this vlan 80 to 90 and then a string uh vlan and let's see that what error we have create vlan okay so we'll go and see here that what's the issue we have this place we have problem so vlan in the range 80 to 90 and then we have this vlan that is showing a problem So what I can say check the here and I try to run this one time. So let's go here and run this program. All right, so uh, finally see this program. Uh, I have corrected the indentation. So if you go and check this, you'll find that the program is okay. Now we have the indentations in correct place and rest of the things are the, exactly the same. So let's go back and run this program. And let's see. So now this program, what it should do, that it should it should log into switch number one first, do the configuration, and then it should go to switch number two and do the configuration. So that means that now we are giving the option to the switches that multiple switches means the program will go and log in one by one to n number of switches in this case we have only two and then create the vlan so for example 80 to 90 so here you can see that uh, in one of the switch up to vlan 89 you can see the switch one as well is created now it should go to other switch and then it should create the vlan so now we can see switch number two and likewise after that program will get terminated all right so let's just stop here now we are getting the power of netmiko and ssh now suppose if we condition we have that we want to run the bulk command not like one or two commands but bulk command then how we can do it in python we have that option that we can store the configuration in some place and that configuration can be very big as well and then we can call that particular file or the uh, command set inside the program and then that program will run so that's the next thing we want to do here that what about if we have bulk of configuration bulk of command then how we can go and do the configuration now here let me show you that i have some configuration here say for example you can see that i want to configure the domain name name server then the interfaces as per our diagram so here you can see for example the link that is going towards the course switch is the uplink 
and then I have say for example downlink that is going to watch the L2 switch etc now we can use any of the logic there is no problem in that so here you can see that I want to configure 0 1 as a uplink with VLAN 80 with uh, switch port mode access then 0 0 that is going to watch switch 1 uh, with switch port mode access VLAN 81 and then I have a 0 2 at this point of time in this diagram 0 2 is not connected to anything but we can do the configuration and then we can go and set say storm control uh, the spanning tree BP regard etc finally if you want to define some default gateway we can go and define that gateway as well and then if you want to create some sort of ACL so ACL should be also get created so this is the configuration that I want to do from my bulk configuration from my Python so since we know the configuration uh, let's do it let me copy this and let's go back to the automation engine let me start my switches all right so here I am let me start that okay we'll go back to the automation engine and then here we'll create one file say for example device config and here I will put all the configuration so you can see that we have bulk configuration like this for all the switches in a network and again we, we can select who is the core switch who is the distribution switch who is the uh, access switch and which interfaces you want to put what type of configuration at this point of time we are very much okay with this global configuration and interface label configuration so it should not cause any issue all right so once we have this configuration here what we can do that uh, now we can go and check our script so what was our script we know that it is working fine the last one where we want to do some sort of edit so this is the configuration I will copy it and we'll go and create open new file just to edit this configuration in this configuration at least we have the dictionaries for switch one and two then we are calling the switches inside all switches and then we want to do the configuration now at this point of time what we want to do so once we have the dictionary then we want to open this because we want to put that configuration that we have so which file we want to open for that we have one file and the name of that file is nothing but device config so here I want to put the device config and this as if so we want to open device config uh, as if and then uh, what we want to do here that we go and give the lines so these lines are f dot read and then obviously we want to do the split so we have the split of lines and then we want to print the line so print the lines all right then we have all the switches function that's okay maybe we have n number of switches here once we have all the switches then what we want to do with these switches that obviously I don't want this configuration so let me delete this configuration from here and uh, at least let me delete up to here I need the printer statement so now what we want to do that all the switches the switches inside all the switches connect it and uh, give the output now here we can see that we want to connect and then we want the output say for example as net connect dot send the config 
and set the lines that's it and then we want to print the output so you can see that even the configuration is big first of all we have defined the dictionary and then we have the file we want to open that file we want to split the line with this split line function first of all we are reading the file we are splitting it we are printing the lines from here correct then once i have this input so i have that configuration now i want to put in a switch so first of all i will go and put to switch number one so for that we have these switches and inside this switch this switch will call switch one in that the output that we have so here you can see the lines so the lines that you have here inside line you have all the split line so inside output we are storing the line so lines is called inside output and then the output will get printed all right so let's quickly go and copy and run this we'll go here copy this program i'll go here and this i'll open nano this time say for example device config.py or maybe i can give device con.py i'll go and put this and here you can see that this print output should be aligned and uh, seems rest of the things are okay so we have for a statement we have the print statement here with the lines and all so let's save this and execute this python file python3 device con dot py and right away it is throwing an error that uh, all switches let's see because i'm not using the correct improved version so maybe it is throwing an error that uh, switches all switches switches and what error it is do we have any indentation error invalid syntax so it's unable to call the switches and seems all switches is correct and then switches so here you can see that i should give colon here and let's go back and correct that so i can do go here and we should go to all switches and where we have the f so i should go and here also uh, where i have the f and then i should go to the switches where i have the for statement so should go here and give the colon let's save it and let's run this so now we are running the program and you can see that it is quickly going and doing the configuration here you can see i can go here and here you can see that configuration is happening in this switch i can go and check to ssh and then we can go and check show run right away we are getting a lot many errors as well but yeah you can see the script is working fine and in the show run output here you can see the configurations in the bulk file you can see here that is happening here in the switch even you can see the vlan and all those things are getting configured okay 
Great, so now what we can do here, we can go and check show interface description. And now you can see this configuration is happening. I'll go to the switch number two and I will check here also. Show SSH and then we can check this. So here seems some issue. And yeah, there may be chance that when you're running this program, you will find that the buffer issue because of multiple factors we have in this uh, demo setup. You should have very good RAM and CPU where you are simulating this program. Uh, if not, then it can throw an error. But anyways, the program is correct. It is going and it is um, doing its work. All right, so here what we can do, uh, let's check that do we have SSH configured or not. So if I do the SSH with this device to this device, and we know that IP is 122.3, because already we have tested SSH is working here from the tool itself. Yep, so it is working. Okay, so sometimes you'll find that you have issue related to memory and buffer because you need, behind the scene, you need a good uh, CPU, RAM and core to uh, add more devices in the topology and run complex scenarios as well. In 3.2, we have to learn, understand about NC client that uses netconf. And I'm going to show you examples related to how you can go and configure the IOS XC devices. Before doing the lab, let's learn more about NC client. And let me show you the URL where it'll get most of the informations related to NC client. Now here you can see the link and this is ncclient.readthedocs.io. NC client is a Python library for netconf client. It aims to offer an intuitive API that sensibly maps the XML encoded nature of netconf of Python construct and making the network management script easier. So what this NC client will do, that it will go and support the operation and capability defined in this RFC, request pipelining, asynchronous RPC, uh, keeping XML out. We'll see that how we can uh, take XML as a input that we, uh, we are going to see in the lab. And then this is extensible, correct? Now, there are some other useful links as well. And one of the important link here is that developer.cisco.com. If you go to that particular link, you'll find a little bit history about NC client. So NC client, uh, you can see that integration of Python library to netconf clients, correct? Now, this in, uh, NC client was developed by Sikhar Bhushan and it is maintained by and these guys, if you want to reach out, if you have any specific question, you can check their Twitter handle as well. Docs are at this location and then PyP. Location here, uh, we can go and check these links. So if you go to PyPI, uh, PI, and here you can see that uh, how you can go and do the installation. Because I'm using pip3, so I can go and use pip3 install NC client. And uh, let me show you if I have my automation tool here and if it is running. So what I will do that in the next section, I'll show you the labs related to NC client to do the configuration to iOS XE devices. Let us do the lab related to NC client and obviously with respect to iOS XE. I want to show you my topology diagram as well before doing the lab. So here you can see the topology diagram is very straightforward. I have one iOS XA device connected with this switch in this common LAN network where I have my automation tool as well. Now what I want to do 
before doing anything i just wanted to do the pip3 install nc client correct now since i have already done the installation here you can see that already my nc client is installed then i have few codes that i put inside my csr folder and in this code i have few programs just for demo purpose so for example i want to run this program with respect to my device list that is there in device info so i can go and show you that device info in my inventory device inventory i have two iosxe although i'm going to use only one because in our uh, network we have only one device connected so here you can see that i have iosxe device where i am using port number 830 that is used for netconf ssh this is the ip and the username and the password now from device perspective what are the things you should do inside the csr device that we have so let me quickly show you that you should run the netconf that i have done I have enabled the netconf ssh and netconf yang i have enabled the ssh as well and then i have done the configuration for line vty where transport input is all and then finally the username so someone can connect to this device even you can go and do the testing as well before running the actual program just check the SSH connectivity is there or not in your CSR device. Now, once everything is there, I should check the reachability with the iOS XA device. And if it is working fine, then we can go and run our program. So here you can see I have one, two, three, four, five program. Uh, so number one is to check the capability, what type of netconf uh supported modules we have in the devices so what i can do first of all let me show you the code code is very easy and straightforward so what we are doing we are logging to the device uh, as per the device list uh, we know that the file is iosxe so we are logging to the device and then we are checking the capability okay now important thing here is that we should check the functions from where we are calling the or we are importing the uh, input in this particular program so we have the device info already in the same folder uh, we are importing the ios xe then we have a nc client from where we are importing the manager now this manager dot connect will connect to the device as m and this m here uh, will give the capability correct uh, let me show you this in the nano file as well so this is actually colorful and here you can understand more so with manager.connect as m and then uh, you can see that we can go and uh, write the capability because here you can see that for capability in m dot server capabilities we have the we are printing the capability so very easy and a straightforward program we have now if i go and run this so you can see that what output will get obviously we will get all the capabilities that we have related to netconf inside the devices inside that csr device correct good likewise we can go and check the other program the other program will go and give you the interface detail again let me show you the program as well just for the reference so here you can see that you are going to take the input from the filter iet of interface dot xml read that then we'll go and connect to the device where uh, the device is imported from ios xe obviously the device info and from there we are extracting ios xe one then we have the manager and then we have the xml to dictionary because we are using the xml so we need some dictionary uh, we need actually some library who can convert xml to this uh, dictionary format correct 
great so we'll do the connection and then uh, we have the net conf reply so here you can see that the program is quite structured and again we are using the uh, net conf protocol to get the results as well correct so let me go down and then it will go and print the output for the interface related output in this format so interface detail what's the name uh, the type the physical address the uh, unicast in and out packets great so let's run this program and then we have two dot two underscore int dot details as the program name so here you can see that the interface is gig one the mac address is this and you can see the packet input and packet output even the counters are increasing that means we are uh, taking the live counters from the interface so now if i go to the interface to this particular router we go to the router and here you can see whenever we are logged in we can see that the user connection is there now what i want i want to check the input and the output so here you can see that uh, we should have the packets input and output etc include input and the same thing we can go and verify from the output here okay so 4018 is the input packet and here also you will find some big counter so 4087 now its packet is increasing so that's why we have an increased number great so you can see that how easily we can go and add multiple things in our program now here it is showing only one but the list can be big simply we need to go there and add more and more interfaces and then we'll get more and more results correct then i have the third program as well that will give you the uh, interface stat again if i go and show you the program it's very straightforward where we are collecting the stats related to gig one the unicast packet and then again the, we have the uh, interface detail and we are collecting the output in this particular format so i can go and run this program as well and this program will again give you the interface stats of one of the interface again we are not restricted for one interface we can add more interfaces and then we'll get the result for more and more interfaces let's quickly go and run the last program that is config interface so this is actually interesting where you want to send the configuration and you want to do the configuration so before doing this before running this program i just wanted to show you the configuration what i want that one of the interface that is git 2 i want to send some configuration so configure by netconf say today and the ip is i can change the ip say 172 one one dot ten and then the subnet mask is okay then we configure the payload and it will go and uh, do the configuration with that particular device obviously which device that is imported from the device info ios xc1 and the interface is gig 2. now before doing this configuration we can go and verify that what is the configuration over interface gig2 and here you can see that gig2 having ip 10 to 55 to 55 to 55.1 because this is not physically connected so it is showing down that's okay let's go and do the uh, configuration via the python program so what i can do here i can go to python 3 and then 4 underscore config interface py now here you can see that 
it is connecting to the device you can see connected by netcom by vty and transaction is there and now if you go and see the ip interface brief still we can see the transaction is not successful seems because i can see this let me see that if i have saved that program yes it is saved and still i can see that the configuration is not completed so do we have any error let's see so we are sending the payload the ip address the net mask to that particular interface that interface is nothing but uh, gig 2 all right so it should do the configuration as per our result and i can't see this show ip interface brief is still it is showing the old configuration and okay so here you can see that the description is configured by netconf today the ip is this uh, let's see that inside the program so if i go inside the program you can see that the netconf template is from config ietf interface dot xml and let me show you that what is that so if you go here and if you check this config itf xml so here we have this format which is telling that uh, use this particular format for the execution but the value we here can see that is coming from this particular place now if any problem in this particular configuration it will not work i'll do one thing let me quickly change this to say for example one two three okay one two one two one two dot one two and let me run this program one more time so you can see one two one two one two one two and uh, seems okay so i can see that uh, the gig to my device is not able to change this configuration and you can check the configuration is still this is not there all right to make this program work i have done a small change here so if i go here and show the interface you can see that is 12 12 12 1 and then um, i can go to this interface default interface kick to and then i can go to the program where i have my program i will do certain change so instead of 12 12 12 i can give some other ip just for our verification and rest of the things are okay so i can give say 16 16 16 dot anything say 199 and then we can go and uh, execute this program now once you execute this program and if you go and check the output so we can check the output and here you can see it got configured so remember when value was there and interface was down then it was not able to uh, put those values means override those values but if we don't have any configuration it went there and it has done the execution all right so we have seen good amount of examples related to ios xc ncc client or nc client and netconf integration with python so we have checked the capabilities the interface detail the other interface detail and then finally we have configured the device as well now i have taken the example only for one interface 
or few of the stuffs that we have done but same is true that you can take n number of interfaces and you can push n number of configuration step as well so if we are able to do with few of interfaces few of the configuration you can do and you can have to add more and more configuration to run execute these programs and now we reach to 3.3 where we have to configure device using restconf api utilizing python method request library now what i have done that i have created two videos related to sdvan uh, api with python and you'll find that it's quite interesting and important as well that you can use the same trick that i have used you can use the same type of code that i have used uh, i have taken help from github and then you can do the automation you can do the uh, you can create the script for your organization as well that i have created now not only these programs these python programs you can create and uh, do the automation but these programs will help you to do the troubleshooting as well in the future so watch coming two videos and they those videos are actually very informative again with relates to do the automation or do the scripting with respect to uh, restconf api with respect to cisco sdvan solution in this important section i am going to show you the lab so let me show you that how you can perform the lab task integrating python with api all right so i uh, logged in or i shared my screen where i have the lab setup now here you can see that we have the network automation and this can easily be done with help of gns3 that already i have covered in my earlier videos right so let's go and do the lab what you can do here to perform the say for example stvan related rest api if you want to check the api doc first of all here you can go and check the api docs and then you will get quite huge number of api documents that we have inside the stvan like that you will uh, find the api doc for aci api doc for other products as well other sdn products as well now while it is opening up what i can do here is that i can go to the uh, link so here you can see that we have the zit hub uh, we're getting started sdvan apis are there in zit hub if you go and uh, open this url you will find that you have complete codes as well now in this code what i want that you can go and check this sdvan.py now if i go and open this here you can see on your screen although the font size is very small but you can go and have a look so we have complete script here and in this script uh, we have certain requirements as well so if you go here and check that how to use this script you'll find it you will find it that how you are going to use the script and then you can utilize it now i will show you that how you can go and build your lab so python integration with the uh, api so for that i have the lab topology like this and then i have my network automation here now before starting this let me go and show you the configuration that we have that i, I want to use and for that you can go and check the link here here you can uh, do the google search getting started with cisco stvan api and what i can do here that i can go and copy and paste this directly so let me start this so from here i am copying and pasting 
Now, please read it carefully. There are some requirements that we need to have. We need some sort of uh, pip installed packages or some other requirements. So there's one file called requirement.txt. You should go there and verify that. I'll go here and create my program, say abc.py. I'll paste that uh, control O enter and control x and if i want i can go and check this program so abc.py here you can see that you need to import these functions oops and there are so many things so let me again go back again i have to show you that abc.py okay so this is the program that you can go and refer once all right so now what we can do here is that uh, we can check the options that we have and before checking the option what it is telling that you go and set the environment variable so you have to set it now i can go and give my vmanage ip so i have my vmanage connected then i can go and give the port number as it is so you can go and give the port number my username is the same and the password is a bit different password is admin now once i have my username and password set now again i can go and check the help so you can go and verify the help this time it will tell you that what options you have now if i am looking for the network device list so i can go here and check the device list now the program will run and it will tell that what devices i have at the moment it is throwing an error it is telling the site id is not a key so i will go here and check my program why this site id is not working inside this sub function that is a device list and the api used with the url is the devices now i can go down here and i can check the header now when we are talking about this API before showing how to correct it, I'll go and use the same API function. So what it is telling that, that you can go here, let me make some space here. You can go here and you can use the API call devices so this is the api i am using and i can go and use the 8443 as well all right i'm getting some error that it is not uh, giving the value that i am looking for and Oops, you can see. So this is the correct API that is the data services, data service and device. Now, once you get this output here, you can see that you have the header information and then you have the data. Now this data that we have here, so here you can see that we have the header and I should not uh, use like this. So let me go out and come back so how you're going to pass this information is important because once we do for one of the function then we can easily do for other functions as well so i have the header informations like this and i am getting one error related to site id so at this moment i'll go and remove the site id somehow the program is not able to read the site id so I'll go and remove the site ID first. And the output here, you can see that 
what will happen the header and then the for loop will run so we have the output in the json format whatever things means whatever keywords that we are uh, uh, taking from here so these are the keywords and you can go and put these keywords there in the program in the same format they will go and print it and since we are using the table uh, tabulate that's the function table function so it will go and print in the nice table format okay so how many functions i have here one two three four five six means how many entries i want to print so six entries here and one two three four five six entries here as well this program is good i can come out and now i can run this so you will see now that we are getting the output in nice table format okay uh, now if you compare it so if i want to compare it this output this output is also good informative but first of all it's a bulk output and second thing is that uh, it is not in the table format or it is not in good format like this now this output you can go and you can open your notepad and you can save here like this okay and again if you want to filter something we can go and filter but yeah we are getting nice output here now again we can go back to the help and what other things we have that you can go and explore so now you can go and attach you can do the detach of devices uh, you can attach the devices you can have the template list that's the one thing the second thing here is that suppose if you want to improve the program so we have copied the program and i want to add one of my api correct so for that how we can do it again you have to edit and you have to do uh, manual work first so you have to create a program let me show you that how you can do it so device list and the function i have a starting from here so i will go and copy this in my notepad or maybe in my sublime so let me open that so i open my editor and let me go down table list for so up to here you can see that i can go and put now we should follow the indentation otherwise it will go and throw an error so this time instead of device list if you want to get some say control info control plane information and for that i have an api running here you can see that i want control connection information for this particular device correct now in the api instead of device what you can print so you can go and give that information so where i have my supply here you can see so the base url is up to here and if you go and check the api that we are calling so i can go and give this like this correct so we should use like this and seems that it is coming twice all right so this is the function the output actually i'm looking for now we have to go and change this table entry now just for the sake of simplicity i'll print only two but likewise you can go and print whatever you want correct so let me go and delete up to here say host name and the device type 
so what we'll do that we want to get the data for data let's take it a v device name is one and system ip so i'll go and print only these two things now in header you can give any name but let me use the same here and then you have the system ip so you want to print the next thing that will be the system ip i'll write to you but uh, the thing is that here in header we can give anything but in the item you should give exactly whatever the keyword i have here so i can go there and i can print it so now our program is ready i can go here and copy the program is control and dash info and let's go here and i want to add it I'll go and make some space I'll add here you should have the correct indentation otherwise it will never work so everything is the same line and that's why i am using the sublime so it will take this as it is now finally if i scroll down i need to add the function here so i can go here and add say cli add the command and what is that that is control info okay so now we are good i can save this i can come out and first of all we'll check the help function now if any problem is there in help it will go and tell oh this line you have this problem so here you can see the control is not defined that's the error it is throwing again we can go and check so why uh, this problem here you can see that click command and then the device list we started like this oops seems uh, that i haven't uh, pasted that output here i can't see okay never mind so we'll go back to the place and i can go and copy this i can paste here and let's see control info so that's the problem actually we have should use underscore because it was not taking this as a whole so let me quickly check that i should not do the duplication of the configuration so i have one control info here and that's it seems So here it's okay that you can go the underscore or the dash in between. It will take. Now let's check. So now again, uh, we have put the code and now we are checking. I can go back here and then we can put control info. And now that particular block will run. So now it is retrieving the information and here you can see that we have successfully converted the api into the python table format so it is telling you the device name your and the system name your all right so this is the way that we can go and perform the lab task in section 3.4 we have to learn understand that how we can use the skills of ansible to configure our ios xc devices now before doing the lab and understanding the concept let's go and do the revision or quick review of how this ANSI will work what are the important concepts inside the ansible at this point of time we know that we have ansible we have puppet and chef ansible is something 
uh, you can think as a agentless means you don't need agents to install to the remote server from where you want to take the configuration or from where you want to do the interaction ansible is open source agentless simple wide adoption it is used for configuration man management orchestration and deployment now the use for ansible is really huge and not only that ansible is supporting cisco devices but it is supporting n number of different vendors and devices how ansible interacting here you can see in the diagram that you have the user we have the ansible you can think that uh, ansible library that is termed as an ansible controller so inside the controller you have the ansible cfg file you can go and create inventory playbook modules correct now these modules are something that uh, there are so many inbuilt module and if you know the coding you can create your modules as well now via ssh obviously the username password we can push the configuration get the configuration and we can execute certain commands now all these labs again with respect to ios xe we are going to see in upcoming video using ansible what are the terms we have so the terms uh, that we need to learn are the playbook inventory the yaml Obviously, the data model is YAML, the Jinja 2, ad hoc commands, templates, etc. Now, when we go and do the lab, you'll find that we are going to run the Ansible playbook. And then, obviously, we have our file. The file we are going to uh, save or create as YML extension. And then, uh, as per our inventory, we are going to execute the playbooks. Correct. So you will see in the lab and that uh, all these things will be very much clarified in the lab in upcoming lab You will understand more and more So here you can see that you have the ansible.cfg file. This also I will show you That how this cfg look like when we'll do the lab uh, It it is there in the hc slash ansible uh, slash uh, ansible dot configuration where you have the configuration related default setting and if you want to do certain change you can do that change but you should know that what changes uh, you want to do likewise we are going to create our own inventory as well so inventory of devices where i may have routers switches and then certain variables related to routers and switches so this also you will see in the lab section we have so many inbuilt modules and we can write our own modules as well Correct so here you can see the number of modules and increasing with release so 2.4 has something 465 2.7 has 671 so these modules are getting increased Now if you want to Simply execute the command we have this ad hoc commands as well that we can go and run but what we are going to do is we are going to run the playbook okay then we have the concept of playbook uh, this is actually important because the playbook that we are going to execute they have the uh, yaml extension and we'll see we have so many examples to understand so we'll go and check the contents of the playbook and once you run it you'll find the playbook uh, has this uh, has certain areas and then you have the task defined inside the playbook it will run and it will give you the output we have jinja 2 template as well now this jinja 2 template further enhance the modeling capability including native um, conflictlets jinja 2 templates have access to the ansible variables and implement many filters and test that's the key actually so we have the variable inside the ansible and to simplify the variables and call we are using zinja 2 template okay and again you can see the example here you have in the right hand side all right so these are the basics related to ansible and this slide you can think as a summary slide so when you have the ansible program you can see that you have the ansible you can define the host obviously you have the 
ansible.cfg file and then you can create your task inside the uh, playbook so you want to check the ios interface configuration a number of yaml file or configurations i have that i can go and do it we'll see in the upcoming session so how i break this uh, ansible 3.4 section is that first of all there is one video that upcoming video where you will learn that how you can install these inside the sent os so i will go to the ansible main website there you can go and check the process to install it over various operating system for example you will see over sent os and in next recording i'll show you the actual 3.4 lab where i will run these playbooks with respect to ios xc inside the gns3 okay so since both of the videos are informative first one is that uh, you can go and check other aspect as well other operating system as well uh, so you can go and install it you will learn some basics about how to install it and next obviously we'll go and do it in the ios xc device so go and watch two videos two upcoming lab videos the second one is very much re relevant to uh, section 3.4 you can go to the following link and you will get the instruction that how you can install the ansible so let me log in uh, to this particular site let me open this url and let's see how we can install no login required for this particular site means you don't need username and password simply you can go and uh, open the url once you open that you can see here that we have the installation guide inside that installation guide you can see that we can install it over various linux versions like red hat debian centos mac os etc it is very important to note that currently ansible can be run from any machine with python version 2.7 or 3.5 and higher installed windows isn't support for the control node so any linux machine who having the python version more than 2.7 or 3.5 they can run the ansible there is no problem and you can see here say step by step uh, you can go and check for different different linux flavors like fedora uh, red hat centos all these things you can see that how you can install it so i can go i can do sudo yum install ansible because in our uh, workstation in our lab we have centos the easiest way to install nowadays is to use the pip command so let me go down and show you that pip command as well you can see uh, preferred way ansible in the mac os is the pip command so we can use pip pip to install it if we are using mac os uh, most of the time people nowadays are using mac os so you can install that with the pip command no problem let me scroll down so you can see other important informations as well all right solaris and arc and slackware so all these options are there uh, just visit that particular url and then you can see all those things so since we are using the centos and already i have installed that uh, ansible so we can go and use that but anyways let me show you that how you can go and install over centos mostly nowadays people are using mac os so there also even if other flavors are there you can uh, fedora or other you can see the installation how you can install it so here i am inside the uh, centos you can see the release uh, centos linux version 7 centos fedora core like this and how you can install ansible although it is already installed here but we can use uh, install ansible okay this is the way that you can go and install it 
So while you are installing it, it's very important that you check the process and all. Uh, transaction check succeed, uh, running update. Now you can see that Python 2.7, uh, the Ansible version also we can go and check that is 2.4, uh, the latest one. And what are the other things we have here? We can see. So if I go up, it is installing the package. If I scroll down, you can see the Python packages, 2.4.1, and all the dependency and the requirements, done. So now what I can do here, I can go and check Ansible and say version. 2.4.2 we have the configuration file here, the configuration module, the location. You can see the user library Python 2.7 site package Ansible and related information we have. Even if you want to know more about this, you can always go to Ansible and help that you can go and check uh, whatever parameters we have related to Ansible and other stuffs. And finally, if you want to run, you can go and run Ansible playbook and you can see the version. I should give playbook and the version. All right, so we are running 2.4.0. How to install, it's very easy. You can go and refer the site. And once it is installed, then we can go and play around with this. This is the second lab video where we are going to do the Ansible lab with respect to iOS XE. So let's do it. Now before doing that, you should install the Ansible inside this operating system. This is the operating system. This is the Ubuntu operating system. And now if you want to check that, you can go and check the OS release. So here you can see that this is the Ubuntu one and uh, you should go and install the Ansible. So I can go and install the Ansible like this because I have already installed it. So it is showing that uh, it is installed. Now what about the lab? Here you can see the lab section. I have my automation where I have installed the Ansible and then I have on CSR device where I want to check the configuration. This CSR device that we have here, I can go and I can show you the interface IP brief. Here you can see that we have the IP address and uh, I should have reachability. So I should go and ping. That is also there. Great. So what I have done for this demo purpose, for this lab purpose, I created one folder called Ansible and inside that you can see that I have a certain program. So first of all, I want to show you my inventory. That's the host file. Now here you can see that the host file, I have switches, I have Cisco devices, Cisco variable. Now, I already enabled the SSH capability inside my CSR with the username admin and password admin. The device host name is CSR and the IP is this. Correct? So this is very much done. Now the first lab I want to show you is the how you can go and change the host name. Now here is the program. It's a very simple one. It will go and check the uh, host as a Cisco here you can see host as a Cisco where I have the CSR Gather the fact false the connection is local What you want I will go and change the host name from CSR1 to R1 new So how we can run this program we can go and run the Ansible playbook say Ansible playbook and what's the playbook name say change host name yml and then i can give 
the inventory that we have as host. So now here you can see that playbook is running and here you can see that play and then the task. What is the task? Change the host name. CSR. So it is changing the host name. This is OK. Change uh, equal to one. That means it is successful and it changed the name to one because change counter is one now because already the name has changed. So now the change is zero. Correct. Now if I go to the CSR and if I press enter enter you can see the name from CSR one it got changed to R one R new Correct. So that was the configuration and here we have taken just one small example related to Configuration, let me show you a few more examples So for example, if you want to gather the fact Then again, you can go and do the ansible so let me run the playbook facts and then I want to use host now you can run this program you will not see much information because this is executed and um, is done but suppose if you want to see more and more information so you can go and check the verbose output now I'm running the verbose output and you're seeing this output in this format where you have the output that is actually very difficult to read but uh, you can see the output here you can go and use two times v as well and three times v as well so in this case what we can do that we can go and check uh, what options we have related to checking the output so now when I have used a V three times then you can see that uh, the output we can read is very much that we can understand as well correct so here you can see that uh, the ansible facts the IPv4 address that's correct these are the IPv4 addresses and IPv6 we are not using then I can go scroll down you can see the other informations as well the file system info the ipv4 address to the gig one interface then i can scroll down and you can see the, the protocol line protocol then gig2 interface now we are getting the output in the uh, correct format okay now how you can check these help so you can go to ansible doc and then you can check the help function here you can see this help is actually a small uh, minus h now uh, you can see that you have multiple options here as well so here you can see that verbose like that you can go and verify if you are looking for the version of ansible you can go and check the version as well that is 2.9.10 and the uh, python version also you can see here all the locations also you can go and check okay so these are very important uh, aspects related to ansible that we are checking and verifying here and if i go back again so we have checked our lab related to change the host name and gather facts as well we have the host file as well then I have two more one is to see the version so let me show you the version command if you want to check the version again I can go and run the Ansible playbook version for hosts and uh, VVV correct so now you will get the output and uh, here you have this output this is simply telling show version in the device and then you have the output that we are getting in the show version output okay great stuff now finally I have one more program I want to show you that if you want to do certain configuration changes as well you can do it 
So for example, I have SNMP program that will go and run these things. I'll do small edit here so you can understand how you can do the edit as well. I can go here and I can go to this particular file that is snmp.yml and these commands that we are giving here as a ansible public and private i can go and give my public and my private let's save this and then we will run this program so this ansible playbook and then the snmp.yml we are giving host and enter so now what is happening that it will go and do the SNMP related configuration That is one time now if I go back to my CSI device and If I go and check show run section SNMP You can see that my public my private Correct So this is the way that you can go and execute the command you can see that we have done various operations so for example doing the configuration changing the host name uh, checking the version the facts etc so it's easy to use and this particular playbook uh, as per our host whatever list of host we have it will go and execute all the command to all the host uh, in in the parallel manner at the same time okay all right, so let's stop here. Now we reach to 3.5. Till 3.7, we have same type of concept that we need to understand. In 3.5, we have to understand the subscription for model driven telemetry. In this example, we have iOS XE, but that's true for iOS XR and other uh, products as well. The CLI, NetConf, RESTConf versions. Compare publication and subscription for telemetry model. What is periodic? What is on change? And finally that while we are using the telemetry while you, we are using the model driven programming Then how it is going to help us in the troubleshooting? Now all these topics are interrelated. So I have planned to cover it in same series of videos that we are going to follow up so let's start with the model driven telemetry inside ISXE. Now, before that, if you want to know about the history, that already we have the SNMP method to get the network related information, but it's still why we are preferring the model driven structured programming um, environment or programming related uh, option to get all those information. We'll see that in upcoming uh, slides. You'll understand what's the actual advantage we have with the model driven telemetry. Now, what is happening in case of SNMP? You can see that SNMP MIPS they are quite fixed, means uh, it's very difficult to write your own MIP because they are vendor locked, first of all. Second thing, that they are lacking security, they are lacking a scale. Uh, and again, they are not complete means they are not giving all the outputs that we are looking for Now when we are talking about SNMP pool, you can see here that the uh, polling method in SNMP is that you have several servers and then inside the uh, Box itself. We have SNMP MIB that is with the operating system and then whenever you are requiring you are uh, sending the request and then the a device uh, they are processing that and um, giving the response correct now you will find that some places if you have so many snmp servers configured for a given device and all the time device is busy sending all the uh, responses for all the requests so you may have a high cpu due to snmp and there's, there are chances that um, high congestion Say for example in high congestion network uh, Where you want to use your bandwidth for your data transfer not for Only for your management correct. So these these are the cases you have first of all you have restriction You are locked and second thing that Inefficient use of bandwidth as well 
Now again, the push versus pull method. That SNMP pull method is a bit traditional, and the telemetry is a push method that is very much fast. We'll see that the timer even improve drastically, where you have the telemetry timer is five seconds. Uh, SNMP that may go to 300 seconds or five minutes. So there is a huge difference in the timing. Now, why we want this new model? A speed and a scale. It's really fast. We'll see later on when we'll go and run the API. The result that we'll get from the API, it will be faster. If you want to do the same thing even with the CLI, it will take time. Because you are writing some command again, it will go to the processor, then it will send the request inside, and then the output will come. So it's actually fast, and a scale is there. It has quick fault isolation, open source appliances, uh, near real time data availability. Now, the summary of this is that we are moving to digital world where the Speed is very important first thing. Second thing, the data, the amount of data. So now you have to process the volume of data and that much volume of data, if you use the traditional method to uh, get the result or get the troubleshooting options or get the uh, device specific alerts, it is time consuming and it's not as scalable. Now for the digital environment, you need something which is capable enough, something which, which can understand um, machine to machine interaction rather than uh, any third uh, vendor in between that. And it should be very fast, automated, and uh, it should be very light actually in the operating system or uh, in the CPU. So while uh, sending n number of requests, still your load in the CPU should be less and you can send parallel requests as well. Okay, now here in the diagram, you can see that you have Grafana, you have Elastic, uh, you have Big Data, means you can connect. So you can take the input from the device and we'll see that later on. And then you can send for further processing, uh, further analytic, to these type of maybe cloud hosted or maybe in premises uh, analyzing tools. Now, if you want to use Elastic, Elastic, they are giving 14 days trial version. It's free, you don't need to give your credit card information. You can go and use Elastic. Inside that, again, you can get Kibana and there are so many other plugins that you can enable and check. All right, so what's the benefit we have with the model-driven programming? Uh, we can get either periodic or on-change uh, alerts or information. Uh, it is a structure uh, data because it is going to use model-driven Young model behind the scene. So it's a structure, it's a scalable and less load on CPU. Correct. Now we have the methods, say for example, SNMP, syslog, netflow. But you, if you go and compare, you'll find that they don't have any structured data model, first of all. And they are not capable that the young models are. Within young model, you can do each and everything. There's no restriction. Now again, this model, model driven programming here you can see, and this is actually very important. Uh, slide that we have and uh, let's learn more in this slide. So if we go and check this slide, we'll find that uh, model driven programming, you have your network devices in the bottom and then you have the programmable interface. You can think this as an API application programmable interface and then you have the telemetry engine. Now we are sending this to the collector. Later, we'll discuss more about the subscription and the collector. Now this collector, you can send this over the Elastic, over Grafana, Kibana, Splunk, Gangula, etc. So there are so many good collectors where you can send your real-time information, real-time data. They can do the analysis and they can give you the nice graph as well. So for example, 
you can send the data to the key uh, elastic and then kibana you can go and check the graphs correct now again you can see that uh, while we are doing the model driven programming still we have option for snmp snmp uh, you can use it and slowly if you want to move from snmp to the latest elementary model you can move correct so here you can see that we have the open native operational young model net configure protocol and then you have the external plugin okay so far we have discussed that what's the advantage we have with the model driven programming it's actually advantageous and then we are going to plug in this data model so here you can see the data model with the netconf uh, one of the best example for netconf plus data model is the cisco sd1 so sd1 uses netconf behind the scene if you go and check the uh, programmable things you'll find that they are following the format so we have the format options so for example the encoding methodology is uh, json the protocol is netconf the transportation protocol is ssh correct now here you can see that how this program look like so we have this model driven programming or you can think that mdt is a model driven telemetry so you are importing some definitions from mdt again you are importing and then you have the organization content description etc uh, i will point you the link where you will get all the young data models uh, program that is combined in in a single place cisco is putting all those information publicly inside the github we can go and have a reference again you can just check the definition how this program look like so here the rpc we have and then if you go and read this you have the xmlns and then you have the netconf as a program then establish the subscription what is subscription will uh, learn in upcoming session event notification yang push so the structure is something that you have the model driven program then you may have uh, encoding you may have transport you may have protocol a protocol netconf then transport can be ssh or any other maybe tls the encoding is xml and json model is yang and there are so many not so many but there is a number that we can count for the young model cisco has their own structure or cisco can use their own structure or cisco can borrow from the standard one as well both options are there so what cisco has done in cisco aci that cisco hasn't used the uh, whatever standard is there so for example industry standard young model rather than cisco has used their own uh, model driven program in cisco aci okay so let me quickly go to the next slide so i can show you a few more now here you can see that you have young model data and then you have the xml payload somewhere you will find this uh, payload as a json here you can see the standard body we have open config itf itpl cisco again in cisco aci cisco has used their own data model but cisco can use open config itf itpl it's up to the vendors that what they want to use i told you that you can go and check the data models here so you can go to this github you can go and check the young model you can go and check the open config as well again uh, how within the box it is working so now with the new operating system in the cisco ios xe you'll find this yarn uh, young models are embedded that is their build but suppose if it is not there then you can go and uh, update or upload as well 
okay so best option is this that you upgrade the image and you will get uh, all these options inside the operating system if you want to learn understand more about the young hierarchy then you can go and use this software suitable for macbook uh, omnigraph now here you can see that you have the model event elementary operational data then the connection subscription stream sub connection receivers containers and like that this is again the structure and we need not to worry to memorize that what is the hierarchy and the structure what we should do that how we can go and enable the telemetry in my box then how i can send those information to the uh, to the engine or to the analytic engine so for example elastic or others where they can go and analyze my data so how we can enable the feature on your box and how you can send those data to the collector to do the further analysis that's the important thing that we should learn next important topic we have about the network subscription let's try to understand that how we can subscribe a service and obviously this particular section we have follow-up section with the lab so in the lab we'll understand more about the subscription and how with the push method the telemetry works so here you can see that the subscription is a contract between the subscription service and the subscriber so uh, the subscriber is there and the service is there correct uh, obviously we have the collector as well where we can go and analyze uh, everything we'll check this in the lab so we have one complete lab and i'll show you that how you can access the lab and how you can book the lab and perform the lab task in the cisco developer uh, site now again uh, we have the subscription and then the publication is there the important point here is and we have already uh covered this in the previous section that we have the young model uh, we have a structured data and that's the key i will discuss this in the last slide uh, for this particular session the encoding method we have either xml json and the push method that we have can be periodic can be on change let us understand more about this subscription methodology so here you can see that it can be periodic it can be on change and there is difference between periodic and on change in periodic we have regular cassettes uh, sends a complete object set every time it's periodically you are sending the uh, data on change something like whenever uh, the change is there whenever it is required then it will send the data so periodic you can see that certain time interval the data has been sent now either it's a periodic or on change we need to subscribe the model event telemetry so here you can see that we have the subscription and for subscription we should have the reply message as well so let's understand and one of the key point here and you will find this all the time is that xpath filter even whenever we have to do certain subscription whenever we are doing the push methodology we are using the xpath filter because xpath filter define the data object to which you want to subscribe again in the lab you will see that suppose if i want to subscribe high cpu or high memory and those type of information then i can use the xpath filter to push those information okay and again uh, with the xpath filter so first of all here you can see that you have xpath filter and then you have the period so period is in centiseconds between push update containing the subscribed information great uh, whenever you do the subscription obviously you will get the reply so switch reply with the notification and the subscription id here you can see n o t i f notification base okay and then the subscription id remember either this is periodic or on change both the cases obviously you have the subscription uh, subscription id 
you can go and verify the subscription as well we'll see that how you can verify from the cli again uh, in the xml format you can see that we can go and check the mdt subscription that can be verified now the second option we have is the on change subscription so whenever it is required either a state configuration or identifier we are getting the on change subscription in this example the xpath filter related to cdp ios and again the, with the dampening so cdp neighbor with xpath and dampening period you have the filter what you want to push means what information you need and then you are getting the notification and the subscription id for that great in the lab section we'll go and check this show telemetry ietf subscription all these results we are going to check in the lab section now again we have the option to delete the subscription as well because you don't want that information to push all the time so you want to delete that all right so let's see the key difference between the telemetry and the snmp and these differences are actually the benefit and this is actually huge so you will see all the points uh, seven to eight point we have one two three four five six seven eight points listed here and in these eight points it is clear that why we should prefer telemetry over snmp so here point number one device stream data based on specified frequency or upon a state change so we know that we have the periodic we have on change so it's not like snmp that all the time you are uh, pulling the information rather than uh, you have the push method that is lightweight to the processing uh, process and cycle why this is lightweight or why this is light on the device you'll see the reason as well so data is sent as soon as it is available reducing the need to buffer again in snmp we have certain buffer time uh, maybe uh, five minute or 600 second but here whenever data is available it is uh, it will be pushed no single large request for all data unlike snmp polling send incrementally that's again the key so you are not sending so for example all the uh, data that you can think like rip versus ospf rip is sending the entire data uh, entire routing table but link assist protocol they are sending the updates something like it's lightweight sending the incremental data rather than sending everything now ability to distribute the telemetry source okay subscription request that we have discussed earlier the again the key important point here is the well structured common format that is based on the young it is secure authenticated reliable channel Okay. so these are the important key features we have in the, the streaming telemetry and uh, we should encourage more to the streaming telemetry rather than the snmp now again in the lab section i'll show you that over github we have all these uh, young uh, models means if you can go and check the data models their coding etc asset management system monitoring feature monitoring everything is there published uh, as per the operating system as per the release you will find all these uh, young models in the you can see the below the github link if you are able to see that github young model young tree master vendor you can go and check that even I'll show you that as well in the upcoming lab, lab section. Again, if you want to learn more and more about Cisco, Cisco DevNet, uh, Cisco is providing the sandboxes and labs as well, even the videos, documents. Cisco is providing so many documents related to iOS XE. Because remember, the iOS XE is not only a tool for the routers. Now, WLC also uses iOS, iOS XE switches also using uses ios xe dna switches dna routers they are also using ios xe some of the iot device also have the ios xe so this ios ios xe is the key um, maybe in future you'll find that most of the infrastructure element they are using ios xe devices 
All right, so let's stop here and next section will perform the lab task. Welcome to the lab section. Now here you can see that I can go to the uh, devnet sandbox.cisco.com. Here you can see that we have the iOS uh, XRV 9000, the devnet box. That means we have the servers where we can perform the task and actually I'm looking for the CSR 1000V. Now the question here that how you can book this lab, how you can reach to this lab. So for that, now you can go and check developer.cisco learning modules. Just go there and search the learning lab for iOS XE, the same lab that you are able to see here, enabling telemetry on iOS XE. Then you get the lab. In this lab, we have six section. One is the summary. So enabling telemetry on iOS XE, status troubleshooting, TIG MDT Docker, Telegraph, uh, in flux TV. We'll discuss more in this in this uh, lab You can go here once you reach to this place you will see that uh, you have the prerequisite that Introduction of model driven telemetry already. We know that what is model driven telemetry and how it works But for the lab section if you go and click to this link this model driven, uh, driven telemetry sandbox you will reach to this place now, once you reach to this place, what, what you have to do that uh, at this place where you're seeing the activate, you will get a reserve option. So you go click here a reserve and after maybe five to 10 minutes, this will become activated. Now, activation means that you can go and use this lab. Now, once you have this get activated, then here you have this output. Once you click the output, then you will get the information for any connect. So here you can see the VPN information. What is the username? What is the password? So I need to go and connect to this VPN. Then I will be able to log into the devices and perform the lab task. Correct. So let me quickly go there and do the VPN connection. All right, so I'm connected with my VPN and then the device detail here you can see the username and the password. So what I can do here, I can go and connect with these username and the password. Say, let me go and create one folder, telemetry. And inside that I can go and connect with the username and the password. So what is the username that we have? Let's go back and check that. So one IP we have 10, 10, 20, 30, that time interested. And then 10, 10, 20 dot five zero. Great, so one is 10, 10, 20 dot three zero SSH username and password I can give. Let me check if I'm able to log in. Oops, here it is. Yep. So I'm connected with 10, 10, 20 or 30. And likewise, I want to connect with the server. That is 10, 10, 20 or 50. For that username and password is different. Let me type the password. And let me try to log in. All right. So We are almost there. Let me check the username and password for the devnet box that is 20.50 developer and Cisco 123C in a small. So one plus C is in cap, one plus that is in a small. All right. So now we are inside the CSR device and inside the server. 
correct let's follow the step that we have in the lab I'm, I'm going to follow the same steps that we have so we can go here once you logged in what you want to do that you can go and do the configuration related to telemetry so telemetry IET of subscription encoding and then this is important this is the X path filter where I want to check the CPU iOS XE operational CPU usage utilization five seconds correct likewise you can go and add multiple xpath filter so cpu memory and any any other type of xpath filter whatever information you will feed it here you will get to the publisher so whoever is the server where you are collecting the information you can get the information now there are different type of servers uh, in this we are using the cisco uh, lab server but in production you can check the elastic and inside elastic so once you go and check that elastic in elastic you have multiple options we have kafka as a messaging server but there are kibana where you can give the visual uh, diagram and all you should have the uh, database plug in so what is the front end back end? What is the messaging system? Everything should be connected and then you have the elastic But not only you will get the information about your telemetry But you can see that you have the n number of things that you can go and check over the elastic Okay, so have a look on elastic Kibana Kafka and others and How you can utilize this in your production? that also uh, you can debate with your management so now what I want to do here that I want to subscribe this here you can see that I'm going to publish this at this IP with these port numbers so let's do the configuration over the CSR device so I can go to my CSR device here and I can add those lines once we have those entries then we can go to the next page so telemetry status and the troubleshooting once you come to this page uh, again we can ssh to the device and do the configuration but we have these options these verification options show telemetry iat of subscription all subscription 101 subscription in detail so we can go and verify those if you want to delete the telemetry you have that option you can delete it as well so let's go and do the verification so we can go and check the telemetry and I, I ETF then the subscription so we have the subscription and 101 they know that subscription is 101 and detail so here you can see this is the server that is a where I am doing the publishing and you have the XPath filter you have the stream subscription ID all the details we are getting correct now if you have n number of subscription then you can go and check the brief as well rather than checking all the subscriptions but we have this option of all as well all right so once you go and verify the subscription then what you want to do next obviously we should go log into the server and we'll see that the subscription that we have from the subscriber what will be the outcome for that correct so next what we'll do that we'll go inside the server that's the docker container we have i have already logged in and inside that we can go and verify it so we can log into the server and once we are inside the server we can go and check the docker ps then if you want to go and log into the tiz mdt you can use the docker exec command uh, so i'll show you all these steps that is written here and then we can go and check the process as well inside that so we have telegraph we have influx tb we have grafana server okay where we want to go and verify all these uh, information that we are sending from the uh, CSR device or iOS XE device.
again we can go and check the uh, telegraph conf and inside telegraph conf we can uh, verify that the subscription is coming there or not so let's log into the uh, server that we actually already logged in and perform these commands so we are here and here i can go and check the docker so we have the bios start.sh that is running and then if i want to go inside the tag then i can go to docker and then exec that is tig and mdt we have inside bin and bash so here you can see that we log to the uh, TIG M MDT model driven telemetry. Once inside that, I can go and check the process. So we have the process that is running related to uh, Influx TB, related to Grafana and Telegraph. Now, next we can go and check the subscription that we have done from the switch to here correct so for that i can uh, use this command that is cat root telegraph telegraph dot conf so i can show you from here as well or even if you want you can use more cat um that is inside the root and telegraph telegraph dot conf so here you can see that the services that is coming from the Cisco MDT and the log file we can go and check from the inside the telegraph dot log. Just follow the steps that is given there in the Cisco developer page. Then we can go to the next where we have the telegraph log. We can go and check the telegraph log. Once you go and check that telegraph log, then finally we, we can go and check the influx TV. That's the database. And that will be the final thing that we want to do. Correct? So let's go here and check the telegraph log. And if you go and check the log, so here you will get the information about the 10.10.20.30, the subscription, about the high CPU. Now again, if you want to see this in the database, then again, you can go and log into the database and you can check that. So next I can go to influx. I can uh, check show database and all these commands I can go and actually run that. This command that you have in the bottom is some sort of uh, query inside the database and that will give you the time and the count of the CPU utilization. So let me scroll down. So we can go and check the database and all, but when we'll do the query, you will get the time and the count. Correct. So let's log in inside the database and let's check the uh, database and then we'll do the query as well. Correct. So we go to influx type control Z and then you can go to influx that's the database and we can check that that is here you can see this um, even the help page is also there which is telling that what is the correct command to run and the correct is show databases so I should use show data basis let me type here and then we can go and use the rest of the commands and the query so i want to copy the query as well i want to use the cisco mdt and then show measurements use cisco mdt and then show measurements Great. Once we complete up to that, then we have the final step to do. That's the query. 
so let me copy this as well show measurements and here you can see uh, we have cpu uses cpu utilization that we want to check here and then i can go and do the query so you have the query now at this point of time maybe you are thinking that why we are doing all these manual steps do we have any way that we can go and check the graphs and all so the answer is this yes we can use kibana and then you can go and check the elastic that i have already told you that's a cloud-based uh, reporting system where you can go and integrate with that kafka kibana and other servers uh, where you can have your collector in that you can have the visual representation of whatever we have seen in the cli now here the main goal is this that what configuration you are doing from the switch if you are doing this configuration in the collector how you can go and collect those information correct so now this collector is also not very straightforward that uh, in case of snmp you have snmp server and there you are getting all the information and graphs but you need some sort some sort of collector who should understand the uh, model driven telemetry who should understand the uh, who should have the database who should have the messaging system who should have the log server and if you need a visual representation then uh, that particular database log servers and messaging system should be integrated with the server where you can have the visualization okay so do search elastic and kibana and you will get good information about how we can do the visual representation of your telemetry uh, inputs now we reach to section 3.8 that is last in this particular section we have to learn understand about day zero provisioning methods ipxc pnp and ztp now after this video we have three follow-up video where we'll learn more about ZTP and PNP or ZTP and PNP. So let's understand about a day zero provisioning and IPXC. Now what we want, what company want is ZTD, zero touch deployment. Now for zero touch deployment, what are the methods we should follow? Again, after this video, you have three videos related to ZTP and PNP where we have lab also you can understand that without doing much on device how that device will come into the production that's the entire idea it means maybe in branches maybe in remote locations you don't have a skill engineers who can do the configuration or you don't want even so in those cases someone can plug the device with the ISP and poof the device will get the configuration the image it will up and running it will join the fabric that's the whole idea about the zero touch deployment or ztd uh, what we are doing at present before sdvan or before sgn solution is that uh, new device plugin software upgrade initial configuration you are uh, getting the device from the cisco or from the vendor then if it is not up to date, it means that if the image is not new, you are upgrading the image, then obviously you are putting the license file, the pack files, and all you are upgrading the license as well. Then you are doing the configuration, whatever standard configuration you have, you are putting that, and then it is going to the uh, operation, maintenance, and t shirt. So day zero, day one, and day n is defined like this so onboarding. Uh, service provisioning and the monitoring and analysis but what is happening now it is means in a modern era where we have the pnp ipxc ctp these uh, methods and these type of technology so in this what we are doing that order of magnitude quicker automation uh, device bring them so at a time you can deploy uh, n number of devices so just matter of uh, plugging the device in the network and that's it day one again the automation friendly flexible predictable model driven telemetry uh, secure bring up all those things will be there and again in in terms of monitoring and analytic so we have the push mechanism consistent machine uh, readable high performance real time 
that means we are moving towards the digital environment where we have to process bulk amount of data and if we want to connect our devices with big data or such type of analytic tools or such type of databases and analytics then uh, it should be fast so we can't use the traditional method it's not recommended or it's not supported as well nowadays that you can use the uh, traditional method to analyze the bulk amount of data rather than we can use the model driven telemetry so the analysis and the troubleshooting and the recommendation will happen uh, in phased manner or uh, step by step ZTP components what we have we have IPX and ZTP ZTP will, will go and learn more so now ZTP but this is ZTD zero touch deployment again inside zero touch deployment you have component like IPX ZTP and PNP correct so IPX let's focus on IPX because coming three uh, videos are related to ZTP and PNP in IPX also the device is getting the configuration either from the uh, various HTTP, HTTPS or TFTP server. It is resolving the DNS and DHCP as well. Now, how it is supported? So IPX is now open source boot firmware. And suppose if you know the Windows term or Microsoft term that uh, they come with the PIXI environment where you have centralized uh, PIXI servers from where all the uh, all the Windows server or at a time you can uh, upgrade or at a time you can spin actually n number of Windows server that's the concept so one place you have the image and that image you can think as a distributed image that can be published or that can be pushed to n number of Windows server that is in the pixie and then each and every servers at a time they will up and running so the deployment will be very faster automated with help of pixie that is again used inside the cisco environment with help of uh, network so how it is working pixie supports management interface ipv4 ipv6 fully backup uh, backward compatible with PIX, PXE and again this is IPXE. PXE with several enhancements, enhancement like boot from web server via HTTP, boot from local attached storage USB memory stick, control and boot process with a script and menus, DNS support. We have one flowchart starting. You want to obviously boot the system. So do you have a valid image? Yes, boot in started. Uh, do you have valid image in USB? Yes, then download and run the installer. Success, boot installed. No, then it will go to the Pixie management link because for Pixie we need management link. Download and run the installer successful and boot install the image. Correct. So this is the process by which the Pixie is working. Uh, next video onwards we'll learn more about the ZTP and PNP we have multiple ways to configure the device we have manual way and we have ZTP in VS and we have P PNP that is plug and play in the CS devices ZTP is nothing but zero touch provisioning so what is happening in this case that at the moment you go and uh, connect the device it will take the automatic configuration and the device will come up and it will be the part of the fabric that's the whole idea behind the ZTP means while you are doing the ZTP process that's the zero touch provisioning everything should be taken care by the web tele fabric device will come and take the IP take the configuration take the image and it will be operational okay so let me try to uh, explain this thing here uh, let me try to draw and what are the steps involved here although we have the uh, separate uh, diagram on the flow uh, from where we can easily understand so what is happening first of all you take the box so once you have the box so for example VH and there is a specification that which particular interface you should connect VH with the ISP. So suppose I connect gig E0 slash 2 to the VPN 0. 
Now, what are the steps? What is going to the, uh, happen? So this device is coming with default configuration. It has some default system configuration. It has some default VPN zero configuration. If you go and check VPN zero configuration that I will show you later on, you'll see that inside VPN zero, they may have IP DHCP client means they can take the IP from the ISP and inside the system configuration you'll find that the vbond IP will direct towards ZTP.Viptela.com So that means you should resolve ZTP.Viptela.com and you should get IP from DHCP to ZTP process to be completed so that means that first thing you should do the power on the device Then it should take the DHCP and it should resolve the DNS At that point of time it will be redirected towards ZTP.Viptela.com and from ZTP.Viptela.com They will check the serial number and the chassis ID of this device and then they will further redirect towards Local vbond. So for example local dot vbond dot com whatever my organization vname is there Now once we reach up to this point of time again, we know what vbond is doing They are checking the serial number and chassis ID and v edge is taking checking the org name But at this point of time these devices don't have the system IP so he will use the null IP 0000 IP to form the connection with the V bond once V bond will authenticate he will re uh, redirect this or he will offer the V manage IP now as per the V manage IP and configuration so point number six or step number six will happen like this so V manage will try to establish the connection with the V edge and here we are pushing the template so once these guys are authenticating with themselves then suppose if the edge device is not up to mark in terms of the image or the software so we manage will push the image and update the image of the edge device at the moment he will reboot we know at the moment that the edge device will get rebooted first of all he will try to contact with vmod always so they will uh, communicate with the V bond and then again V bond now this time he has the system IP So this time he will use the system IP Form the tunnel with V bond and then again V bond will redirect or will offer the IP for the V manage and V smart And finally you'll see by all the steps by the end of that that V manage and V smart has permanent connection with V edge and this V edge having uh, temporary or transient connection with V bond. So this uh, tunnel will tear down and you have the permanent connection and S device will become the part of the fabric. So that will be the overall uh, steps. Let me go and show you the same thing here we have in the slides as well. So you should resolve, you should reach to the ZTP.Viptela.com and these interfaces we are going to use VS1000, you should connect Gigi00. VS2000 you should connect uh, Gigi 2 slash 0 then VH 100 you should connect 0 slash 4 and now here you can see the sequence of uh, steps that is happening here uh, so power on the device once you power on the device they will go and resolve the DNS they will get the IP resolve the DNS they will try to contact ZTP.Pipilla.com from there it will get reacted to V1 they will form the connection with v1 then with the v manage then device will get rebooted again they will uh, form the connection with the v mod then again it will go and uh, form the connection with v manage at this point of time we should push the template from the v manage to the uh, vs device and these are the detailed steps you have so you can go and read out these steps whatever we have discussed uh, same steps from 1 to 11 we have one point to note here is that while you are doing the ZTP process you should uh, push the configuration device template configuration from your v manage to the s device otherwise the ZTP will get failed
okay so what i'm going to do here uh, that uh, i'm going to log into the device or uh, let's break here let's uh, stop here and next the uh, next section i will show you the gtp process in detail while logging the device now i'm going to show you the gtp process how this look like let me quickly show you the default configuration that the device is shipped with so if we go and check show run system here you can see that the system wide configuration is pointing towards gtp.webtela.com and if we go and check uh, the vpn0 configuration so we are ready to get the ip uh, from the isp all right so here we have these basic configuration what we need to do that we need to go and kick off this process so we understand and we see all each and every step what i'll do that i will do the monitor start uh, for the syslog so we can see whatever uh, whatever things that is happening over the screen and here you can see at the moment we don't have ip over any of the vpn interface but we have the management ip from where we logged into the device all right so what we we have to do that uh, we should go and push the template from the uh, vmanage so let me quickly log into the vmanage dashboard here you can see you have the configuration and the template we have the uh, inbuilt templates here that i can go and use here you can see that device attached is zero so let's go and attach the device we can confirm that this is the chassis id that we want to attach and that can can be confirmed from the vmanage dashboard now uh, if you need if you know these variables and later on we'll discuss about uh, that how we can do the uh, how we can create the feature template and how we can create the cli template those things we can discuss but if you know these things you can go and put these values like click edit template and you can put all these values suppose if you don't need uh, if you don't know these things and you have these things inside the csv file so you can go and upload it so options are there download this fill in the blanks for all the csv entries and then you can go and upload it so what i try to tell here is that if i open the csv file and if i show you this uh, you can see that what exactly they look like so let me quickly show you this and you can see that how exactly uh, they look like and what are the fields exactly you are looking to fill so these are the values that is missing here and what we can do we if you download this you will download that template without any field but uh, if you have already that you can click upload choose the file and i can go and i can go to the desktop and i can put that file once you upload it you'll see that all those values will be filled up now we'll go next next and this is scheduled meanwhile we'll go to the place where we want to see all the uh, inputs now in this point of time say suppose if your uh, wan interface is down it will not work so your wan interface should be up and running and we should get the ip from the dhcp anyways if you don't have the ip from the dhcp if we are not able to resolve the first step then obviously this will not resolve the other steps so i am kicking off the wan interface that was by default down i want to i i have enabled that and once the wan interface is up then you will see that we will start getting the syslog messages okay so we'll wait till we start getting the syslog message now you can see that i got the ip with this range and it's try to resolve the 
uh, VPN0 and the DNS resolution that is ztp.cryptela.com and then here you can see that ztp.cryptela.com is able to reach now once we reach to the ztp.cryptela.com then it will redirect that information towards the local we want in our case that local we want is vborn.cisco.com and let's see that where it is so here you can see if i can show this otherwise i'll copy this log messages to the notepad and then i will show you all these steps so now here you can see this vborn.cisco.com which is showing up and once i connect to that then it will offer the vmanage ip so my vbond.cisco.com or my local vbond will offer the vbond ip that is uh, 198.181.10 to the uh, local edge and then the local edge will try to form the connection once it form the connection obviously we have pushed the template as well and let me do one thing quickly here it is going fastly let me copy all these log message in the notepad and then let's go through it because whatever steps that we'll see here that's the exact same steps or exact the same thing that is happening behind the scene for the webtailer process so if we understand these steps these steps will help us to uh, drill down the process behind the scene so let me quickly go and copy these this these are copied i will go and paste inside the notepad and let's see so first of all what happened uh, it will go and search uh, ztp.webtela.com so here you can see that ztp.webtela.com has been resolved once it resolved that then he will redirect that towards the local we want that is vborn.cisco.com in our case so here you can see line number 27 once it resolve that then now at this point of time inside we manage we have uh, the ip system ip actually this is the system ip or the s device now system ip uh, the s device is getting the system ip from the we manage now once they they have the ip from the we manage then again they will try to form the connection with the vborn dot uh, cisco dot com with the with this particular system ip that is 10401 okay so that means the overall thing is that that first of all they will bring up the control connection once the control connection that means the dtls is up and running then they will go and form the omp session once we have the OMP session up and running, then my VSmart actually, he will exchange the IPsec keys and the T-lock information across different devices. Once they exchange the IPsec key and T-lock information across different devices, these different devices, they will initiate the IPsec tunnel and parallelly they will send the BFT packet inside OMP. So my VSmart should know that okay, these are the tunnel endpoints, and BFT is tracking those tunnel endpoints uh, inside the OMP. That message will go and get exchanged. Now, once my control plane is up, once my OMP is up, once my data plane is up, then only with help of OMP, these devices will go and install the routing information or routing table. So we have basically three different type of table. We have OMP table we have routing table and finally with help of routing table we have the fib table that is the ip to next stop so here you can see all this process is happening then whatever omp has whatever omp best path has there they will go and push those information to these s devices and this is the way that the ztp uh, process is working so once ztp process is uh, up and running you can see the branches they have their actual name and you can go and check the control connection you can go and check the ipsec inbound outbound connection you can go and check the outbound connection as well likewise you can go and check the 
BFD sessions and you can go and check the tunnel uh, in detail as well that is the stats so this information you can go and check all right so I hope you understand the ZTP process now PNP process is also very much similar to ZTP uh, with some few minor changes that we can discuss in the upcoming sessions I do recommend that uh, you follow these URLs that I'm going to show you here and this section we are going to do the summary as well so whatever we have a study from last four to five uh, videos or sessions I'm going to do a quick summary for that uh, you should go and visit these URLs uh, these are very nice document you can see it's very recent one as well 2020 Jan and here you will get some more information about the device onboarding actually the detailed information about device onboarding and then uh, we should know about the plug and p portal so the customer nowadays we have the smart account and those are smart accounts we can see each and everything and this is not only a specific to sd van but this is the complete life cycle for dna as well or you can think this is the new type of license management uh, option that Cisco is giving us so we can go to the software.cisco.com there you should you can go and check your smart licenses your virtual accounts and from there you can go and check the plug and p portal as well okay so please go through and uh, check these documents now we have discussed about these steps earlier that you are seeing here so whenever you are onboarding the device first of all they will go and try to establish the session with v1 means v1 is working as an authenticator once v1 will authenticate he'll bypass that message to the v manage and the v smart and v manage v smart will form the connections uh, once your control plane is up and running then the data plane will form and then the with help of omp the v smart that's the actual control plane he will push the configuration to the edge devices that's the overall flow that we have seen now we have learned about a ZTP process and how different this PNP is let's discuss about that so again here you can see the steps that when you are onboarding the CS devices Cisco devices so at that time they will query to the PNP server that is something device helper dot Cisco dot com instead of ZTP dot com and from there it will get redirected towards the local v1 and the rest of the process will be the same that we have a study now this is actually the nice workflow or the flow of the smart licenses connected with pnp connected with ztp process so here you can see that you have your v manage sitting and this v manage so what this v manage is doing let me quickly go and log into the vManage dashboard. So if you go to the vManage dashboard and configuration and devices, you can see here that you have option to sync a smart account. At the moment you will go and click here, all the serial number and chassis ID will pop up here. And those serial number and chassis ID and the controller profile, you should create inside the vManage. So here you can see that you have your vManage, uh, if you do auto sync it will sync with pnp portal and pnp portal even he is updating the ztp server as well so the vs devices the workflow they will query to the ztp server and they will get the serial number chassis id and then it will get redirected to the uh, local v1 in case of c edge they will go and query the pnp portal so here you can see that you have sales engineer they have the controller profile updated to pnp portal or the customer or the partner they can go to ccw where they can manage the uh, smart account virtual account so SAVA plus the hardware inventory list actually from that pnp portal uh, you don't need tag to raise some sort of rma cases and um, hardware replacement and those stuffs directly you can go there and fill all the forms and you can raise it so it's nice and easy way to manage your profile and the devices or inventory licenses etc from the pnp portal so we know at this point of time and this is again very interesting diagram and important that uh, the data plane and control plane they are forming the omp control plane is your vsmart from vmanage 
they are using netconf to push the configuration and with the vbond we have a transient connection we don't have permanent connection with vbond in this slide you can see that uh, which device is using what so ios xe they are using pnp and v edge they are using Z ztp for automated deployment so we have automated deployment and we have manual deployment as well uh, so suppose that we have the bootstrap method as well means uh, the ios xe you can upgrade the ios xe image to sdvan image and then you you can run the sdvan feature inside the ios xe you may have ios xe which already have the sdvan image so you can go and uh, start writing the code means you can do the manual deployment later on in this section i will show you that how manually you can go and configure the devices uh, so this is the summary here you can see that you have all sort of options you have automated deployment you have manual deployment uh, we can use the bootstrap as well now here we have the list where you can see that which device is using pnp uh, which is capable of bootstrapping which is doing the manual in terms of ios xe in terms of vh different hardware platforms you can see and this is little bit little bit up actually the vh cloud should be cut mark here and the manual is okay but with vh cloud how much automated uh, deployment we can do we have seen in the last session all right and again this this will go and redirect towards devicehelper.cisco.com if you are doing the pnp and my asr 1002x they are not using pnp it's not applicable for them but the rest of the hardware you can see that uh, they can do pnp and they have the manual option as well now while you are doing the ztp which interface you are connected uh, connecting with the uh, wan so here you can see for vs 100 and 100b gig e0 slash 4 gig e0 slash 4 for vs 1000 00 2000 2 slash 0 5000 0, 0 first port on the first available network slot vs cloud this is not required in the manual process i always try to explain this that you should do the system wide minimum configuration and a vpn configuration inside vpn configuration you have the interface tunnel routing default route plus management interface configuration so if you do all these minimum configuration so your manual process will up and running after that you can put different features like app route qs local policy central policy etc etc but first bring up the system and then later on you can go and uh, do n number of things now suppose if your devices are behind the firewall and uh, here you can see the list of the firewall port ports related to udp and tcp that should be opened so here you can see that for udp one two three four six is the default what I try to tell here, if you go here and check show control connection, you can see the port numbers here. Uh, that is one, two, three, four, six, and then uh, they will jump with 20. So these are the port numbers one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, four, six, but they will jump with 20 and they will try to uh, get whatever the available ports they have. In TCP, they are using two, three, four, five, six like this so if it is behind the firewall the idea is that you should go and uh, create a rules to open those those port numbers now the basic configuration uh, what configuration you have say in v edge show control connection but in c edge you have to use the keyword sd van show sd van control connection again in v edge you can see you have control connection history actually these uh, outputs we have seen we haven't seen with the C edge. So let me quickly log into the C edge and let me show you these uh, results. Here I logged in inside the C edge and I can go and I can type show SD van control connections. So you can see that uh, the command that you have to use SD van as a keyword. Then you can go and run those uh, output. Again, I can go and check show SD van and then the let's type the question mark so you have the control and with control you can see you have connection history info connection local properties summary etc 
So everything, but you have to use the keyword called SD-WAN to run these commands. Now we are in section five where we have to learn APIs and programming related to SD-WAN. What are the topics we have? We should understand, first of all, the API inside SD-WAN, how it uh, uses and how we are going to use those API to build each and everything. So for that reason, what I have done that I have two follow-up videos related to SD-WAN API, means what is SD-WAN API and what are the things we can do with those APIs, each and everything uh, as per description perspective that is covered. Now, once you understand that uh, what is API, what's the use of API and how we can use those A APIs to retrieve the information inside the SD-WAN, then I'll go in and start, say, for example, 5.1, 5.2 and so on. Now, if you go and see 5.1, it is simply telling that uh, use the API related to certificate management. 5.2, implement Python script using the API to retrieve the device information. So here uh, we have to perform the lab task where we can retrieve the information about the devices and not only about the SD-WAN devices, but we can get whatever information that we have in the API. We can get those information with the programming, with the Python script or program as well, correct? Then 5.3, construct API request for vManage administration. Then uh, check the vManage configuration APIs, construct API re uh, request for vManage monitoring APIs, and then finally the troubleshooting. Okay, so the thing is that, that uh, with API, whatever features we have in the SD-WAN, and the fact is this, that with uh, SD-WAN API, you can do everything. So you can do monitoring, configuration, troubleshooting, uh, certificate management, each and everything we can do. And you can find these information in the follow up videos. So watch two videos after this related to API and then we'll go and start section 5.1. Next topic we have related to application programming interface APIs. Now APIs, now they're getting the popularity. Why? Because if you see the evolution of networking domain. We have started with CLI, command line interface. Then we have the GUI, that is graphical user interface. And finally, we have the application programming interface as well. Now the CLI is also good and fast, but uh, with respect to GUI and the API, we can do things very fast. Even with API, if we do some bulk APIs call and all, this will become very accurate. There is less chance of human error and it will be very faster. So to uh, provide a speed up, we are using the API. Here we have the RESTful API for vManage. We can use third party integration for uh, API use, use cases or use. Even inside vManage also we have the uh, Swagger, API interface from where we can do multiple tasks. Uh, here you can see important thing that we are using the RESTful API that is the representational state transfer API that we are going to use. Now here you can see that we can do things via, with help of CLI, SSH, syslog, SNMP, netconf, but we can go and connect my vManage with the RESTful API. Once you are connected with the RESTful API, what are the things you can do? Actually, you can do each and everything. So you can go and use certificate management, configuration, device and inventory, monitoring, real-time monitoring and troubleshooting. Everything is possible. Now, important thing here that you can see that while you are using these APIs, we have four different type of methods. So what are those methods we have? So we have method called put. If you want to update the object or an object, so update an object, you have put method, then you have get method that is something very much related to show command. If you go, if you want to retrieve the info, 
of that object you can use the get then you have post method if you want to create new object so creation of an object put uh, this post and then finally you have delete if you want to delete an object so these are the four methods that all the apis are using to do the things inside with the help of api you can see uh, get put post and delete now we have the resources and if you collect those resources uh, you can think resource as a group of object or collection with a group of resources like that uh, so here we know that what type of task we can do with help of api and here on top you can see in the chart that you have resource collection and this resource collection for what so for example administration so all the administration task you can group all the related object for administration and with help of api you can do this so administration related to groups viewing audit log managing the local v managed server etc then certificate management configuration device inventory monitoring real-time monitoring and the troubleshooting now these objects that we are seeing here uh, because if you uh, go and check behind the scene these are the object and then you are collecting same type of object so these object they should have their format and here you can see that the Viptela REST API uses the JSON data model to represent. We'll see later on that while we are getting the output, we are getting the output in JSON format. In JSON format, they have three types of data, a scalar, array, and object. That's very much programming related that you can go and check. Now, once you log into the Swagger interface, you'll find that uh, color coding for these operations so delete will be red get will be blue post will be green put will be brown like that you can see now how I can go and log into the uh, swagger interface so for that you have to go and use this URL your vmanage IP and then the API talks so let me do one thing let me go and log in to the swagger interface so here I have my vManage dashboard and what I can do that we can go and check API docs. So now it will redirect towards on top you can see this API document fetching the resources for API doc and then you'll get the long list of things that we can do. So give him some chance to uh, come and meanwhile we'll go and check the slides so you can go and log in there then you have api calls you can go and use the data store and services and call different different type of things so for example if you want to see the omp peering how you can do so let me quickly show you here that how you can go and build your own query build your own api calls so let me open the notepad here and OMP peering, what I can do here, you can see that API is uh, data service and then the device OMP peer. And then you have to give the device ID that is the system IP. So, for example, 1040.1, I want to check the OMP peer for this particular. Uh, device so let me do zoom in for so you can see this and all right so like that you can go and create uh, I think we have our dashboard open API doc page open so let me quickly go and log in there so here you can see you can see the API doc now if you want to search OMP you can go and search real-time monitoring and OMP you want to check the OMP peer here you can see you have the OMP peer and as per our slide you can see the get is blue color but you have different different color delete will be uh, red like that so what you want you want to 
check the OMP pair for 1040.1, you can go and query this. If you do the query here, you can see 200 means success, and then you have 400 bad requests, 403 for Britain, 500 is the internal error. Now here you can see that we got the request URL, and uh, here you can see the output. Correct. So this is the output who are the OMP peer. My OMP peer always will be the VSmart. So here you can see the peer and peer. Two VSmarts are my OMP peer. Now we are also making or building our API call. So here you can see uh, we have this API call for OMP peer. And here you can see what are the things needed only. You have to add the URL and port number and that's it. So what I will do, I will co copy this and we'll go here and put here. Once you go and put, you can see that you're getting the result. And if you want to get the result in the JSON format, so let me use the other browser for the same. And let me show you the result in the other browser. Same output I ran inside this uh, Mozilla and here you can see that we are getting the JSON format Inside that you have the header. So if you minimize the header, then you have the data value in data value You can see that your peer is VSmart smart and whose IP is This this is the peer and then again you can see that your other peer is Other VSmart smart and whose IP is this so you are getting the result Right. Likewise, you can go and use any type of uh, uh, these API calls. So suppose if you want to uh, check the DTLS or TLS connection, you can go and use this. So let me quickly build this one more time. So here we are and now we can copy and paste as well. So what you want? You want, you can see the DTLS and TLS connection. API call you want and here you can see we can go to the devices and then control and then connections Correct so I can go and copy this And this will be one of my API call related to So now we have built our API call to check the control connections you can copy and paste and we are getting some error. So let me quickly go and fix this error. What we can do at this point of time that we can go and check our vManage and from where we can get this particular API. So I'm logging back to my API. Once I'll get my screen, I'll go and search the DTLS connection API. So here we have the search option. We can go and check, say for example, uh, API for DTLS. So what we can do, we can go and check the control and let's go next. You have this real-time monitoring control. And then if you go scroll down, somewhere you'll find that you want to see the number of control connection and here if you go and give the system ID and if you try it out you will get the exact API you are looking for and you can see that there is a small change in the API so that's why you are not getting the correct result now I, I can go back here we can go and put that correct API and then you can see we are getting the result so the control connection related to this particular device you can see who uh, are the controllers means one is the vManage this IP you can see let me see the IP public IP and this so this is the vSmart here you can see the peer type as well so one vSmart then vSmart number two then 
VS Smart with other. So this is other VS Smart with other transport. This is again the other VS Smart means we have two VS Smart. And then finally, you should have V manage as well. So here you can see the V manage over the MPLS. All right. So this is the way that you can go and further check all type uh, types of uh, APIs. So that means uh, you can check the connection BGP. Then if you want to check the orchestrator connections, those you can see uh, what is the API call? What is the GUI equivalence? What is the CLI equivalence? Even we can compare all three as well. So for example, show orchestrator local properties is the CLI. Even in the GUI also we can go and check and even the URL means the API call also you can go and verify. So in this manner in this way you can have a list that what CLI what GUI and what API and later on you can use only the GUI and the API calls even if you want to go and verify the OSPF related uh, things like database interface neighbors processes etc uh, et you can go and run these APIs call that we have built for two you can build for a rest of them and then it will work as it is let us start this section let's start with 5.1 in 5.1 we have to do the certificate management from api so what does it mean uh, you can go to v manage once you are inside the v manage you can see here that inside configuration we have certificate now once you are inside the certificate you have various tasks that you can do the same thing so not only this but apart from that uh, say for example uh, things related to CSR roots uh, root CA those things as well we can go and manage from the API doc so we know that if I go here and uh, type API docs so the API document will open now once you open the API document you can search certificate management now once you are inside the certificate management you can see that we have various post and get operations that we can achieve even we have the delete option as well one delete option delete the certificate and then give the UUID now here you can see that the post that is starting is certificate generate enterprise CSR slash VH certificate view that will retrieve the certificate so first one is to generate the CSR retrieve the certificate save via smart list to retrieve via smart list etc so suppose if I go to first option here, you can see that uh, uh, certificate generate enterprise CSR VH. And now there is option that inside the box you are using the enterprise CA or not. So suppose if I go inside the uh, administration and setting here, you can see the recommended option that we are getting is that uh, Vanage Cloud Certificate Authorization. And let me show you that recommended is uh, that is actually the Cisco signed certificate. So let me close this. Yeah, this one controller certificate authorization. I will come to this van edge as well. So there are two type of certificate basically. One is that when you have your controller set up. Nowadays what is happening? that most of the customers they are setting the controller over the cloud now once you are doing this cloud hosted controller setup then you have option so you want cisco automated certificate or semantic one or manual man manual is you have to do the manual installation of the certificate or if your company has your enterprise root uh, certificate then you can use that as well correct now the recommended is cisco now once you do that obviously you have to sync this with the smart account and there is complete uh, process that you have to follow so you should have your smart account where you will go and put the serial number then you have to put the controller information there now that smart account controller information where controller is nothing but actually the v bond so that v bond information should sync the v manage uh, i'll show you that inside v manage how you can sync that so then whatever device list you will upload there that will get synced with vManage. 
and it is something like partial PNP process in terms of certification uh, syncing of the certification so now here you can say that if you want to do this option that is the recommended one although you have the semantic option as well now th that's the note so now if you have the cloud hosted controller Cisco will do most of the part and then they will send you an email that please follow these steps to so bring up uh, say for example the vManage the vBond etc okay so what you are doing you are going here and again there is there are steps so let me tell you all the steps first of all you have to go and uh, add the smart account detail that is the step number one then what you will do that uh, you can go here although they will give you four to five steps document that you have to follow then you can go here and make this as a cisco one then you have to go inside the configuration and certificate and go to the controllers one by one in all those controllers just generate the csr once you generate the csr and then if you log into the smart account certificate you'll find that all the csr has been synced actually behind the scene so you can see there are a lot many things and now they have given the Cisco has given the option for the TLS proxy as well Now suppose if you have Enterprise CA and you want to use that as, uh, as a proxy you can use it Okay, so there are a lot uh, Related to certification the easiest one is that you want to do everything in automated fashion if you have the cloud hosted controller you simply go here and uh, do the Cisco choose the Cisco one or maybe semantic one recommended it Cisco one and then for the edge devices that will be by default automated now for the hardware devices because already you have put the information in the PNP portals and all it will do the automatically uh, certification process there is no problem in that still if you have the enterprise CA uh, you can go and do that. See, this is the recommended. So your enterprise has your uh, CA certificates and from there it will go and sync. So plan it how you are going to do the certification because by the end, end of day security is one of the key factor deploying sd -WAN. All right. So these options you, you can see here you have and finally if you go to the devices once you are in the devices here you can see that you can go and sync the smart account correct so that was the option that pnp will uh, pnp will get synced here if you go and click here all right so let me not do this thing let's go back to the api because we are very much focused on api so at the moment i don't have enterprise csr if i want to see the certificate so here you have the certificate view here you have the api and i can go and put here or let me open the new tab so i can show you in the new one now here some token related issue now important thing here is that whatever apis that you're seeing you have to go and check it because all the apis will not work and uh, suppose if you want to use these apis and if you have any problem related to that you simply raise case with cisco and you tell them that these APIs we are looking for or this is the operation I'm looking for which is not working uh, probably you can see if you go and check all these API whatever reusable API although there is a long list but uh, usable APIs uh, you can go and check maybe four or five will be usable in the list of um, maybe 15 all right so here you can see that we have we are getting the uh, result and in this result you can see that I'm seeing and basically we are focused on the data column so here you can see that V bond related information the V bond the serial number the NCS number configuration template long list of informations we have and here you can see the certificate here you can see the enterprise certificate so in this option whatever required things that I'm looking for it is coming Correct, and here you can see all these detailed steps like template apply log. Now these things are actually very hard to get. Actually, it's not possible to get from the CLI. You don't have any CLI equivalents of these things that you are seeing here. Uh, otherwise, you have to go and uh, go behind the scenes. You have to go to the shell prompt and 
from there you have to go and check the logs certificate related logs then you'll uh, get these informations correct great let's check the other as well so after that you can see that you have the list of the you can check the um, via smart list then you can check again both are almost same retrieve the via smart list if i go and run this also and here you can see the VA smart list and what was this this was the also the same and here you can see the VA smart list so post and get method that you're seeing here both are the same then you can go and check the uh, save the VA list now some places you are seeing this body what is this this is something like post related query body that you can understand in the upcoming section where we want to post something via the Python API okay so those things are there uh, better whenever you are doing the post method use the python way to do it but still at this point of time it is recommended that you use the vmanage gui uh, for do all all type of post because anyways the vmanage gui is sufficient enough and it's most of the things are already auto automated inside the vmanage gui that you can do from uh, either from the api post so API post alternatives we manage that you can do or if you want to do fastly you can use the Python programming as well okay so again we can see this VH list and if we go here if you go and check this you will find the response 200 that means that is good and then you can carry forward and you can go and paste this here so let me go and paste this output here I can go and paste this query and again you can see uh, the data data is the important one so the V is the serial number the NCS if the font is a small I can go and uh, click it will become bigger and if you want to filter something even we have the filter option as well we can go and filter so here one by one if I go to data zero and then you can see one then you can see the other VH, then the other VH, then other VH. Likewise, we are getting all zero to four uh, certificate details. Correct? Again, VH list the same. Then force sync the root cert if you want. If you want to reset the uh, RSA, um, again, if uh, you want to reset it, uh, you can use the vManage. So how it is means once you are inside the configuration and certificate you can regenerate the csr so option is there if you have done the manual installation even in automated as well you have this generate the csr or reset the rsa so these options are there that you can go and use uh, once you do that again you want to use this certificate for recertification process then certificate record is there you can go and check the certificate record as well so most of the things has been automated it's still a few of the things are not uh, as per expected that uh, we can check uh, with Cisco as well that we are looking for these API's which are not working so they will help you on uh, those uh, places already you can see all the certificate install and the information about that correct great uh, then rest of the certificates this device list already we have seen the CSR details you can get the device details you can get the root certificate again it will tell you the about the root certificate uh, for at least for the documentation purposes it is good and here you can see the root certificate begin with that here also you can check the output so here you can see this is the output and the best output we can get in the Mozilla so if I again if I copy this and paste into the Mozilla so let me go and paste here root certificate and here you can see that root certificate correct so see the power of API's that you are getting the information within fraction of seconds at the moment I go and click and it is now we reach to section 5.2 where we have to learn understand about the API integration with Python or how we can convert this SD-WAN API to the Python script and then we can get the device inventory and other informations So let me quickly show you some of the URL uh, Where you can go and get the reference so here 
uh, first of all the good reference point is this uh, https developer.cisco.com now if you go there uh, you can go and check uh, say for example this particular url that we are seeing here uh, the uh, the way is this that you go to a developer and check with sd1 or search with sd1 then you then you will get multiple links correct now here you can see that why sd1 uh, why use it what is it sd1 overview what is cisco sd1 rest api and where you will get all these documentation and all how this look like each and every information you'll get uh, at least you will get the start uh this can be good a starting point you will get the uh, so good document related to the sd van rest apis now coming back to the devnet so here you can see this developer cisco.com where you can go and check other stuffs as well related to sd van apis and uh, others and here you can see clearly that uh, you have say for example intro to sd1 rest api then you can see the rest api with postman the python now we are very much looking for the rest api with python topic that i will show now but you can go and reserve the labs as well so here you can see that we have the sd1 sandboxes we have sd1 always on sandboxes as well so if you click there you will get uh, the controllers you'll get the edge devices you can reserve that lab with your company uh, email address if your company has at least the basic partnership because there are so many different type of partnerships with cisco so if you are using cisco product and if you have the partnership with cisco then you can go and use the sandboxes you have to go there click reserve it you'll get one email you'll get the cisco any connect link you can log in and then you can uh, uh, access those devices correct so you can utilize that now once you go inside this topic number three that is the rest api python integration then this will explain you that how this integration look like and first of all it will start with a very basic basic means that uh, uh, what are the stuffs we have related to api and python integration even i'll show you this code in the here as well so let me go here if i can yep so i have the access here in my library and how i have built this i'll show you that so if i go here and if i check say stvan.py so here on top you can see that uh, um, you have this code where you are importing certain functions. So, for example, request this JSON click OS tablet. All this information. So, what this tablet will do, why you are importing JSON, what are the requests, each and every uh, things apart from that, this uh, ignore message related to URL library disable warning, then the uh, username password what this section will do uh, why we have these sections these information uh, you will get you will uh, you will get from here okay so code obviously i will post with the course but uh, if you know the basics of how with this program with this python program we are actually creating the library actually we are not creating the library but we are calling the api library inside python program now once you call the api library inside python program then python program can do the query like we have we are using the query with the url with the mozilla or firefox etc but you can do the query means the python program can do the query and then it will get the result in the json format so here you can see that first of all you should log in ignoring some of the uh, certificate messages one once you go and log in to the device then you should have the library correct now once you have the library so here you can see that uh, whenever we are running the api we are using the data services correct after data services you can give any of the other things like devices or certificate or anything 
now this library that we have here in the program it will do all the things so it is related to get put post everything now mostly we are focusing on get method because we want to do the monitor we want to do the retrieval of data so for example once you log in say here you can see the get request with this uh, we manage ip and uh, once you logged in then what you want to do so here you have the definition related to post as well obviously you had a request uh, you have definition with get as well post means obviously you want to create an object get the, just you want to see the information so as you can see that you have the get definition as well and from where you can get this uh, code i will show you that as well so once you are familiar with the uh, top thing means how to log into the device so first of all how to use the library function first so once you know that what are the functions we needed so these are the library functions and the call then how you are going to log in to the device then you can go and build different type of functionalities correct so for example device list i will come back to that device list but slowly you can go and build it correct now while building this uh, libraries so let me go to the next you can see that the rest api library so login get request post post request and here we have the library then the very important thing very important point that uh, you have the library now once you have the library then you can integrate with the api so you can run the api and the api result how we are getting the api results are in the form of json format now those json format i can go in python and those information i can convert in some sort of table format correct now if you want to get the codes here you can see that getting started with cisco stvan github this place you have to go and check it properly means we should follow this uh, this particular link step by step if you are building your rest one code this can be very very good starting point so here if you go and all right so we are at this url if you go you will get this uh, step by step things that how you want to clone this so here you can see i can go and do git clone in my automation automation system and i can clone this program then i can go inside the directory and then if i want virtual environment i can use that virtual environment and then it will work now imp uh, important thing here is that there are some requirements in this means you need some sort of tabulate or request and all those informations that you want to go and check from here then you should uh, give the ip and the username password means you can set this as an environment variable and then this program will be good to run there are some output just for the reference and how this program look like so let me quickly show you this program that how it look like so here you can see that i have my program in the sublime and this will start like this then you should go and define the api library once you define that then you can go and create the function so here you can see that i'm using this device list because that's the requirement for this section what I'm taking in device list, what are the keys I'm taking? So what the host name, the device type, device ID, system IP, etc. Uh, now it's very interesting, important that how you want to print this, correct? So what we are doing here and see that we have our API. So our API is this devices and here you can see if you go and check this request equal to json load that uh, sdvan get the request device so this device is not just a device but this is your we manage ip then data services so up to data services we have the api built and obviously you are putting the we manage ip you're setting it as an environment variable then after data services whatever you will put 
correct so that will be the complete api call so https v manage ip port number data service and then device so that means you are calling the api what information you are extracting from the api is these information so i am extracting these information but how i am printing it so here you can see that we have the for loop an item so here you can see this items so i am taking the item inside the items and then i am storing inside this tr how i am storing it so host name and likewise i am printing as well so host name the device id and this should not be the same uh this is the format actually i want to print so what are the things i am printing these information inside the device list now once i will read so uh, what are the things we are doing once we are running the api once we are restoring those apis means this is the output format that i have and once i am running this for loop means i am storing the json then i am printing this json in the table format correct so this table format and again we have the fancy grid and all how it will work how it will how it look like that you will see so i will go and uh, run this now in this particular function in this particular function that we have let me go a little bit up so i have this function called uh, device underscore list that's that's it if i go and print till here it will work but i have added few more apis call as well suppose if i want device and controller information so for that information i have added then suppose if i want uh, other information as well like uh, system device and a vs device where the device type the serial number the device state validity etc those information if i want so for that also i have built this so inside this actually i have called three api taking the input for the json format and then i'm going to print it the same thing you will see here as well in the program but because the font is smaller so that's why i have shown you there in the sublime format all right so once we have that uh, program up and running and here you can see this is not time looking for the device list i'm looking for so here you have the device list Although in this uh, program that we are seeing here, I have only one uh, call, correct? Because this is exactly the copy that we have in the uh, getting started with Cisco folder from the GitHub. So what I can do here, let me do this little quick. I can go out from here and then I can create say, uh, say nano new st man i know the font is a bit small but uh, i have created i have given just the name and then i can go to this place all right so you can see here that the program that i have here in my automation tool is different so let me show you that i haven't created the new one but let me go back and show you this nano st1 this is a program actually i have copied directly from the getting started folder now suppose if you don't want this uh, because again i want to add some new functions and feature inside this so what i have done again i have added some more functionality and already i have explained this so i can go back here i can open my new sdvan and i can paste here now once this is pasted then we can go and uh, execute this so let me copy one more time and i can go back to the this place and i can paste here let me check maybe some issue with the paste say stvan one dot py and let me 
copy and paste okay so now it got pasted and here you can see that if you go and compare the program that uh, is there in the folder in the github there are not many functions but i have added omp osp ft lock and so many others as well so let me save and let me go out from here and if i can show you the login detail so i have login st1 detail this is my uh, environment variable i want to set this first and then we are ready to run this program so i can go here and run python 3 and then my new st1 say 1.py and first of all i want to show you the functions that we have so i have long list of function encoded the api or converted the apis inside the python here you can see the app route interface bft etc we are looking here just to get the uh, device specific information so i can select that enter now maybe you are thinking that how it is doing the query uh, inside the lab environment so let me quickly show you my gns here I have my automation tool and here I have the cloud set up in the cloud. This is the NAT from where my automation tool is getting the IP, but I have the reachability to the cloud in the GNS, correct? So I'm running my program here and then you can see that we have the information. So first of all, uh, the list, actually whatever information that I want that's the format we have in the table format. So the host name, the device name, the device ID, the system IP version, model, platform, certificate validity, and the state. Now these informations are very important in terms of uh, monitoring as well. So suppose if you have so many devices and you want to monitor, just few clicks and you can check the status. Likewise, in this program i have added some other information as well like the vmanage in sync uh, success is that template status device status state and the expiration date apart from that uh, the information and here you can see that which api it is calling and what is the use so display all the vpla device in the overlay network that are connected to vmanage so all the VS devices here you can see the serial numbers as well uh, this is device is not deployed yet so we can see it's just a token number um, because here again you can see this is the bootstrap config generated but it is not uh, centralized means it is not deployed from the controller so good amount of information just from the Python program what we are doing once our program is ready simply we are using python and then the program and the device list once you go click enter you will get the information within maybe less than 10 seconds you have this information so very nice very helpful to get the information in the python format in section 5.3 we have to learn understand the vmanage administration api and obviously we can construct those i'll show you that how you can do that so once you go inside the vmanage and uh, let me minimize this you have the administration option that you have option related to uh, log user user group uh, vpn rbac groups etc and once you go inside the log you can go and check the audit log aggregation uh, do count fields etc then you can go to the user what are the user list the users you can update put post delete those operations you can do finally same thing can be done with the user groups and then finally we have the vpn rbac group as well now the question here is that uh, all the time we are logging to the uh, swagger or we are logging to the vmanage api and from there uh, we are doing the work now often time what will happen that all the apis you are not using it but you have selected certain useful apis and then you have the web page from where you can go and you can run those things that you want to do so maybe you have maybe in uh, 
here you have 200 APIs. Out of that 200 API, you list out 50 APIs that you want to use in your day-to-day -day activity. For that, you can go and create the web page. And now it is creating web pages are very easy. Uh, you can use any text to HTML editor or there are HTML editor where you can put the tables, image, videos, pictures, etc. And very easily you can create the web page. Now those web page can again very easily hosted over a Linux machine. We can run these services, for example, app Akip, and then there, those web pages can be hosted. So here I have created one HTML code in my notepad. Here you can see this is the HTML code. Again, I have used the uh, HTML converter tools to create it. And once I run this in my local system, so it is looking like this. So API construction, uh, request for st v manage administration now here you can see that i have although i have given very less amount of uh, apis but like that we can build the database so the task is audit log api so you can give the task and here you can give the description that is blank but you can put any uh, name here any description anything correct now the task and the description, what is the task? So task is audit log API and the description is get audit log detail. Like is audit log uh, details and then the description. You can give nice description what this API is going to do. Now, if you see this API, you can see that there is hyperlink with this. So that means if I go and click, the new API page will come like this. Now this API page that we are seeing this is the raw format of the JSON. It is not in the extracted format of JSON because we are using this Microsoft browser. If I go back to my Mozilla and uh, this is one of the nice browser we have. So here also we have this web page. Let me refresh this. Now if I click audit log API, you can give you can get the nice uh, display. Likewise, we can go and check the log details and then here you can see in the data we are getting the logs, all the logs that we have. Again, uh, for our purpose, we can copy these logs, whatever important information is there, we can copy and uh, utilize anywhere. But we have complete audit log in this format. Correct? Now these things are even not possible to take these inputs from the CLI command. Even if you take the CLI input command, where you will store this long input. This is so many pages are there. You can see at least you have 60 to 70 page output, correct? But obviously uh, from here, you can go and take that. So you have this option to expand all. You can copy paste or maybe this input you can put inside any other program where you will get some report format. Okay. All right, then other things say administration user, uh, list all the users so you can go and list whatever users we have. So for example, Rahul Rumi, uh, Rahul is under basic group. Rumi is under net admin and the operator. So Rumi is a part of these two user groups. Now we reach to 5.4. In this section, it is expected that we should use the post method to do some sort of changes in the configuration. Okay, and we should integrate our API with the Python program. Now, before starting this, I just wanted to show you that Cisco DevNet. Inside Cisco DevNet, we have a great documentation and a step by step process plus the lab that you can go utilize practice. So once you log in, uh, to the DevNet and inside DevNet, we have STVAN programmability STVAN uh, section here using the vManage REST API. Now again, once you go inside that, you will get all the steps, useful links from where you can go learn the skills related to STVAN. You can go and clone the Git repository from where you can run execute the programs as well again you can go and check the uh, 
sandbox so here you can see all the links are there once i click there i can go and check the sandbox i can reserve it and then i can utilize this correct so you can do the practice you have the theory you have the code each and everything is there just we should go there and use our knowledge skill to utilize all these links correct so again nice description just uh, follow the link and have a look on these documents that we have uh, at least this lab and the previous one lab that we have checked they are very important and you will get the description of all the functions library why we are using it what's the use of this how we are creating the library uh, how we are creating the library not but which type of library we are calling plus how we are creating the api library so that is very important so we have the api library and then once we have the api library uh, then we can utilize that api library for certain functions so for example just to get the device list template list attached device list uh, attached d attached there are other configuration change um, things are uh, involved there so for example if you want to detach a template attach a template those information we can get from the program and obviously when we are attaching or detaching then we are using some sort of put method if you are attaching you are using the post if you are detaching you are doing some change in the object that means the uh, put method correct and delete delete is one method when we are using this detach means you are deleting something so that will the delete method so like that we can go and utilize all the methods you should go here and visit the link and here you can see the example when you run the program what type of output will come with this particular code what type of output will come it is explained nicely at this particular link okay again here you can see that the example that how you are attaching the template and several tests and uh, other stuffs as well so for example how we are updating the objects etc correct so complete lab set is there with nice explanation and detaching a template and then the final version once you complete this again what type of things you can go and check correct so what we have done that we have already cloned this particular program in our automation tool so here you can see that i have the cloned and if i can clear it yep. so we have the clone and uh, if you want to check that what are the operation we have the with the main uh, clone program so let me quickly show you here i can go to python 3 hd1 and then i can check the help once you check the help button then it will tell you that what type of programs it has it should have the reachability so what what happened at this point of time i have set some other hd1 variable let me quickly go and change it to my variable that this is my uh, we manage variables and then i can go and check the help so what functions we have here you can see the attach detach and other stuff we have checked one that is the device list this is the actual program device list output correct where i have added some other in the previous section you have seen that i have added some other apis as well and then it was giving the result apart from that if you want to check the device list you can check the device list so these are the template these are the devices these are the template id number of attached devices you can see correct then let's go back to the help and uh, one thing you can see here that the we manage ip username and password is variable so the program is not only valid for the sandbox that uh, is there that is given there with that uh, uh, document that I have shown you but it is valid to any of the sd van fabric either it's uh, over the cloud or in the production as long as we have the reachability as long as we'll go and set the environment variable we can use it correct 
again attach device retrieve and return the device associated to that template so if you want to see more information you can go and check it now if you get this type of uh, result that means your vmanage is not reachable if your vmanage is not reachable then you will get such type of output such type of information correct so again let's see that is still the uh, lab and the reachability should be there yeah so reachability is there is there and i can see that this program having some issue related to some of the functions so you can see that some places you'll find that the program is not working properly you have to go and fix that code and Cisco has given the code or over the github you'll get the code but you should know the code if it is not working correct anyways uh, maybe this is the why because we are not giving the full command so here you can see that either your vmanage is unreachable or if you're not giving all the commands related to this it will throw an error so what you can do we can go and check the help function what you want with the attached device so here you can see i was not giving the attached device and the full template so that's why it was throwing an error correct so what we can do here that uh, at this point of time we'll not do that but we can go to help let's see before doing edit what other option we have there you can see that you have the attach option as well attach a template with the Cisco ST1 attach devices as well so what we have seen we have seen the device list we have seen the template list so let me show you the template list one more time because I want to detach now if I want to detach and wanted to know that what options I have after the detach so I can use the help correct now it is telling that you can detach and then you can uh, use the target and then you should use the target id so for example i want to detach this and then you can go and use the system ip set 10.1.0.2 ssip here you can see with this template i have two devices connected so if i go and use it now if everything is correct it will work otherwise it will throw an error so it is telling that your target id so here you can see um, we are getting the information 10102 is not working here because my target id was incorrect correct so like that uh, we can go and build our script so you can see that we should give the target and the target id so when we are detaching it detaching the template uh, we should go and give the target id so let's see the template list and i'll tell you that the target id you will get with the device list so once you are very much familiar with uh, the programs that we are working we can use it so now i can go and give the target id because that was the template id and i have my vh dc1 vh2 this is the device i'm looking for and okay so DC1 VH2 is this uh, this this should work and uh, let me check that maybe now it is gone so still we can see that we have two devices those are attached and if you go and check the device list okay so what I'll do uh, I will build new lab in the next recording and then all the delete and the change type of functions I will show you in the uh, next lab. Okay, so let's just stop here. And in the next lab, I'll show you rest of the functions. All right, so let's continue. Uh, our agenda here is to 
check the attach and detach and moreover we are looking for the configuration option that with help of uh, python program how we can uh, push some configuration or how we can edit the configurations now what i i have done that i logged in into devnet lab and this is the lab setup so once you go to the url that is given there and once you book the lab this lab setup is like this so here you can see that we manage ip is um, 10 10 20 dot 90 and then the username and password is admin and admin so let me show that what i have done i again set the environment variable so here you can see the ip then username and password so once i have set this environment variable then again i can go and test the new uh, sd -WAN fabric that we have again we can go and check the python and then sd -WAN and obviously always we can go and do for help then you want to see the device list that we have seen earlier with other sd -WAN fabric so here you can see that device lists are different that we want to play around then if you want to check the template list you can go and check the template list as well suppose if you want to check the attached device so we can go and we can go and check the attached device and if any other help function is there so we can go and check with the help so what attached device will do that they will go and tell you the uh, templates that it attached with that now you can see this uh, program that we are using attach device it should be like uh, this so let me go and do that and we can use the help here so you can see that uh, what is there after that so it is telling that you can use the attached device then the template and then the template name so it will tell you details about that template correct so at the moment what I can do I can go and check the template list first then I can go to the attach device and then we have this template option so let me put here and then say for example DCB edge template with this CSR so I can go and give the template ID enter so now you're getting the detail about this particular template Correct. So you can see we can check the device means number of devices then we can go and check the templates and then which particular device uh, having which template and the uh, attributes related to templates so for example this DC so, uh, device IP the site ID etc. So those detail information we are getting. Now what I want here is that I want to see the template the details about site 3 vh template and again the program will run and it will tell that what's the device ip because we're going to do some sort of edit with this particular device all right so what i want here is that i want to do certain changes in this particular device again uh, we have option that we can go and utilize so for example um let me quickly log into the v manage and the v manage ip is 10 10 2090 so 2090 and then i can give the password now once i am inside v manage i can go and go to the shell typing v shell and i want to ssh to this ip and let's go inside that because if you want to check the details about this particular device so you can go inside this device and you can check the details uh, okay i'm not having the password for this particular device and we can always use this netconf as well 
So let me use this netconf. All right, so here you can see that uh, from the vManage, I'm unable to log into this device. The other option that I have is that I can go to the dashboard and from the dashboard, I can go and check the uh, various component. Even I can go and check the uh, running configuration of this particular device. So no problem. What we want that we want to change a certain attribute, certain variables related to this particular device. So let me come back to my automation tool. And if you go and check the st van help first. So if I go and show you this attachment so we have two more template or two more functions to be more precise one is attach one is uh, detach so first of all i want to attach something let me show you the attach how it is working so when you use attach you can see you can set different things here correct so you can attach template id target id host name etc long list is there again you can go and refer the program as well if you if you want only these two things or maybe these four things so you can go and edit inside the program as well okay so as per the topology and as per the diagram we have certain things to change and for that here you can see Obviously, I'll go and verify the template first of all with site 3. So let's check the template with site 3 first. I'll go to the template list. And here you can see this template is this. And uh, let's go back to the program. It should be uh, F4 to F. F4. So exactly the same. Okay, so what we can do, we can go and uh, use this command to attach this particular file. And before attaching this file, I just wanted to show you this. This time we are using the YAML function. And here, if you go and check this particular program, so here it is telling that use this. Okay, so actually there are two version of program. If you go and check the latest version, you'll find that uh, it is telling you to use the YAML. Okay, so here if I go and here you can see that uh, I have this YAML. And these are the contents here inside the YAML. And this system IP is the correct one. The device ID, I should check the device id as well before doing anything so i can give an i can go and check the device list because inside device list you will get the device id so do you have the same device id yes the device id is same so we can go ahead and attach this program because i have a yaml file and i have all these information so i can go here Oops. Uh, I can go to my program and I can use this string. Let's go back here and because I am running Python 3, so I should use Python 3. Let's attach. Now, what error it is saying? There is no such uh, option called variables. Okay, so here you can see that if you are running a little bit older program, this will throw this type of error. So what we can do that uh, I can go and clone this particular uh, program in some new folder. So let me do like this. I can make a directory called st and I can Say Steven new, and then I can go to st say van new. Once I'm there, then I can clone that. 
new program this is the older one that we are running but older one is also giving you the output so let me clone the new one so here you can see the URL and here you can see the commit two month old this is actually the newer code I can go inside this and let me clone this okay because uh, of the uh, fact I am connected with the VPN it is not allowing me to clone it so let me disconnect my VPN first all right so I have disconnected my VPN let me try this one more time now you can see that it is allowing me to clone it and now I can go to the new program and if I go here now you can see that uh, we have this file here and this is some updated program so the, the variable and all all those things will work let me quickly reconnect my VPN so I have connected back my VPN and let's run the program called device list first it should uh, give us the list of the devices and then we'll go and check the other now when I'm running this program here you can see the variable is set with 198 that's uh, not the correct IP so let's see here uh, let's uh, set the variable one more time so we know that we have the variable that we have set earlier and the thing that you need to set it either you can uh, create one script to set that those options are there we can create a script and set as well or uh, every time you have to go and do like this obviously if you have multiple fabric then you can go and do it so let me go and quickly put the the URL uh, the IP the username and the password so IP is 10 10 20 90 username and password this then I can go and run the device list one more time so this time this should be working because now we have given the uh, correct variable and then uh, our VPN is also connected great so I have set the environment variable and set the port number as well if you go to the link here you'll get these information as well and here you can see that is related to the sandbox we are running before doing all these stuffs you should you please follow the steps that uh, that is there all right so we have checked the uh, device list earlier with the other program and we want to check the device list here as well so check that device list you'll get the information and we can simply go and check the rest of the thing so we have checked the device list we have checked the template and what i want here is to attach so here you can see um, this is the function that we want to use and this is the exact the same thing so let's go and copy this I can go and copy this I can go back here I can use my Python 3 st1 copy and enter so now you can see that it's uh, attempting to attach the template it is trying to do the configuration as per the YAML file that we have seen and we'll wait for the result so here you can see this uh, attached device with the template is successful now if you want to verify it obviously you can go and check the template list and it is retrieving the information about the template list so here it is correct and here it is the template great so you can see that how we can go and edit because 
in this yaml file if you want to edit certain variables you can edit it and then you can paste it so this is that how you can attach suppose if you want to check the detach so let's do that as well i can go and go reach here i can go and check the detach and it's actually very easy and straightforward you have to give the target id and the system ip so we can go to the detach here it is telling give the target give the target id target id you will get with the device list so when we have the device list information i can go here and check that this is the device id then i can go and give the system ip the system ip is this one i can go and give that so now the detach function is in progress it is attempting to detach the template if everything is correct it will detach the template then we'll go uh, check the device list you'll find that this is in the cli mode okay so from we manage it will become it will come to the cli mode all right and here you can see that detach is completed now if you if i go and check the device list and then you can see the difference so in the device list uh, this is the guy this is the device id and if i go and quickly show you the template so let me show you this template list as well where you will see that this device is not attached via any template rather than zero because it is converted to the cli all right so you can use these methods even if you want you can edit your program variables and uh, even we can run this in the production environment as well now we reach to section 5.5 .5, where where we have to learn about the SD-WAN we manage monitoring apis that includes real-time api there is a long list of monitoring and real-time apis and then we need to construct these apis so i'll show you that how you can construct this uh, in the python format but we have option that we can use the html code as well that we have seen earlier so let me go to the we manage dashboard and the api doc so here you can see you can go to the api doc and once you're inside the api doc you can search with monitoring now once you're searching with monitoring you can see that monitoring quality of service alarms application router stats dpi c float interface stats server information means each and everything that you can monitor once you have the monitoring api after that you have real-time encounters real-time uh, monitoring apis say for example with respect to arp bft bgp bridge cellular device dhcp etc correct so all these apis you need to construct and then obviously the question here is that whatever is usable in my case so suppose dpi deep packet inspection inside dpi again you can see that you have uh, six to seven different apis that you can utilize so what you are going to use that's important or you can take a summary of these apis maybe three api you can build inside one call one procedure so what does it mean let me quickly show you my program here so i have my program and um, you can see some errors as well that i just wanted to show you that if you get the error how you can improve that error so if i go inside my program i have my program and that program is in auto sd1 now if i go inside that and if i type help here you can see that we have uh, this long list actually i have constructed all these apis taking help of the api in the back so how it will be once i am inside here you can see that uh, we have these apis the top format i have shown you so for example if i go inside any of them except the device list so for example this omp now what you can do that 
uh, you can go and check the OMP peer. Then you can go and check the uh, OMP routes advertisement. Then you can go even you can integrate normal net Miko Python program as well. So there may be chance that you are using the API, but still certain CLI commands you want to embed inside the Python programming. So you can go and embed those programs as well. Another program that you are seeing here that is with respect to iOS XE. And suppose if I want to run this over the iOS uh, Cisco iOS and that's the Viptela operating system is a bit different. So I want to run there because this is the V edge I want to test and this code is related to CSO. What I will do here, let it be, let's check over the C edge only, correct? Because V edge versus C edge, you know that in V edge you have to type show MP service, but in Cisco edge, C edge, you have to uh, use show ST1 and then OMP services. So extra keyword you have to use, that's the ST1 thing. So what I'll do here that I'll give the uh, IP as a C edge device, but you can construct for V edge as well. Now, what is the IP for C edge in one of the branches? So that will be uh, maybe 104 or 5. So I'll use 5 here. And then I can go and copy. And this is the OMP related program. Now I can go back to my uh, main automation tool. I can go and remove. And then I can go and create the new one. I can paste it. Control O, enter Control X. And then I want to check the help function first. Then I want to check the OMP. Correct? And I'll come to monitoring and other steps as well. But I'm just showing that how you can construct, is how you can embed the API calls. So that's the beauty of Python we have that we have embedded the API and plus you can see this CLI thing is also coming. So my device is logging into that device with help of CLI. And here you can see this API that I have built that is related to or that is in terms of uh, DC1 VH1. But the API, uh, but the CLI command that you are seeing, that is uh, that is one of the branch. So branch one CH1 or maybe CS2 that we can check here. Uh, from the system IP. This is the branch 1 CH2 and this is DC 1 VH1. So point here is this that uh, you can mix the things in your troubleshooting code, in your monitoring code, even you can mix different type of devices. But obviously you should know that what are the things you are mixing. I'll come back and explain you all these output. But let's move and let's stick with the monitoring stuff. So what I want to monitor, I want to monitor real time. I want to monitor uh, the uh, normal monitoring. So two monitors are there, but the real time monitoring is actually very beneficial and uh, we should focus on real time monitoring because all the time we are checking or we are doing the real time type of troubleshooting means uh, if you do the real time monitoring, you will know that at this point of time what is happening and then you can troubleshoot according to that. Now when you are doing the troubleshooting, what are the parameters you are checking? Obviously, first of all, you want to check the device info. So for that, you can go and check the uh, device list. So let's uh, stick with the basics. So I want to check the device info. Then I want to check the interface of that particular device. Then I want to check the reboot, the security, the software, the system, those are stuff. So at least these things we will check. After that, what you will check after that, you should go and check the uh, BFT, the control connection, etc., etc. Correct. So in this section, uh, let's focus on a step by step thing. At least three things we'll check the device lists. Uh, here you can see that what devices I have and what is the status of that devices that we have seen earlier as well in the previous section. So I'll move on. So now we know that we can check the device list. At this point of time, I am focused on DC1 VH1. 
so for dc1 vh1 i can go and check the interface info as well so let's go and check the interface info now here you will get the interface related stuff so first of all dc1 vh1 how many interfaces it has how many vpn say this is the key the system ip then zero is the vpn then zero slash one is the interface and then the protocol uh, this protocol is just the address family so again you can see that you have zero one zero two uh, system uh, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 0, 3, and then you have VPN 0, VPN 10, 20, and management VPN, correct? Great stuff. So we have all this information that this device, this is very much similar to show IP interface brief. Then what we want to check is the RX packet, the RX error, the TX packet, the TX error, MTU, and speed. Now, here you can see that if you have error, so error counter is zero, the TX and EX errors are zero, zero. So that means I don't have interface related issues or errors. So once I'm very much happy with the device status, once I'm good with the interface status, then I want to check the miscellaneous thing like reboot, security software and other stuffs. So for that, what I can do here that I can go and use this particular program or a script. Now what this will do, this will tell you the important stuffs related to that particular device. So you can see that uh, rebooted, this device has been rebooted at this time, this time, this time. Now initiated by user, activated in this code. So complete history you are getting. This is the reboot history, correct? And then if I scroll down, you are seeing that IPsec authentication parameters, so AHSHA, HMAC, Rekey, FIPS is enabled, the replay window, so that is also good. Then uh, you can see that the software information, so this device is running 2111, that is true, that is set, correct. Now then it tried to log into this device and then it has error, why? Because we are not logging into the CLI of this, so let me go back and correct the code for the reboot and the security option. So here you can go and check this and let's see that where we have that program. So from here it is a starting. So first APIs are well and good. It is working good. Then I have given some CLI commands as well. What is that CLI command? Show as device system status. If you want to run this command, your command should be show system status. And this is not the iOS XC, but we can make this as a Cisco iOS at this point of time. Again, um, I can go back to my program. I can remove the older one and then I can create the new program. I will paste this. We can save this come out and then run this uh, program as well one more time now here you can see that when we are running these api calls they are lightning fast correct the moment you click you will get that information now when it is trying to contacting via the cli you can see that there is some uh, speed issue or because see when you are logging by the cli what is happening that First of all, this program will try to connect, try to SSH to that device. Then it will write that code. Once you write that code, again, that code will go behind the scene to that particular uh, device, and then it will uh, get the information. Now, it is not able to SSH. We have the SSH issue. So what I will do here that I will go and give the uh, SSH the management IP. So I can go and give 198.183. Dot. I know that management IP is this. Even I can go and edit my uh, single line of code inside this program as, uh, as well, but because I'm doing in this manner, so let's do like this. Save it, come outside, and run this program one more time. I want system information and that uh, CLI command is 
show system status correct so let's wait now here you can see this try to log into that device and here it is we have the output so here you can see that uh, cpu uses the memory uses the disk uses because this output is good output and that's why i added this particular command in my command build or in my command list okay so likewise you can see that you can go log into the device you check the device status go check the interface status then with single api call you can check the reboot history you can check the security info you can check the software version you can check the system info like cpu memory disk uses and others correct so how healthy and how good these programs are while we are doing the monitoring and while we are trying to reaching closely or try to reach closely to the troubleshooting option as well all right so we reach to the last section of this particular section i can say that subsection of this particular section 5.6 troubleshoot cisco is event deployment using we manage api now already i have the course just for troubleshooting in the st1 that is available here in this platform you can have a look now the question here is that uh, how useful this troubleshooting uh, apis or with the api can we do the troubleshooting the answer is yes we can do the troubleshooting let me go to the we manage and if you are here and if you go and check the troubleshooting options that we have so what are the troubleshooting option you have troubleshooting dashboard device group software package device software update software action but important point here is this that while you are doing the troubleshooting that should be phased that should be a step by a step so it is not necessary that you are using the troubleshooting api to do the troubleshooting rather than even you can use the real time monitoring application or you can embed the cli code inside your python program to run the troubleshooting scripts as well correct so suppose um, obviously we don't want to run debugs and all those things inside the api because that should be under uh some circumstances I means suppose if you have the tag case open or if you have the uh maintenance window or some uh, downtime etc etc then you want to run the recursive or the regressive uh, uh this debugs and all correct so here at least you can do um the baseline troubleshooting you can do maybe phase 1 phase 2 type of troubleshooting but again if you don't want to go deep inside the packet captures and all better we can go and use these things from the we manage dashboard where we have the troubleshooting option we can take the captures we can run certain commands from the we manage dashboard as well correct so do follow that uh, video that i have complete course i have that where you will find the troubleshooting is given plus you will find some interview questions as well great so let's move on now when we are talking about troubleshooting what you want to troubleshoot in last section we have seen about the device monitoring where i have covered the uh, stuffs related to device list the info and the reboot correct now after that suppose if you have any issue related to ospf obviously you will directly go inside the ospf and you will do the troubleshooting if you have any issue related to uh, any other protocol suppose if you have issue related to omp some errors you are getting maybe some bug is also after troubleshooting find that is hitting some sort of bug maybe some security policy due to that packets are getting dropped or maybe some of the policies are not configured properly so there are n number of use cases as well for the troubleshooting now how we can do troubleshooting from here i will show you some of the examples but again you can add n number of apis n number of cli commands from the python script you can run and you can execute that command remotely to the devices so if you have any issue related to ipsec tunnel 
obviously your BFT will go down. You can go and verify with the BFT. So now if I go and run the BFT command here, so here you can see that we are running the BFT uh, API integration with Python. And what are the inputs we are getting? So let me show you. And here you can give nice description on the top that this is the device, BFT max session is four, flap zero time, BFT session is up, total BFT session four, poll interval, and the host name. Likewise, you can see the tunnel source, tunnel destination, the color, the TX packet, the device name, site ID, and the state. This is the alarming one. So if the state is down, that means this particular tunnel, and what's the source, what's the destination, you can check. So here you can see that, uh, and the site ID is 300 and we should just specify that the site ID is local or remote. So at the moment I am inside the local, I am inside the 10101. I am doing all the testing with DC1 VH1. And if it is forming the site ID with this particular, if this is the destination site ID and this tunnel is down here, you can see the counters are down with these tunnels. So we can clearly mark that with this particular source and destination, uh, this is down, right? So from this API, we can easily understand and then we can further troubleshoot that is the ISP issue, is the link issue, the local issue or in between some transit failure, etc. All right, then again, you can see uh, the other BFD session uh, output. So here you can see that which BFD sessions are up. So you can see the source and destination, source and destination, you can see the device name site id uptime we have the uptime protocol these are up then you have the summary of bfd so i have vs control connection expected connection ompp etc etc so it's quite handy that uh, uh, we have actually four different or maybe five different commands embedded inside same command and then we have this api which is giving the result so we can see that few of the bfts are down Next, we can go and check the control connection as well, correct? So I can go and check the OMP sessions as well because whenever we are talking about control connection, that is related to your DTLS connection, the VS Smart V Manage connection. So all states are up. You can see your device is installed up, but here we are seeing some uh, issue, and this issue that you are seeing observing here. Let me show you that if I go inside the control, my IP is not correct. So I should uh, correct the IP. And let me go next. Actually, I want to go inside the control. So here you can see the IP. I just want to put this. Now this is okay. But because since this is the VS device, so we should use show MP uh, services, show OMP summary. And then here you can see I have given only two commands, but it is true for n number of good commands. So someone can create the script there. They can give the meaningful CLI commands. At least those commands are in most of the time they are in use. And then your script will be very useful for globally to that particular organization. So let me remove this and let me go and uh, add that script one more time and let's run this so i can go and run this control now here you can see the control connection output then the summary output and here you can give a nice description as well means whatever output you are getting uh, why this output is what we are going to get from this output correct now here you can see that it's try to establish the connection and still okay so again you can see that issue here that i haven't change this uh, image so it should be i use a uh, cisco underscore ios the rest of the things are okay and let's go back and add this one more time so i can stop that session i can go to the cell and let's do the nano add that seems it is not copied let me go and copy this and let's add it back 
all right same some issue adding this so i can exit and i can go here okay so add it back let's go out and obviously because i have changed the name so i should go here and use one so now it is running again again you can see the api is quite faster and then the CLA command, but CLA command is also true because we have some nice CLI uh, commands. Okay, so we can't ignore those CLI commands. Display the stats about the VH router, uh, the VA smart controllers, instant VDM and process handling. Some issues there. Let's see in detail what why it is throwing there all the time. Because we have seen that one of the command was ran perfectly That was the BFD and we are using Cisco IOS and we, The username and the password is correct So this should also run Correct, so you have this Cisco IOS And then the username and the password show MP services show MP summary and so you can see that we are getting the repetitive error and if i go inside the program here you can see the program i need to correct so the let me go will log into this cisco ios whose ip is 3.100 that is nothing but dc1 vh1 and once we are inside this we should not use this keyword sd1 but if we have the ios xe then you can use this keyword called sg1 now again you can see that the benefit of api because api is true with ch and is just true with vh so irrespective of what device we have what nature of device we have the api is true for that but here you have to do the necessary changes and modification now again let's go back and run this program we want to get the information related to control connection uh, you can see the two of the apis but the important point here is that few of the cli commands are good and we can follow those cli commands so first of all what it is doing the control stat uh, statistics output then the control summary so now we are getting the information about the control summary it's a bit slow because this is a CLI and then the valid VH. So here you can see the valid VH and then it will go and give you uh, the valid uh, VS smart or V bond or whatever we want. We can go and put all those information and we can get the output. So here you can see that how helpful this is. So you have checked the BFT. You have checked the control connection. Likewise, my favorite one is the IPsec so I can go and check the IPsec inbound outbound connection and uh, all IPsec related command so here you can see the API is how fast is this and the moment I click enter you are seeing the output so what is the tunnel MTU what is the authentication key the encryption key authentication use SPI the encryption has SPI, uh, the TCP MSS see all the information you are getting in one screen now you can copy and paste this screen and you can use this information for further troubleshooting right so that's the power we have with the api so we have checked the bft we have checked the control device fib table simply if it will give you the fib table we have checked the interface we have checked the uh, ipsec we haven't checked the ip table that that is simply the ip route information IPsec, we have checked the OMP. If we have OMP advertised routes, you can go and run this. If you have OSPF related stuff, you can run this, then reboot, T log. So most of the things we have checked, but suppose if you are doing the troubleshooting related to application. So in that case, you should go and check your app route stats. Here you will see very robust output related to app route. So what's the local color, what's the remote color, the remote system IP, the source IP, destination IP, the loss latency, jitter, loss, average latency, average jitter, TX, RX, total packet. Okay, so you can see that 
the colors and you can see the source and destination IP and then according to that you can check the counters where these counters have moved because according to that you can figure out that the loss or latency or jitter correct so I have built uh, these many APIs integrated with uh, Python but um, you are free you can go and add more and more usable uh, APIs inside the Python to do the real-time monitoring plus to do the troubleshooting as well In section 6 we have to learn about Cisco Meraki now Cisco Meraki and related automation so here you can see the full description uh, related to sections Describe the feature and capability of Cisco Meraki location scanning API MB sense APIs all those APIs plus uh, we have to do the configuration via Python. We have to create a network via P Python, etc. So that's the goal of uh, section six that we do the automation via the API and the Python programming. Now, uh, the first lecture that we have here in 6.1, for that, uh, I have given one video related to the features and capability of Meraki. So please complete that video. Once you complete that video, then before starting 6.1 A, B, C, D, again, I'll go and give you some good link where you can go and perform the lab task, plus some of the documentation related to API and Python integration. So complete 6.1 and then in next video, we'll learn about uh, important link useful resources related to Meraki. Let us continue our discussion and see that what types of features we have in Meraki. As you can see that we can do the SD-WAN. We can integrate that SD-WAN with auto VPN. Means these two comes together inside single SD-WAN solution. After that, we have the secure operations. Secure operations means we have all sort of uh, firewalling options in Meraki. We can do the next generation firewalling, intrusion prevention. We can do the content filtering plus the malware protection. So not only the traditional port filtering, but we have the content filtering that is the advanced firewalling options as well. Apart from that, this solution is highly scalable and they are 99.99% of available and the failover is seamless. All these features we have in our Meraki solution. With respect to SD-WAN, what we can achieve? So uh, say I, if I have my data center and all the data centers are something like this that you have DC1 you have data center 2 as a as your DR then across the geographical location you have branches what is your final goal here that you want to reach from here to here in this solution you have any to any type of VPN connection so suppose if anything happen with this VPN circuit you will be automatically fail over to the other VPN circuit and your traffic will go okay so that is one one thing that is the dynamic path selection means uh, not only you have the dynamic path selection but we can have something like policy based path option or path selection we have active active VPN circuits as well so not only one circuit is up and running but the other circuits will also have the same capability they will do active active load balancing to the other VPN circuits that's that's also true and that is uh, and finally we have the policy based routing policy based routing is something like suppose your voice traffic for this you want MPLS and for other low latency traffic you want say internet circuit so we can create policy we can prioritize the 
voice traffic over MPLS and the other traffic over internet and final failover means finally everything will go over internet. So ISP 123 according to your SLAs according to your bandwidth options you can prioritize that. That is one of the neat thing and other important thing that you can do it with few clicks. That's it. You don't need lengthy uh, CLI configuration, so much planning. All these things will be there. Simply you have to go there and you have to click and things will be enabled. Likewise, we don't need lengthy VPN configuration. You have auto VPN option with help of only uh, three clicks. We can create VPN and those VPNs are something termed as auto provisioning or auto VPNs in Miraki solution. Apart from that, we can change the parameters. So once you have your VPN tunnel, obviously your phase one, phase two is up. Then if you want to check your change, your pre-shared key or uh, MD5 or hash encryption keys, all these things, it's very easy to change all those parameters. We have flexible tunneling plus topology and security policy. It's very easy to apply or remove the policies because everything we are managing from a central da dashboard or single dashboard. So that's why it's very easy to change the parameters and it's easy to configure and provision the VPNs. Then the final feature we have is the security plus the uh, auto failover in security. It's really secure. You can see here that we have all type of security capabilities in Meraki solution. We can do firewalling. We can do ideas. We can do content filtering all these things. So let me walk you through all these things one by one. We have this option that we can do the L7 traffic classification and control. We can go in depth of the packets and the application traffic and we can check the content of those packets. Then we have the identity based policy options as well where we can check the policies and we can identify that who is sending where according to that uh, we can apply the rules because it is easily integrated with Cisco Firepower. So that's why there are not many options that we have inside Firepower. Uh, same things uh, we have inside Meraki solution. You can see that we have options related to vulnerabilities and uh, related to known exploits, something like virus, rootkits, and backdoors, all these things uh, we can do with help of Miraki solution. It's very easy and simple to deploy. So that is the overall goal of this Miraki solution that it's very easy to deploy. You don't need so much things to do while deploying Miraki SD-WAN, Miraki security, any type of failover, everything will be seamless. It's, it's, it's very easy. It's all the time we have the ability, easy to deploy, easy to monitor, maintain all these features we have. And we can have this reporting options as well. And if you want that uh, if certain threshold values will be breached, then you will get the emails as well. Again, uh, the same line that we have the content filtering plus the malware protection policies. We can integrate with AD servers. We have other options as well for the integration. And because it is integrated with the cloud, so your traffic first will Go to the cloud if there, if you have any issues with the traffic, it will terminate the connection. Otherwise, it will go to the destination. Okay, so we have this cl cloud based signature updates as well. Okay, uh, then finally, we have the failover and the high ability options. And 
it depends that what type of policy based routing we have so if it will breach certain SLA obviously it will go to ISP 2 ISP 3 like that warm spare failover is also there and that's why the data center availability is very high in the Meraki solution right. so if I summarize all these things that means we have sd ban solution we have this auto vpn auto provisioning solution security you have seen that for security we have all those options not only we are doing the firewalling but we can do ip uh, ips ids we can check the malware root kits signature anomaly all these things we have and the finally we have this uh, high ability and the failover features all right so let's understand the meraki api and the power of meraki api now this is true this slide is true for all the apis for all the technology like sdvan or maybe dc automation so maybe i am an uh, i am a network engineer or developer partner integrator service provider i want networking protocol stack to integrate application so nowadays that's the co uh, common normal means that nowadays we are thinking the application and then we are thinking about the network means how the application will help to build the network but initially it, it was just like flip like initially it was that you have the network in infrastructure and you're running your application on top of that so whatever restriction that we have with the network those things that application has to be here but things are changed now uh, now we have to think application in a mind and then we need to design a network so that's why we need programmable networking a stack or network programmability and that's why we have sdn and then that's the power means inside the SD and we have the power of these APIs and you will see in the upcoming slides that how much innovation have been done inside API and so many APIs have been added and with respect to Meraki what are the key APIs we have will see so now you can see that we have the API for almost everything either it's a, a analytic either it's analyzing either it's whatever we are doing and what type of API we have? We have dashboard API, web hook alert API, location integration API, the API related to cameras, API related to, uh, related to captive portal. All these things we have a, in, in the API. APIs are controllers, so be careful while you're using it because again, uh, if you don't know that which API we are running and suppose if the nature of api is post or maybe delete so it can delete maybe it can delete entire network or it can uh, do uh, no destruction uh, destructive things as well all these links are important so i already told you that in this section i will show you various url link resources so here you can see that we have the developer community meraki uh, this is also very informative informative you can go to the github resource we will get the library in the lab section i will show you that how you can go and enable the api so we'll see that in the lab we have other resources and uh, useful places where you can go and learn these things how you can go and run the api i will show you in the lab section we have the get put post or delete method um, that's the restful api calls and that is true for other uh, SDN solution as well. We have dashboard, captive portal, scanning plus Bluetooth API, webhook alert and MB sense API that we're going to discuss one by one in the upcoming session. Now here you can see the growth of API in last 12 months and it's a huge. And we should focus uh, into the growth of API and we can uh, take the advantage of those inbuilt API plus new APIs as well in our infrastructure. So APIs are there for analytics, automation, marketing. Marketing means that uh, related to uh, query, uh, certain maybe certain location because again you are using location API and location API can 
give you the location of the resources then uh, trigger location based on the application uh, asset tracking BLA device and all so it means that API is there uh, powerful API is, is there just to provide faster speed and not only the faster speed execution etc but it can be used for analytic automation and other stuff again we have nice resource in miraki.io you can go and have a look inside this miraki.io in the upcoming section we are going to explore more and more about the uh, these link and url that you are seeing uh, the dashboard api related uh, url and again we have always on sandbox as well where i'm going to perform the lab task so this particular url the username and password you can see on this screen this is always on la sandbox means you don't need any vpn or anything to log into this sandbox box and explore the Miraki capabilities and features. This is there in the Cisco DevNet that for uh, learning purpose, we can utilize this. All right, so in next section, we'll go and learn about uh, different type of APIs that we have. Uh, for now, we can stop here. From 6.1a up to 6.1d, we have to learn understand about a different type of apis and obviously after that we have the labs 6.1a location scanning apis then mv sense apis external captive portal apis webhook alert api now as the name suggests and one by one we'll go and check all these slides but as the name suggests you can see that uh, related to location we have the api related to cameras we have api related to captive portal we have api and then related to alerts we have webhook alert api so let's learn these all one by one again i told you that um, all these cores you have the reference so automation course you have great reference at github plus cisco devnet sites as well that you can go and refer now what is location scanning api now this is very much that you want the location and then the output will come in the json format so here you can see that all the devices via the miraki it is going and communicating to the cloud and from the cloud portal we are fetching the report we are fetching the details related to ap mac client mac or ssi timestamp and then we are storing these inside the backend server correct so very simple and straightforward uh, you have to go and enable this feature inside the miraki and then you will get the location and that's what the, that's why the name is location scanning api so all those details will get now again uh, here you can see the long list of the details that we are going to get in the json format so ap mac ap tag floor client mac ipv4 information v6 information scene ssid etc again uh, this list is for the reference these are the information we are getting in the json format so here you can see that you have the data and the key you are getting the information in the json format now how to enable this to enable this is very easy and straightforward you can go to the miraki dashboard here you can go and check the always on miraki dashboard i have already shared the link and even in the uh, lab section i'll show you i'll log in there and i'll show you you can go to network wide general setting and then you can go and enable the scanning uh, api it's very easy once you can e enable so here you can see location and scanning uh, analytics is enabled the scanning api is enabled then you can have this url so you can go and and give the external urls how it is working again this is something that we are doing the query so all the information is getting collected over the miraki cloud from there we are doing the query and we are getting the information so get is nothing but the show command uh, via the cli over the cisco devices so http get return of validator token http post post of json and then we have the uh, verification of post using secrets and all those data 
so it's like we are querying to the Miraki cloud and we are getting the information and if you want to save those information uh, you can save it I'll show you a few of the examples related to curl even we can go further and use the uh, web browsers as well for the API get queries again we have the Bluetooth scanning API we can go to the wireless Bluetooth setting and we can enable that as well again the Bluetooth uh, API data information here you can see that the information we are getting in the JSON format these are the details like AP Mac AP tag AP floor etc we are getting great now let us continue this discussion and understand the next piece of API that is the MB sense API now in Meraki we have a strong support of a smart cameras and these cameras having smart sensors a smart chip so they are giving the video feed they are giving the video information and with help of apis we can collect those information so we have rest api and mqtt api that's the telemetry um, api and then uh, we can get the information so here you can see that information related to historical aggregate current snapshot real-time feed correct all these things are possible from the api's now here again you can see that if you go and check you have the link so api doc api doc api doc so api doc related to mv sense api doc related to link uh, api's uh, api docs related to snapshot api correct so you can go and refer these now what is very important here to understand is that we have two different methodology of API. One is the REST API that we study and cover a lot before this session. We know what is REST API, how it is working. And then we have one real time of real time API, uh, MQTT. That's like uh, telemetry uh, API. And MQTT, the nice feature about this is that it is something like subscription based api means it is fully working uh, in push model so what does it mean we have discussed this about in the telemetry section that uh, we have snmp that method that is pull method means when you need you are sending some query and you are getting the information and then we have some sort some sort of live type of api uh, which is uh, using the pull method correct and it's quite frequent you have to set certain tuning you have to do some sort of subscription and then you will get the information so MQTT is very uh, important here and again you can have a reference or you can have a difference between rest and MQTT but MQTT is uh, referred here to do any type of query in the MB sense MVSense has a number of endpoints which provide aggregate data on the following people detection, light level leading, the people uh, detection metadata can be viewed. So, here you can see in the diagram that this has the information related to live feed. So, we have the people detection, we have the uh, light level reading, and all those other informations, right? So you can surely test that and then one slide I have given just to give the reference between the rest and MQTT and again MQTT is a subscription based method and which is using the push pushing uh, messages and it's actually preferred over the rest based API. Okay, we have certain use cases as well a use cases related to when uh, we have the live feed related to MVS smart cameras. Okay. All right. So let's continue with the external captive portal. Now, why we need uh, external captive portal? That is one of the feature of Cisco Meraki. That when a guest user wants to access internet, first of all, they will get one page where a company can put their terms and condition, maybe billing information payment related information purchase uh, a billing plan view an advertisement etc now once a user will accept these terms and condition and other stuffs 
then they have access that they can be redirected to the internet or any other url so here you can see that the client or user that can go via the ap and obviously the cloud is there in between and then they, they have the request to this captive portal and then they will get redirected correct now here we may think that okay can we put much more security can we integrate with AAA servers so yes we have the option that we can go and integrate this with triple a server that you can see in the diagram so a client device uh, doing the query to the captive portal or to the web server and then uh, they have to authenticate with triple a and then they will get the access and then they will get redirected correct so we have the apis related to meraki captive portal and with the api we can get a certain um, request means uh, uh, request related to the captive portal correct now next very a new type of api we have is the webhook alert nowadays it's quite popular why because it's you can think this is a lightweight uh, feature and this feature is there in Cisco Viptela as well. So if you go and check the latest code of Cisco Viptela, you'll find that we have the webhook alert. Now how it is happening, how it is working, that you have the uh, Meraki devices and they are connected with the Meraki cloud and then they can query it uh, from the uh, webhook servers. So we have to go and enable the webhook related alert and nowadays we can have all those alerts notification so everything can be hooked uh, and that can be uh, received from the external server there are again a good amount of servers and here you can see that this can be integrated uh, with the different type of servers and again you can see your query as well now these webhook alerts you can go and have a look on different type of webhook uh, external server where you are sending the alerts and notification these webhook uh, apis and again we are doing this with the api with help of api behind the scene correct so these alerts either miraki or cisco viptela you can store to the external server and then further you can analyze it how to configure it it's very easy we can go to network wide configuration and alerts and then we have option to enable the webhook alert now again i have given one important point here in the bottom that there are a variety of standalone standalone cloud webhook services that is hook.io zap here a few of these services uh, you can go and enable they will not ask the credit card information and it will be free for 14 days that you can go and check so not only the miraki alerts but other web application or other application alerts also you can go and integrate and you can verify it. again it's very easy to configure it here you can see uh, we can go to the uh, network wide configure alert and then where you where is your http server so you have zapier built io etc and then what type of alerts you want to view so all network admin and again any type of uh, set of alerts that we want to send correct so these are the important uh, api that we need to and we have to learn and study in the upcoming uh, section actually what we have to do next is from 6.2 onwards is that um, we have to use the api to create a network and again we have to see the python uh, integration as well with the Meraki. So next uh, session onward, we are going to do a lab and hands-on practice. In this section and onward, we have to use the Meraki API to create the network. So let me show you all the steps that how you can go and uh, with help of API, you can do various tasks. Let me show you these steps first and then I, I will log into the device and show you how to do it here you can see my notepad uh, steps but first of all we need to generate the api key now once we have the api key then we can go and test uh, 
related to the organization and the network. So we'll go and run certain Git commands. And then I'll show you that how further you can go and do uh, multiple tasks. So let's go and generate the API key. Let me log into the uh, Miraki dashboard. All right, so here I am inside the Miraki dashboard. Once you're here, you can go to the organization and settings. And once you are inside the settings, if I scroll down, here you can see that we have this API access option. Go and hit profile. And once you are inside the profile, you can get the key. So if I scroll down here, you can see that I have some old key. I can revoke that. So let me click revoke. And then I can regenerate the new keys that I want to use uh, for various tasks. So let me scroll down. Now here you can see that uh, the keys are not there because I want to generate new API key. Let me copy this. I have a store the new API. Now I can go back to my notepad and uh, I can put the new keys here. All right, so let me go back to the keys that I have and should be copied. Let me generate new and copy and then paste to the notepad. Yeah, same way I have generated the key and I am pasting here because in the lab we'll go and use it. So let me quickly go and change those keys. Here you can see these are the curl method to run the API. And let me quickly go and delete and add the new key in these methods. All right, so I have generated that. Now I want to use the curl method in my automation tool. So let me go and open that. Here you can see I have the automation tool and enter. Now, now you can see that we are getting the my organization and related output because we are running the organization related API. Likewise, I can go and check the network related stuff as well with this curl, this API and yep, here you can see, we can paste that information and we can wait because the query is happening behind the scene and we will get the result. So here you can see there is some issue maybe some name resolution or some other. So I am not getting the result. All right. So we need to verify this why this is not giving us the result. Maybe the organization and then the uh, network ID that I have given. So you can verify this what network ID you want to check. I can use any network ID here. You can see I have a long list of network ID and one is for the DevNet. So 549236. I can see 549236. And that should give you the correct output. Okay, uh, although if you go and check the complete URL, so there is some difference in that. All right, let me check with any other network ID. I can go and I can put that. And let's run this command. So at the moment, we are just doing the testing because our main agenda is to do the configuration of network. 
so it is telling that not able to resolve api.miraki.com and let me go back and run my organizational api one more time so we are getting the result here and this output we should do some changes here like uh, instead of the url here you can see that we can go and change the url so what i have done here i have done a small change here instead of what uh, script i have built i have uh, changed this and i use this n149 and let me quickly show you here that you have n149 http here so i have used this and then i have mixed with the same uh, url that we have correct and then here you can see that we are getting the output it's just the get command that we can use and we can get the result great so now we are at this point and i already told you that we have the useful links from where you can go and check the uh, api miraki api integration and related examples so you can go and copy those folder inside your api engine so let me quickly show you here that i have my dashboard api path python and if i go here you can see that we have the examples we have the generator miraki etc now if you go to the examples and once we are in the example you can see that we can go and have various examples that we can go and run as a python script so for example if i want to run the organization wide client or maybe aiu organization wide client so i can use this and enter now here uh, i can see that we have some issues related to the api token and that's actually important to understand because they're telling that we have the api key error we should define the api for this and that's why we have this api export so before running these api uh, you should generate the api and then you can set that and next you can run this program now, while we are running this program we can see that we are getting the robust output this is related to all the clients and it is generating the report so we are getting the report and once the report will come then we can go and check the report output the result output somewhere you can see that we are getting some invalid error and if i go and show it the output now so here you can see that we have so many csv files got generated i can take any of the csv file and then i can show you that the client related output that we have okay so here you can see that we have the full result now what we can do that uh, we can go and uh, copy these files maybe inside the windows with help of filezilla or any other program and then we can open this in the csv format so you will get the output in the excel correct so all these are uh, excel file output where you have the uh, various fields that you can check inside the excel sheet great so once we have the variable set and then if i can show you the program so if i go here and run this so here you can see that either input your api key we have set that api key uh, with the export miraki dashboard and then this function is for uh, this program is for list the network clients so it will go and list all the network clients and then it will print those network clients 
in the CSV format, correct? So here you have the full program and the output is in the file name dot CSV that we can go and verify, correct? So this way we can set the variable and once we have the variable set, we can run this program and then we can get the output. Okay, so these are just the uh, verification APIs. Uh, what we have done that we have verified few of the API. First of all, we have used the curl methodology and then we are using the API Python integration to verify whatever information we'll get, uh, we want, we can get that. More what we are going to do that we'll go and dig deeper into these uh, Python programs and we'll learn more and more in the upcoming section.